okay, develop your own infection control protocol, have your own actually how to actually is a uh, prevent infections, antibiotic given 10 minutes before the tunicate, hand washing, do not allow your assistant to come later than you, but wash hand faster than you, okay, do not allow them to wear double glove and go and touch the bone and cause perforation, that one can cause contamination. The team management also important that you must have a good team, try to have a same team member so that when you do the operation itself, you can shorten your OT time and you know careless team itself can kill off the sterile equipment or safe productive environment, cause your OT time even more uh, longer. And sometimes even they give you a, a wrong impact, even worse. For the post-operation, I think the two aspects that I want to emphasize is the pain control and VTE prophylaxis and follow up evaluation and reflections. TKI is painful procedure. So as a surgeon, we really must know our painkiller uh, 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 choices, multimodal pain management, and also know the con uh, side effect. So we, your uh, uh, femoral component orientation make a 3D rotation to it, so it's uh, uh, TBL cut. So the control axis. But what normally is, your distal femur is in some sort of valgus of 5 to 7 degree, and your proximal TBI is around 2 to 3 degree virus to the joint line. And I would like to quote this paper, which has been quoted the most in arthroplasty, I would say, the paper by Bellamens, who, uh, who found that even the young adults, 32% of males and 70% 70 of females are constituted of virus of more than three degree. Contrary to this, in knee arthroplasty, we aim a zero degree, or we try to aim in a zero degree or up to a three degree plus minus. Both coming back, Coming to the newer concept of kinematic alignment, the stalwart surgeons who initiated this concept started from the concept of three axes. One is the axis with, on which the TBR rotates. Second is the axis on which the TBR flex. And one is the axis on which the TBR flexes. The flexion of the TBR is around the trans, transverse axis, which is at the center of the humeral condyles. And the flexion of the patella is 10 millimeter anterior and proximal to the axis of the flexion of the tibia. And both of them are parallel to each other. And the rotational axis of the tibia is perpendicular to the joint line. So the concept of kinematic alignment came with these three axes and six degrees of freedom, freedom for each axis. And how we implant the uh, components in kinematic alignment? We can align the transverse axis of the femoral component with the transverse axis in the femur, about which the TBF flexion extends. Just remove the osteophytes to restore the ligament length motion and stability. Place the TBL component so that the longitudinal axis of the TBI is perpendicular to the transverse axis in the femur. This was up and above to the results from UK and US of a group of patients who were followed for 15 years. The followers of kinematic alignment challenge that even if you align the knee in mechanical alignment, this does not serve the purpose of the survivorship of the implant. A post-operative axis of plus minus three degree does not come for an advantage in terms of survival with revision because of mechanical failure, aseptic closing, or radiographic wave. So there was a weaker relationship between survival of the implant and mechanical excess alignment. Simultaneously, the satisfaction rate did not decrease below two digits in any of these techniques. So we revolved from a conventional technique uh, conventional technique to navigation to robotic these days, but still the satisfaction rate we have not been able to achieve. What the patient needs at the end is a normal feeling knee. And the surgeons have continued to strive to achieve a precisely aligned knee with minimal soft tissue disruption. With all it did start, it started with patient specific instrumentation to develop a pre-operative alignment of the arthritic knee develop the 3D model of that arthritic knee. With the help of the software, you fill up the defects of those arthritic defects and develop a 3D model of the pre-morbid knee, pre-arthritic stage knee, develop the patient-specific guides and proceed accordingly to implant the uh, component in a kinematic aligned uh, alignment. So the other method was the caliper technique because PSI was not able to be performed in every way. When this method, what is done is the thickness of the bone resected is being replaced by the thickness of the condyle of the implant. So how it is done, for example, 
in a distal femur uh, resection, if you have a wear of around two millimeter of the cartilage, we add up the thickness of the blade that which sums up to be two plus one, three millimeter. And the thickness of the femoral condyle is nine millimeter. So how much you have to resect the bone? You have to resect six millimeter of the bone so that it can be replaced with the nine millimeter condylar prosthesis to give it, to give it a native meat. Similarly, the posterior condylar is also cut in a nine millimeter of thickness according to the implant and implanted without considering the trans epicondylar axis. Same goes to the tibia. You align the varus valgus alignment in the anatomic varus means the premorbid varus. You attain the slope in the slope of the normal cartilage, I would say the other cartilage, on one cartilage, and the rotation comes in a way that you draw a elliptic, elliptical, uh, uh, the ellipse of the unwound cartilage, draw an axis of that, of that uh, unwound cartilage, and you try to reflect in this parallel to this axis. The component is aligned parallel to the axis of the unwound cartilage in the lateral condyle. So you take care of the varus valgus alignment, uh, take care of the slope, and take care of the rotation, as per the rotator knee. And recently, many, many, many people are doing this with the navigation is you can guide a navigation or you can be guided by the navigation to attain an alignment in a pre-morbid stage. So what you actually get at the end? You get a knee just like seeing that it is in varus. You do it, see in the back and it is done. Uh, the joint line orientation may not be orthogonal to the mechanical axis, which is a kinematical aligned knee. So how is this kinematic alignment being able to fulfill the purpose today? If you see the paper from the, you know, the follower surgeons or the, or the, or the strong follower surgeons, how are at all? In 222 needs, the five-pair survival was 99% and that carried out to 98.5% at 10 years. Similarly, a comparative study of 18 kinematic alignment total knee arthroplasty um, 18 mechanically aligned knee in healthy controls. The knee kinematics of patients with kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty more closely resembled that of normal healthy controls than those with mechanically aligned. That means the kinematics of the knee after the surgery were also as like of the normal in the individuals. Annual study from Tally Settle, they compared 100 mechanically aligned TK with 100 kinematic aligned TK. They found that they were able to restore the pre morbid flexion extension in the patient's function with overall better. And the result from Dosset et al., the patients in kinematic alignment TKA group had better pain relief and function as compared to the mechanically aligned TKA group in our randomized control study. Another study from CORE in 2030, they did the measurement of all the total knee arthroplasty done, done by uh, kinematic alignment. They saw the TBL component in, in a range of 1.8 plus minus 2.6 degree, knee alignment was 3.4 plus minus 2.1 degree, and limb alignment, overall alignment was 0.9 plus minus 2.7. In all these three groups done by kinematic alignment, the mean Oxford score and OMAC score were similar in all these three groups. Excuse me, one minute left. Uh, the, uh, if you see the first year in PS um, uh, group, the forces in the MCL in kinematic were lower than those in mechanical alignment in both the CR and PS in instance phase and the deep knee conditions. What is those on the lateral collateral ligament did not show any difference between the two. If you see this study of 24, 24 and 23 patients in kinematic and mechanical alignment, there was no difference in longitudinal migration of the TBL component between the two groups at two years. Now here is the twist. The results were good, excellent up to two years. Then after two years, and at two years, there is no difference in the function of the patient done by PSI kinematic alignment. Similar in the 55 patients, bilateral TKA done kinematic alignment using computer assisted navigation system, there was no difference between the two groups in term, in, in, in uh, OKS and COAS scores. I was the forgotten joint scores. This particular paper in 2020. Now, this was from the same author who proved that who, who, who got the Ranawat Award in 2016, saying that the two years there is no difference between the kinematic and mechanical alignment. And these are the authors strict and we found the same no difference at five years as well. Excuse me, time is so where are we? Yeah. So where are we in 2021? Definitely the interest of surgery increasing towards kinematic alignment. There is a, just a new technique. Everyone is thinking, let me try it. 
but does it really equal early work in my patients difficult to say many people are doing for research progress and some people are doing for a patient demand and manufacturers are competing to make it uh, the uh, newer gigs so literature till date i just want to conclude by saying that the results are not inferior to mechanical alignment the results are compared to mechanical alignment and the superiority is still a question so the number of tka i floor is very few years over few years there are accelerations in early years the failure rates uh, are comparable with the mechanical alignment there is no difference at two years then after so i would like to say it is early to comment on the superiority thank you for the kind attention Okay, thank you for the very interesting presentation, Dr. Dipak. Since the orthopedic knowledge and research is a very dynamic, uh, the kinematic alignment is a relatively new surgical technique for implanting total knee components. Now, because the time is very tight, so we go straight to the next presentation. I'm glad to welcome Dr. Halit al Sheikh, who will present periprosthetic fracture around TKA. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, May I have a the uh, I'd like to have the uh, sharing option, please, Sh to share my screen. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Does everyone see my screen now? Yes, I can see. Excellent. So, uh, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, run through the talk. Uh, my name is uh, Khaled Al Sheikh. I'm a, an assistant professor at King Saud and Abdulaziz University uh, for Health Sciences in Riyadh. I'm pretty honored to be part of this elite group. Um, so, with regards to our topic today, we're gonna, I'm going to present about prosthetic distal femur fractures. Uh, in terms of definition, what are periprosthetic distal femur fractures or periprosthetic fractures around a uh, total knee joint? It's a fracture of the femur or tibia occurring within 15 centimeters uh, from the joint line or 5 centimeters from the intramedullary stem. Periprosthetic uh, total knee arthroplasty are increasing increased number of total knee arthroplasties done worldwide. Distal femur fractures around total knee is, the, is by far the most common, and the incidence in the United States is about uh, 300,000 per year. In terms of the incidence of, uh, specifically of distal femur fracture along total knee arthroplasties, it goes all the way from 0.3 to 2.5%. It's definitely more uh, in revision implants. And, uh, with regards to the proximal tibia and patella, it's uh, far less. What are the risk factors? Uh, absolutely poor bone quality, whether it's due to increased age, osteoporosis, diabetes, obesity, uh, steroid use, rheumatoid arthritis, or sex uh, orientation. The uh, neurologic disorders are definitely uh, a risk, a patient-related risk factor, whether they have Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, polio, or myasthenia gravis. Mechanical risk factors include the presence of revision implants, specifically stems, uh, the presence of loosening in a total knee, uh, malaligned total knee, screw holes, uh, which uh, create stress risers, and stiff, a stiff total knee uh, arthroplasty. Uh, the, with regards to specifically talking about the distal femur, if you do have anterior femoral notching, uh, a modulus of elasticity mismatch, or uh, rotationally constrict components uh, does increase uh, the risk of having a periprosthetic fracture. Now, Lewis and Marabek classified distal femur uh, periprosthetic fractures to uh, tie on, which uh, has a stable total knee implant and a non-displaced uh, fracture type two, which has a stable total knee implants and a displaced fracture and type three, which has a non-stable or loose total knee implant with a stable or non-stable uh, fracture. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Lewis and Rorabek, they don't really comment the position of the fracture itself. So uh, Sue and Associates kind of alluded to the position of the fracture itself with regards to the total knee. I think one with the fracture proximal to the anterior flange of the femur uh, and type two having a, a fracture that starts at the anterior flange uh, of the femur and propagates proximally and a type three which has a uh, periprosthetic fracture which starts at the anterior flange of the femur and propagates distally. 
Now, the treatment depends on uh, many things to consider. Uh, it really depends on the general status of the patient's health, the functional demand of the patient, and uh, the fracture location and morphology, the bone quality of the patient, and the type of total knee implant, and whether the, this particular total knee implant is loosened or not. Now, let's go ahead and uh, perform a, uh, let's entertain you with a case that I had uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is a 60-year-old lady known to have rheumatoid arthritis, bronchial asthma, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, she was uh, an obese, uh, pleasant lady with a BMI of 43, and she has recently performed a, her right total knee three years ago and her left total knee um, two years ago. She came into the emergency department after a slip, and uh, this is her x-rays on arrival. Now, when I looked at this patient, I kind of uh, had a bit of stomach ache thinking about what could happen to this patient and what are my options. So she, she, kindly, she, she kind of have or, or has uh, multiple risk factors. She's obese. She is she has bronchial asthma, she has rheumatoid arthritis on prednisone or on steroids, and um, her fracture is really um, a type two or three Suwon associate uh, classification, or um, I didn't have um, a clear um, idea about whether the uh, implants were loose or not. It looked to me that we're not. Um, a CT scan has been done and the artifact didn't really help too much. So I thought um, this lady, uh, this lady's option would include um, revision of her total knee implant, performing a distal femoral replacement, um, maybe fixation with a lateral based uh, plate with a higher risk of non-union. Also, we could do dual plating uh, with a lateral-based uh, plate and a medial-based plate, uh, but that would include uh, a couple of large incisions, would, which would, again, increase the risk of infection. And then I started to ask myself, what if I perform a distal femoral replacement and she gets infected? So I kind of really tried to uh, find a solution for her that would serve her in a way that does not increase the risk of infection due to large exposures and uh, does not really uh, have a me do a uh, distal femoral replacement for uh, a fracture. Uh, I actually do, my subspecialty is in uh, trauma and uh, hip and knee reconstruction. So I really had to think long and hard about this case. So I'll just show you what I did. And um, it was a technique uh, described by Jeff Mast in his uh, book, uh, uh, Fracture uh, Reduction Techniques. And um, it was described for cortical defects. Um, and it also was published in uh, the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma recently, about a couple of years ago. So here's my incision markings intraoperatively collected. You can a bit of bone in the uh, uh, around the femoral component, so I marked the incision distally. It was a minimally invasive procedure, um, and I'm marking proximally. I uh, tended to use a long distal femur plate. Uh, I plan to use that just to decrease the stress riser on her. And then I uh, got in a uh, slit in the long distal femur locking plate. Um, I aligned it well with the proximal shaft, and then um, I reduced the distal segment to the proximal segment, uh, as you can see with the Cobb elevator. Um, and then after I achieved the sagittal um, reduction, I uh, fixed it with K-wires distally and proximally. And then I reduced the shaft back to the uh, distal piece using a collinear clamp. And then I... Uh, fixed the uh, proximal and distal uh, uh, parts of the plate with screws. Now, um, you can see that the reduction is really satisfactory, but I don't really trust her bone. So um, what we did, we uh, performed a mini medial approach uh, just between the anterior 
uh, part of the femoral component and the medial epicondyle. Uh, I created a bone window and I had a, uh, a curved osteotome to uh, create a path in the interosseous or intramedullary part of the femur. And then I slid a, uh, an, uh, an LCDCP plate, um, which was curved. Um, the key of this uh, plate uh, creates a few goals. So it does not cut the epi, um, it does, does not cut the blood supply uh, from the periosteum. It uh, induces the endosteal blood supply. And the key with it is to really keep it on the cortical, medial cortical edge. I created a, uh, a small bend distally uh, so I could fix it to the, with one screw to the bone. So for the ease of removal in case I needed to remove it. And um, here's her, uh, you can see that there's a screw trying to push that plate uh, to the medial cortex. And this was all done minimally invasively with two centimeter or three centimeter incision on the medial anterior medial side and the regular MEPO four centimeter to five Excuse centimeter me. sliding the plate. I'm almost done. I'm sorry for going over time. So I'll show you the uh, immediate post-operative images so that uh, you can see the clips that's on uh, the post-operative day number one. And um, these are the four months x-rays which uh, you can see the callus formation on the medial and lateral edges and the posterior edge. So I guess uh, I'm very thankful that uh, she has achieved union in a timely fashion. We didn't need to burn any bridges. She still has the option of revision in, in case she needed. Um, and thank you all for uh, your uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Khalid, for the very interesting uh, presentations. There are many difficulties and uh, increased risk of a non-union after treatment of the periprosthetic fracture because uh, the reduction and internal fixation interfered by the existing implant and cement. So, and the soft tissue issue is another issue. And uh, uh, yeah, um, now we are going to the Q&A session. Ms. Uh, Dr. Mohamed will be read for the question. Well, uh, I have a, all, yeah, Dr. Mohamed, yeah. First of all, uh, I would like to thank you, Khaled, for uh, the nice presentation. I have a quick question for you to start with. Sure. Um, so, did you find any difference between uh, the BS and CR uh, in terms of rate of fracture? Because uh, as you know, the CR femurs, uh, we have more bone uh, reserve than uh, compared to the BS. So did you find anything about this? Well, and uh, I have done a few CRs. The vast majority of my cases are PS knees. Uh, I uh, cannot tell you with certainty whether there's a real difference uh, with regards to my uh, patient uh, cohort, but I definitely, if I had a fracture, such as the one I showed, I would rather to have a CR knee in to be able to preserve bone and uh, be able to at least use uh, retrograde nails, uh, to be honest. Uh, thinking from the uh, trauma perspective. Okay. Because uh, I, I read the recently paper uh, which stated that the PS uh, it has like 10 folds more, more risk of fracture comparing to the CR. So it does make uh, it does make uh, sense because of the modulus of elasticity as well because it's higher in a PS knee so it increases the risk of uh, periprosthetic fracture that's absolutely correct great comment Mohammed I can just make a quick comment you know it's often said that if you have a PS knee you can put in a nail and uh, you know the the diameter of the nail which you can pass through that uh, box is really never more than nine millimeter or so so that remains more of a psychological thing. And then the other people who have even gone on to say that if they have a CR knee, they'll use a Midas Rex and cut a, uh, cut a, a hole in the CR knee and put in a nail. But I think uh, I agree in my experience in rheumatoid patients, particularly with flexion deformity, 
the PS knee is dangerous. Small bones, osteoporotic bones. If you use a PS knee, you run a very high risk of fracture, particularly by the designs which have a peg, femoral peg in addition to the box. You know, your design did not have uh, uh, pegs with the with the box, but then there are certain implant designs uh, which uh, have pegs in addition to the box, and they really compromise the poor osteoporotic bone in a rheumatoid. So they are at a very high risk if you use PS in that. I agree with uh, Khalid there. Sir Rajesh, sir, I have a question for you. If somebody yeah. has notched the distal femur while doing surgery, so what preventive measure he can take for uh, preventing the future fractures? So uh, one thing is that, you know, a, a, a notching which is one millimeter or so, it doesn't really matter. This patient, uh, which uh, was shown, uh, it had a significant notching, but uh, try to avoid putting cement there. That causes bigger problem. And some, sometimes people have a tendency to put up some uh, cement underneath. Uh, if it was a significant notching and you are really scared, the ideal thing would be to put in a femoral component with the stem. Now, the problem is that there are very few uh, designs which give you a stem in a primary knee. Uh, the, uh, the PFC knee by uh, Johnson & Johnson is one of them. Otherwise, you can just put in a graft, you know, make a sliver of graft and put it there and make sure that, you know, the, uh, the you may have to little anteriorize, put in a graft and then hope for the best. Uh, you can give the treatment for osteoporosis, we often give for rheumatoids who undergo uh, the knee replacement. But then the ideal thing, if you ask me, if there's significant notching and you wanted to avoid, you should put in a stem. Okay, that's the best way. So yeah. what, what do you say for prophylactic fixation by a plate during the time of surgery? If you're not available, there's no uh, stem available with the implant. Uh, it may be a little overkill. You know, the problem with the plating or the nailing in osteoporotic bone. Now we are talking about osteoporotic bone and you were, you have shown a beautiful demonstration. That's exactly what I would have done. Not the intermediary plate, but the plate goes right till the base of the trochanter with one screw, even in the neck. That's how we operate all our periprosthetic fractures. I think that's a great message there. So if you're putting in a plate, you'll have to go and span the entire length. If you put in, uh, even with the femur, with the stem in osteoporotic bone, you have a stress riser at the tip of the stem. So always think stress risers in a weak bone, right? And if I have to, uh, if in a very parotic bone, more than once, I put in a femoral cortical strut, wired it in place rather than a plate. But if you want to plate it, if you feel that you need a plate, you'll have to go all the way up if the bone quality is poor. So, thank you, thank you, sir. Okay, Dr. I have a few questions to you. So uh, one one the first question is where did you get that plate that is pre bent that was pre bent proximally or did you bend that to engage that no, screw in the neck? No, I did bend it to be honest. Uh, the distal femur uh, locking plate comes in straight at the shaft, but I I had to re bend it to get that screw to span all the way to the neck. Okay, and, and that, that's a newer thing. But I have seen the three point five medial plate. We used to put uh, either tens or the enders nail. Uh, on the medial side. So that was one of the newer thing what I have seen. And how many screws will you accept engaging the distal cortex while putting a plate? The distal uh, component. And the lateral distal femur plate? Yes, uh, while, uh, putting, while treating a periprosthetic fracture. Yeah, so I, I would do three. minimum of three to four. Okay. Minimum of three to four. I wouldn't accept uh, less than that. Um, I think it's very important to consider that uh, the distal segment needs to be well fixed. And uh, the addition of the medial plate is to create a box. Uh, from the trauma literature, we know that you have to have the, to span the whole femur and you have to have a good distribution of your screws uh, to be able to use the plate in the stiffness that you want, because it is a stiff plate, as we all know. So uh, the addition of the interosseous medial plate gives it just a touch more stiffness, but not too much to create non-union. Totally agree with you. So uh, I have a question for Dr. Deepak uh, concerning the, uh, the alignment. So do you advise any kinematic alignment in severely osteoporotic uh, patient? There is a recent paper from BMC Musculoskeletal Disorder. Now, since the outcome of kinematic versus mechanical element is similar, 
they have come up with new advice that if you try to do a kinematically aligned knee and to give a result and to uh, see the result, try in a knee which is just like a AMOA, early AMOA knee and non-porotic. Okay, exactly. see, because of, yes, because of if you put a component in such a position and the uh, and the loading in the knee goes in that that way, you may have uh, to uh, see some failures in near future regarding periprosthetic fracture and the early TBL collapse. Exactly, this is what I, I recommend. No. Okay, totally agree. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Is there anything that you will refer to us? Um. I don't see any more questions, but uh, uh, how are we with time? I think uh, are we... Oh, one and a half minutes left. One and a half minutes. So I think yes. I'll quickly uh, take this opportunity being the chairperson and taking the liberty. I think all the speakers need to be congratulated. We had some great messages there. We started with the, with the fact that the, uh, the approach doesn't matter. Your technique matters and respect for soft issues matter. Then we went on to see that familiarize yourself with the procedure before you go on to operate and don't hesitate to ask for help. Then we came to know that kinematic alignment does not give great results in long term. So be careful when you choose, learn it from the experts. The biggest apprehension which people have is they're trying to cut the tibia in virus. If you overdo it, then the virus tibia will fail. So be aware of the uh, pitfalls in the kinematic alignment and remember that you're not gaining too much and then we had a beautiful illustration of a periprosthetic femoral fracture with an intermedullary plate which are very well done showed all the correct principles and the concepts so i thank take you, this opportunity to thank you thank dr muta and thank all the speakers uh, for their excellent participation and excellent presentations thank you very much it has been a great session Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it looks like we answer all the question in perfect timing. Thank you very much for the participants, for the speakers, and for the great committee for Dr. Jamal. Thank you very much, and looking forward to see you again for the next meeting, Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association. <laughs> stay young, stay safe, and see you later. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Muta. Thank you, Dr. Muta. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. I think with this we end the session first. It was of me. So now we'll move forward for the next session for the day. Uh, hello, moving now from the me jumping ahead. Uh, would like to welcome uh, and uh, uh, our chairman, Dr. David uh, Chong. Dr. David Chon, uh, he is uh, uh, from Malaysia. He is an immediate uh, past president of the APOA. And I uh, would like to welcome also Dr. Uh, Sara and uh, Dr. Priyanka from India. Dr. Sara, uh, she is an uh, Australian surgeon and currently uh, she is in the Commonwealth Sarcoma and Complex Arthroplasty Fellow at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in London. Uh, Dr. Sara will start now talking about the total hip approaches and bearing surfaces. Dr. Sara. Here, Dr. Sara goes about will request the chair. Okay, she has started. Uh, I work with Professor Ali but before the hospital. Okay, so I remember that uh, he is very fond of many I taught me and small incision and is is sara there apologies i am it's just not letting me share my screen could you, could you switch on your video please I... yes is sara there can you share your screen now please Oh, no, the app is not letting me share my screen. Could you switch on your video, please? Hi. Can you share your screen now, please? Oh, no, the app is not letting me share my screen. Oh, you can you can see you. Can you unmute yourself? We can see you. Hi. 
I think there is some mismatch between her voice and video. I think. Yeah. Yes. So till then, can we move on the next speaker, or uh, should we wait uh, for that uh, technical glitch? She's there. She's there. Okay. I apologize. It just wouldn't let me um share the full screen. So um, my talk today is just briefly on the approach to be associated with hip arthroplasty. Um, I've got no conflicts of interest that I need to declare. So currently I'm the um, sarcoma and complex joint arthro um, arthroplasty fellow at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital. Sarah, can you please be a bit louder? Sorry, is that better? Thank you. Beautiful. Um, so today I'm just going to speak briefly about the approaches and then the choice of bearing surfaces that we utilize for, I'm um, focusing on primary hip arthroplasty here. Um, and in Australia, what we've uh, recently uh, gone through all the literature and data about comparing the three major sources of approaches. They don't get further broken down in most of the literature compared to anterior versus lateral versus posterior if you're going to go through uh, large sort of studies at this point in time. And certainly whilst I understand that there's complexities within each of these, if we look at them philosophically, uh, it helps look at all of the data. So this is the 2019 data that was the most recently or very recently published data from the Australian Joint Registry that looks at our propensity to use predominantly posterior approach and then broken down into anterior and lateral approach. So I'm just gonna have a look at also our decision-making. So you'll also notice that predominantly we utilize the posterior approach um, in our heavier patients, the anterior approach, not so much, and the lateral approach is coming up as our last contender within Australia at the moment. So looking at, at the overall outcomes, it's a case of, our major four criteria for failure, modes of failure are infection, prosthesis, dislocation, fracture, loosening, and we looked at leg length discrepancy as well, but it's not something that uh, is really a driving decision maker in terms of your approach. Um, what you do notice is that early modes of failure, particularly in your anterior approach, which is in the top left-hand corner, uh, tends to be fracture. And then as you see a rise in loosening quite dramatically, once you get to about that two year point and start, you get a much higher rate of loosening than you do in the others. The reason for this is, and is essentially to do with the fact that the anterior approach has its steeper learning curve. So there's been lots of publications about that. Richard DeSteiger um, wrote an excellent article um, about it in the concept of, it takes approximately 50 procedures through the anterior approach to reach a steady state where your outcome measures are comparable to those who have been trained in the posterior lateral approaches. Having said that, you'll notice that the infection rate is slightly higher when you look at the lateral approaches in the early stages, but that then evens out. And then again, posterior is slightly higher for um, it's both dislocation and uh, infection. So when you go through this literature, it's a bearing up the differences in the surgical techniques and working out which particular risks you're willing to take and what is familiar in your hands. So looking at this, this is particularly for fracture. And as I said, it really highlights the steepness um, of that early mode of failure. This has got to do with the fact that predominantly when you're considering um, the anterior approach in this setting, the learning curve, the fact that your visibility is excellent of your cup, but it's a minimally invasive technique with it, generally speaking with minimal exposure of your proximal femur. The thought of this is that predominantly within the learning curve and then continuing on is the difficulty of uh, your access and then your cho choice of implants. Obviously, some people get around this by utilizing their image intensifier on the table. And as you get more familiar with their te technique and as the uh, instruments that we have available to us have advanced, we have seen that you know, there is some improvement in that, but it will be borne out in the literature over the next few years. So again, looking at revision for infection. Now, um, my experience with the anterior approach is that there is more damage potentially to the proximal soft tissues when, particularly when people are learning the technique or when uh, it's in the early phases of that or you, you've had poor patient selection. So larger body habitus, um, even if you tape adiposity out of the way, that, that tissue up in the groin area is particularly susceptible to it. However, that's interesting, not really what we see borne out in the data set what we see is a higher rate of infection um, for both your posterior and your lateral approaches. So dislocation, as you can see, predominantly um, your posterior and your lateral approaches have a slightly higher rate, but it's not 
truly significant compared to your anterior in this setting. Um, this is one of the driving factors that the, the marketing side of things will encourage you to say that there's a lower risk of dislocation. However, it's also the mode of dislocation. So obviously um, we do see dislocations in the anterior approach and they do tend to occur anteriorly. I think having spent several months researching through all of this when I was looking at the direct anterior approach, I think the key things for younger surgeons is what are you familiar with and where you are on the learning curve? It's all about your patient selection. It's all about good mentorship. It's all about exposure to um, what you're trying to achieve. So adding on to that, what extensile techniques are you comfortable with? If it's a simple primary arthroplasty in a fit, healthy, uh, well body habitus patient, you can choose whatever you're familiar with. If you're looking at the complexities of needing increased exposure, they are still available within the anterior approach, although lots of people say that they're not. You'd have to sweep down into a lateral distally. You have to be comfortable with an ASIS um, um, osteotomy to get that more proximal exposure if you need it. It's, again, you know, the posterior approach, you can sweep it up into your coccolean back or you can extend down into a true lateral. With a lateral approach, uh, you get excellent much better, much better exposure to the acetabulum and proximal femur than I was expecting. I was predominantly trained with posterior and anterior as, as a trainee. However, where I'm working now, uh, we do an anterior lateral approach, uh, which is partly because of the training situation that they have there and exposure, but also because of the amount of sarcoma work we do. Sweeping up into the pelvic region is quite common. I think you also need to consider the tools that you have available to you. So are you familiar with the equipment and can your um, service providers, the hospital, the reps provide you with on-table options, off-table options, instrumentation? Uh, and that, you know, most places have good kit for posterior approaches and lateral approaches, but particularly the anterior, given that a lot of people require increased instrumentation. Being familiar with that is important. What has been done before? Probably more important in the revision setting or when you're starting out and going to call a colleague in, who's around to help you and what tissue planes have been utilized before. So you need to consider, will, will you be destabilizing things further if you use the um, contralateral approach to what has previously been indicated? And as I said, sort of said with the extensile techniques, what intraoperative challenges do you think you're likely to face, particularly on the pelvic side, because that's often where we need to extend up to expose more if you have an intraoperative complication such as acetabular fracture. All of the approaches are quite good for extending uh, distally, but truly the posterior approach is the only one that's going to give you access to your posterior column intraoperatively. Um, and again, just knowing what osteotomies are available to you. So your trochanteric flips, your GANS osteotomies, your ASIS osteotomies to extend those approaches so that you can get to where you need to get to in a complex hip. So moving on to the bearing surfaces and the philosophies behind that, I'm sure all of us have a good handle on the basic functions of the bearing surfaces that we utilize. Um, we all know that survivorship of our total hip replacements is multifactorial, but overall bearing surface actually is borne out as being the most critical. So our, the tribology obviously refers to the bearing surface the, and, and we're looking at the longevity of it and the mechanisms of failure and how that's defined by what we actually are trying to achieve. And our goal with our bearing surface when we're replacing a hip is to create a surface that has a low coefficient of friction um, it's capable of significant deformity with rebound without failure and that does not have significant wear without secondary pathology being present. So I think the idea is that, you know, whilst most of the things that are on the market now replicate the hip joint in some way, shape or form, there's varying combinations that we can choose to utilise and what your choices will be made should be made on the individual patient as well as what we're seeing borne out in the literature. So briefly, metal and poly, it has the longest track record. Um, it's lowest in cost and it has the widest range of modular options and variations for us, which is why it's one of the things that keeps coming back time and time again for people to utilize. We're familiar with it. Um, the metal bearing is more, uh, head is more uh, resilient than say the ceramic options. Poly these days has evolved from being a cross-linked polyethylene to the highly cross-linked polyethylene with the multiple abilities to anneal it with its um, radiation to stabilize it. And now moving forward with the idea of in either uh, involving a vitamin E powder or having that inject um, put into it after it's actually been annealed with the idea that that increases its lubrication and, and its uh, wet ability properties that will hopefully decrease its oxidation and also give it longer uh, longevity. Uh, this ceramic is on. one minute remaining. Okay, um, ceramic on ceramic. 
best wear properties, but worst mechanical properties. Um, survivorship is good above the 36 head. Stripe wear, not great. Squeak, patients don't like it. And honestly, if it fractures, you're in for a terrible time with having to, when you revise it. Ceramic on poly is probably what most of us have moved to at this stage. So it's got the highest survivorship in the Australian registry at 10 years, but small numbers in a single company. So interpret that with care, but it gives us um, great wettability and it's the best option when you've come across ceramic on ceramic failure um, previously, because it will let those uh, components impact in and you can continue using it as a bearing surface. Just speaking quickly about the idea of um, modular dual mobility, increased heat size essentially increases greater stability. The secondary arc of motion that it provides with gives you a secondary interface at which things can fail. You only achieve that increased head stability at greater than 38 millimeters, which means you can't use it in very small patients. And whilst it gained rapid popularity in the 2000s, we still don't have good long-term data. Constrained liners, metal on poly, for the most part, varying combinations of how they interlock. Increased forces across the joint may increase wear within the joint and gives you a secondary interface of failure. Um, this patient on the right is one of the ones that I've been dealing with lately. I've come to her at a later stage in her, in her care, but she's impressed me with the fact that whilst it's not wear properties, she certainly created a few more modes of failure for us. So essentially highly cross-linked polyethylene is where we're at in 98% of our total hip replacements. As the cost of ceramic comes down, its use has gone up, but it has decreased modularity options. Your head size, you need at least four millimetres of poly and ideally more than six millimetres, even then the highly cross-linked. Um, ceramic on ceramic in young patients is fantastic, but the tolerances are tight. You need to know how you're using it if you're gonna use it. Um, very few people use it these days because of that very reason and the liner fracture. And vitamin E is probably the next evolution in our highly cross-linked polyethylene. So that's allowing us with thinner liners, which allows us larger heads conferring greater stability um, and hopefully less volumetric wear at the same time. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for a really good talk, Sarah. Uh, and David, too. Um, I agree with everything that you said. Um, only thing is that, you know, um, in Australia, we have this guy called Ross Profit who keeps saying that in his unit, he puts in the biggest incisions and he has the least problems. Would you agree with that? I think. Um... It's one of these things that minimally invasive surgery is fantastic when you've got the skill set to do it. And if you're in the right patient population, I think big incisions, giving yourself the exposure that you need and doing things accurately um, also definitely has its place. And I think that, you know, I don't think the size of your incision defines how happy your patient's going to be. I think the, the hard thing when you're starting out is I always will choose a bigger incision and work my way to the point where I feel like I can make a smaller one the next time and build confidence in the approach rather than uh, try and make someone happy and compromise my surgery. You know, it's, it's that always that rule as well of the first thing you do if you can't do something well is make a bigger incision, see better, get do what you're doing. You know, make sure you can see what you need to see. Um, so, wounds heal side to side, not end to end. I love small incisions, but I think it's critical that we get the actual implants right. Thank you. Um, how do we do to for our next speaker now? Hello? No, just asking Mohammed. Ah. Hello, Priyank? Yeah. yeah, Dr. Priyank here. Uh, uh, I think next speaker is uh, Dr. Katsuya Yokoyama from uh, Japan. And uh, I would like to invite him for his uh, lecture on next topic. That is uh, choosing the best implant in revision scenario. Uh, I would like to introduce him that he is graduate from Tokai University School of Medicine since 2008. And uh, he's working as an orthopedic surgeon with the OISO Hospital. And his main area of interest is uh, total hip and trauma. And uh, I would like to invite him for his lecture and would request him that uh, to conclude it in the given time. Hi. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a presentation. In recent years, the results of THA have shown that losing and dislocation are reduced by the use of large diameter femoral heads, and that wear is reduced by the use of cross-link polychain liners. However, as the number of THA procedure performance increases, the number of patients require 
has also been gradually increasing. The evolution of bone loss in the astebular and femur may be important in pre-operating planning for revision and predicting the progress for revisions. Evolution by simple X-ray and fundamental. However, CT imaging and 3D CT reconstruction are also performed to evaluate the site and amount of bone loss. Also, there are various classification systems to evaluate bone loss, the AOS classification and the Paprovsky classification for the astebran and the femur and well now. Uh, in general, the Paprovsky classification for the astebran does not require reconstruction for type 1. Uh, type 2, uh, the cup is placed in a high position or medial uh, Superior bone loss is filled with chip cancerous bone or bulb bone graft. To be should be replaced with bulb bone graft or meta augmentation. To C should be reconstructed with impact bone graft or bulb bone graft and plate. Three A a combination of bulb bone graft, metal augmentation, and impact bone graft are used to fill the bone loss with additional plate or gauge used are needed. 3B, uh, special attention is paid posterior column reconstruction. The cup should be a cementless cup if it comes in contact with the original bone or a cement cup if not. The reconstruction response in Paprovsky classification for the femur is to use cementless stem for type 1, 2, and 3A. However, if it is 3B or higher, the use of modular stem and magna stem should be considered. Impact bone graft with cemented stem is also used for type 3B or greater bone loss. Our hospital also follows the Paprovsky classification for treatment planning. In Paprovsky type 2, a several reconstruction, a KT plate is used in combination with bulb bone grafting collecting from the area. The KT plate is using in combination with bulb bone graft. Uh, ah, no, no. The KT plate is a cross shaped plate with a hook on the upper rim of the ultra at the distal end, a uh, screw fixation pallet at the proximal end. For the humor, uh, modulus is mainly used as a cementless according to the Pavlovsky classification. If the bone loss is extensive, cementing of the stem using impact bone graft is considered. Here, we present a patient who underwent revision at our hospital. The patient was a 78-year-old female who complained of right hip pain which had passed for one year. The patient past medical history included diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, BMI, 30 kg per square meter, and ADL at the level of use of one cane. The patient was diagnosed with right hip osteoarthritis kilogram Lorenz stage four from plain x-rays and was admitted for the purpose of surgery. The surgery was performed using a posterior lateral approach. A G7 dual mobility cup was uh, used for the abstebran, and a connective stem was used for the femur. At the time of surgery, the center of the abstebran was lost due to limbing, caused by poor bone quality of the abstebran. However, a cementless cup could be Placed and screw fixation was performed. The patient could be as a full weight after the surgery. Nevertheless, two weeks after the surgery, right hip pain increases and the plain x rays were taken as the displaced of the cup into the pelvis was observed. Division was considered. A diagnosis of Paprovsky classification type. To C was made from CT image take for pre-operating planning and 3D CT reconstruction. 
the surgery was performed using a posterior lateral approach as a, in, in the previous surgery, and the cup was removed and in, iliac bone was corrected. The iliac bone corrected and beta TCP atypical bone were used in combination. And the bone loss and the upper border of the acetabulum were transplanted. The acetabulum was fixed to the tear drop using a KT plate, after which a cement cup was used for the cup. Full load training for therapy was set added two weeks after surgery. As of one year after surgery, the cup was not being displaced as of the via plane X-rays, and the patient's idea is independent with the use of a single cane. In terms of surgery of revision, there have been many reports that the revision rate is 20% or less in 10 years. It has been reported that the short the revision from the initial surgery, the higher the risk of revision. Moreover, it has been reported that the rate of revision due to dislocation increases in patients with discreet activity. And the revision rate increases with uh, increases in friction risk or to BMI of 30 kg per square meter or higher. There are the conclusions for revision after THA in our hospital. Impact selection is performed according to the Pokrovsky classification for the acetabulum and femur in pre-operating planning. Even in the patient case, we Expansion the period from the initial surgery that to division was short. BMI was 30 kg per square meter and the infection risk rate was high. However, the division was not necessary even one year after surgery. And the results were also considered favorable. The, the sufficient selection of implants for patients who will undergo revision is considered important in possible preventing the revision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yobiyama. Just a question. You know, in Japan, your number one indication for hip replacement is acetabular dysplasia, which means, really, in most cases, although not, not every one, you're starting off with a small acetabulum. And I have the impression that when you try to get a much bigger uh, femoral head in or a femoral or a septic cup in, you're going to end up with the problem that we see on that case that you showed, where you overream uh, the acetabulum, resulting in either rim loss or central bone loss. Um, um, so, but in the old days, everyone did it with cement, and I, I would imagine that now almost everyone just does a cementless cut. Um, what is your experience with this? Uh, this case, uh, um, bone uh, loss, uh, um, rheumatoid artist, uh, 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 bone quality uh, loss. Uh, and the oh, yeah, so it's because of the rheumatoid arthritis that the quality of the bone was not very good. Is, mm. that, is that what you think? Oh, I don't know. Yes, but yeah, okay. But okay, number two, way, way down the list indication for uh, social hip replacement in Japan, like almost, I mean, most top, most most uh, speakers from Japan would say that it's maybe 95% um, or 90% as a tablet displacement. Anyway, we need to move on. So, guys, are we ready for the next speaker? Yes, uh, our next speaker, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Henry Fu. He's uh, an associate consultant, uh, Division of Joint Replacement Surgery in uh, Queen Mary Hospital, Hong Kong. He's honorary clinical assistant professor in the University of Hong Kong and director of Hong Kong Island Joint. 
Uh, he's a special interest in uh, robotic associated uh, surgery in uh, joint replacements. So we'd like to welcome him for uh, the next uh, talk. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Professor Chun um, for attending uh, my session and um, the committee for um, inviting me. So uh, my name is uh, Dr. Henry Fu, as we mentioned before. I have some disclosures. I am one of the three um, trainers for um, robotic assisted um, uh, total hip replacement uh, inside Hong Kong. And um, I'm from the um, University of Hong Kong, um, the, um, uh, Faculty of Medicine, and these are the two hospitals I work in, Queen Mary Hospital and Duchess of Kent Children's Hospital, where we pre perform 350 joint replacements per year in each of these hospitals. Um, and we also have two robots um, stationed there at this moment. So we have some myths um, about robotic surgery, and um, uh, these are just the um, ones I thought out of my mind, and I'll go through them one by one. Um, the first one is robotics is just an expensive form of navigation. Is it so? So in development of technology like mobile phones, um, I think surgery is also need to be developed um, from conventional instruments to navigation to now robotics. We are improving day by day, but we won't really want to go back. Navigation is um, one advanced technology. It is fast, inexpensive, and it can use infrared systems to tell you um, the inclination and antiversion of the cup impaction. It can also tell you the leg length and offset, but can it do everything? Um, so nowadays we have the robotic arm assisted total hip replacement. You see that this um, console is um, um, basically it has, apart from the robotic arm, it also has um, a guidance module and the camera. Um, so what else can it offer? It offers pre-op CT based planning. You can see exactly where you want to put the cup, the size of the cup that is controlled by the robotic arm. During the remain, um, it controls not only the direction, it also controls the depth and the height of the, of the cup. And femoral side is basically navigation. And the main difference uh, between robotic and navigation is that there is CT-based planning and haptic guidance. And these are the differences between the two. So CT-based is definitely more accurate than um, two-dimensional radiographic planning. And also there's haptic controlled reaming and impaction for robotics. And there is excellent restoration of the planned hip center of rotation rather than just the angle. Um, but obviously is more costly and has a larger footprint in your uh, OR. What about the second myth? Robotic surgery is not evidence-based, a waste of time and not cost-effective. Um, there is starting to have some literatures comparing the two systems, um, robotic and conventional. Basically, we see in terms of inclination and antiversion, robotics is better than conventional with a similar OR time and surgical time. And um, obviously nowadays we talk uh, more um, uh, uh, outside the Lunix safe zone, but if we just use this as a fixed target, you can see that robotics is more consistent compared to conventional. And um, if we look at the planning of the uh, surgeon and the intraoperative cup placement in terms of acetabular component and also femoral component and combined antiversion um, using a CT-based study, it is basically um, uh, very comparable and reproducible. And in terms of functional outcome, they're starting to have some longer term follow-up, um, uh, minimum five years in this study um, published in the Journal of AAOS, um, saying that robotics has higher um, scores. And how about costs? Um, there are some studies that talk about robotics um, being more cost effective, um, mainly saving costs in terms of lower risk of dislocation and revisions. So let's talk about uh, our experience in Hong Kong. We started to do um, robotic um, uh, uh, total hip last year and two year experience just total hip wise, we did um, around 83 cases and um, these are the learning curves. So um, 
all these 50 cases were done by myself. And you can see that there is a learning curve phenomenon of around nine cases. Um, average time nowadays is um, one and a half hour, but this is talking about skin to skin time from incision to the last suture closing up the whole wound. We, uh, in terms of the outcomes, we had one bumped array, one cup displacement after verification, one patient died of unrelated causes, but um, note that within these um, follow-up cases, we had no dislocation, no fracture, no loosening, and no early reoperations. Um, looking at our own data, we find 96% within the Lunix safe zone. And in terms of the acetabular component and femoral size, sizing, um, compared with preoperatively, acetabular side is more consistent. Femoral size, most of them were within one size difference. So the third myth is that experienced surgeons don't need a robot and they can do everything. But sometimes we have difficult cases like this. This is a AS patient with a fused hip. And you can see even with our very experienced surgeons, sometimes um, things do happen um, like this requiring fixation. But if we have the robot, we can have a more accurate planning. You can see on this CT scan, we have a very accurate cup planning. Intraoperatively, we can see where the landmarks are, but then we can use navigation to help us do a navigated in situ neck cut, uh, avoiding cutting into the acetabulum. And then we can just put in the reamer without seeing where we are. So the robot helps you see where you are and it will stop you if you go too deep or go outside the planned boundaries. And um, after reaming, it is just a pool of blood. You cannot see every, anything inside, but if you clean it all up, you can see the acetabulum come back like this. And uh, you can verify the position of your cup and the uh, uh, inclination as, as well as the version. And postoperatively, you can see the x-ray on the right compared to the pre-op planning. It is very consistent with a good functional outcome of this patient. In terms of these difficult cases, it can help you do the neck osteotomy and identify where is the true floor of the acetabulum without having to use um, any fluoroscopic guidance. Another difficult case like this with um, um, previous acetabular fractures, plates and screws all around. Most of the time, um, conventionally, you might need to remove some screws, but luckily if we do the CT scan, we can find a very narrow margin that we can put in the cup exactly where we want it to be without touching any of the screws. This is the plan. And the reamer would stop when we go outside the boundaries and we can um, just put in a cup without taking away any of the screws. High dislocation is another good indication, especially coupled with this one with previous femoral osteotomy and uh, with a significant leg length discrepancy. This one, we need to um, put the cup, uh, we try to aim it back into the anatomical center as well as maximize the cup um, um, diameter by maximizing the um, post bone contact. And this is the planning intraoperatively. Um, although the Bone contact you see still is not as optimal as the usual total hip, but that's already the best we can do. And intraoperatively, basically we can't really identify a lot of the landmarks, but the robot will help us identify. You do the registration as well as the femoral side, we use 3D printing technology to help us do a derotation and shortening uh, osteotomy. And this is the patient at six months uh, post-operative. Um, we can see that the cup is restored in the anatomical hip center. We do shortening of around 1.5 centimeters and compared pre-op and post-op, um, the patient has good outcomes. Complex cases, we do quite a number in Queen Mary Hospital um, uh, using this technology. And especially in terms of restoring the anatomical hip center within the Rana-Watts triangle, we think that this is um, really beneficial with this technology. Even if we compare the surgeon's experience with uh, a surgeon who just picked up using the robots, we can see that actually 
um, for surgeons uh, who just picked up the robot, it is already uh, more accurate than a surgeon who is very experienced with manual posterior in terms of hitting the surgeon's target. And even during the learning curve, there was um, no um, uh, compromised uh, surgical time and complications. Time, time, time. Stick to time, please. Okay, uh, the last one is robotics are bulletproof and can replace the hands of surgeons. Not necessarily anything uh, that can go wrong can go wrong. Examples of failure like bump array, unsatisfactory registration, checkpoint error, or robotic arm failure or computer display error can always happen. But there are um, different ways you can ask the rep to help you and um, uh, go through these steps, but rarely you need to convert to manual, but always be prepared. So with enhanced planning, you can see that uh, robot has its advantage and also constraints during your reaming. So um, in conclusion, I think robotic total hip is a useful tool for surgeons and in particular when managing um, complex cases um, like these. With that, I thank um, my colleagues and um, the committee for selecting me to give this talk. Thank you very much. Hi, Henry, thanks for the talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks also for all, for all your help with the journal and your, your review of our articles in the journal. That's been very useful over the years. Um, Thank you, Professor Chu. Nice to see Peter Chu and uh, Yan Chun Ho in those pictures of yours. Um, I hope they're well. But you know, uh, Hong Kong has uh, some fame in the treatment and the and, uh, management of patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And I certainly remember that paper, paper that Peter Chu and W. N. Tang wrote in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery to do with the fact that actually placement of the cup uh, and the alignment of the implant in an ank spawn patient is considerably different from that of a normal patient. So um, what do you do in terms of uh, the ank spawn cases? Uh, yes, very good question. Thank you, Professor Chun. So um, in terms of the ankylosing spondylitis patients, we look at the preoperative um, pelvic x-rays and we usually do take some standing long films to see their um, pelvic tilt as well. And um, Professor Chu has published an article talking about the obturator for Raymond ratio um, to um, determine the rotation of the um, pelvis um, uh, uh, before the operation. So if we think that the um, obturator for amen ratio in terms of the height uh, is significantly larger than the width of the obturator for amen, um, then uh, we know that the pelvis is significantly rotated. In these cases, we usually decrease the antiversion of the cup and also decrease the inclination angle um, uh, of the cup when we um, put it in. Um, so for the robot, for standard cases, we just set 40 degrees of inclination and um, 20 degrees of antiversion. For these cases of AS, uh, just like the one I showed, um, I usually put them at 35 degrees of uh, inclination and then um, around uh, 15 degrees of antiversion, but depends on case by case uh, uh, scenario. So um, with this robot, we can um, actually put it um, uh, where we want it to be. So um, we aim to restore the functional position rather than anatomical position of the cup. Okay, well, we're running a bit late and we, we've been told to hurry up. So uh, Thank you. Thanks, Thank Dr. You. Fu, for your wonderful lecture. And now I would like to invite the next speaker uh, who is in fact senior to me in my undergraduate school, so I would call uh, Dr. Unmesh Chakravarti for his uh, uh, lecture on infection, uh, dealing with infections following THR. So please, Dr. Unmesh Chakravarti, please share your screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So I come from Varanasi. You can see it on the map. And I'm working there at Oriana Hospital and Chakravarti Clinic. So it's a beautiful city, and um, all of you are most welcome to come over here after the COVID crisis, and we can take you around the river. It's a beautiful place to be. So I have no conflict of interest. So there are almost um, 20, 100,000 hip replacements being done in a year all over the world. And uh, the incidence of infection in primary arthroplasty is almost 1% to 2%. And if you look at the number of... Um, 
Um, percentage of hip revisions, it almost comprises 15% of revisions. And we all know that revision of these cases means expensive implants and a lot of comorbidities. So the idea behind this lecture is to um, look at the diagnosis and the timing about of infection, a good preoperative planning, understand the DARE, one stage, two stage revisions, and the postoperative management. So a basic bio idea about the biomechanisms and the physiology. Uh, the stage one, two, and three, the bacteria is just attached. It occurs within zero to four weeks, and it's the acute phase. And the late maturation and the dispersion from there, it's for more than four weeks, and it's the chronic phase. And if we work aggressively on the right way in the acute phase, that is where we can aim at controlling the infection well. So time is of essence. So a high index of suspicion and low threshold to, in the, uh, to intervene can save the joints that we have put. So the goals of diagnosing a PGI is early clinical suspicion, early outdoor lab workup, and early confirmation of diagnosis. So any new onset swelling, redness, or discharge should give you the suspicion. And the most important thing in the outdoor is to get a joint aspiration in all these cases, subjected to microscopy and an extended culture. And you need to confirm it and reconfirm it during the debridement and during the revision with histology tissue cultures and also sonication of the implant that has been taken out. And now a preoperative joint aspirate is known to be the most viable diagnostic tool and should be performed in every painful prosthetic joint prior to surgical intervention. So we just look into the stats. If you see, the clinical features have a sensitivity of 20 to 30% and a specificity of almost 100%. But what is very important is that uh, aspirate in the OPD and looking at the leukocyte and the percentage of granulocytes has a sensitivity of almost 90% and a specificity of 95%. And when we are taking perioperative histology and looking at the gran granulocytes, the sensitivity is lower. And microbiology can vary from 45 to 90% of sensitivity and has got a high specificity. And if you want to increase the sensitivity of these, um, these tests, what is important is to avoid long-term prophylactic antibiotics. We need to coordinate with the pathologists, the microbiologists, so that they exactly know what we are looking for and give them the proper history about the timing of infection, timing of surgery, et cetera. For histology, at least four to five different uh, quadrant tissues are needed because, you know, these are slow brain organisms. And for microbiology, what is very important is we need to stop the antibiotics for at least two weeks, avoid pre of antibiotics, at least two to four um, uh, substance um, samples. And we need to inoculate right there on table into aerobic and anaerobic media. That really improves the survival of the bacteria and helps us increasing the sensitivity. So the take home message is coordination and avoiding superficial and sinus swabs. So uh, the after infection is confirmed, the goals are an early intervention, reconfirmation of diagnosis, radical removal of all biofilm and dead tissue, avoid devitalization, and a proper bioactive antibiotic in proper dose and duration. So the three words, a bioactive antibiotic, proper dose and duration, they're very important. Now, we need to tell the patients and ourselves understand what we are going to do. If bad prognostic factors are there, we need to be very careful. So difficult to treat infections are caused by pathogens which are resistant to rifampicin, ciprofloxacin, and fungi. If there is bad bone, bad soft tissue, and loose processes, it's a bad prognostic factor. And if there's a vancomycin or fluconazole resistant organism, maybe it is not amenable to revision and they sometimes needs either explantation, excision arthroplasty, or a lifetime, uh, lifelong antibiotic separation. Now, the work is basically it's an acute PGI. It has good bone, soft tissue, stable prosthesis, not DGT. Within four weeks, we can plan to do a DARE. That is debridement, antibiotic, exchange of mobile parts, and uh, implant retention. If it is not, it's a chronic PGI or it has the bad factors, bad prognostic factors, DGT, we plan a prosthetic exchange. And if we see that there is um, no DTT, no uh, bad soft tissues, there's no fistula, and there's no past history of previous revisions, we can plan for a one-stage exchange. Now, this is a debatable surgical procedure. It has got good results in selected centers like endoclinic, and it needs a lot of experience and a lot of coordination. Or else the gold standard is a two-stage revision. And again, you need to look at the bad prognostic factors. And if there are bad prognostic factors, the long, uh, the interval for exchange can be six to eight weeks. 
or else a short interval exchange of two to three weeks. Now, what is DARE? So DARE is debridement with antibiotics and implant retention. So ideally, 28 days, within 28 day, days of index surgery or onset of symptoms, it gives you the best results. Since we need to isolate the organism and know which antibiotic has to work, we have to get the cultures. That is why it is best if the antibiotics were off for seven to 14 days. Isolate the organisms at least three to four different areas of culture from four to five quadrants. Exchange all mobile parts, which is very important that improves the result of their sonicate the removed parts and uh, just confirm the organism. Remove all internal non absorbable sutures and remove, uh, replace them with absorbable sutures. The one stage exchange again, stop all antibiotics for two weeks, aspirate and send for extended cultures. Again, if we do not have the organism, we cannot do a one stage exchange. Identification of organisms sensitive to biofilm penetrating oral antibiotics is a must. If the organism is resistant to oral biofilm penetrating antibiotics, we cannot do a one stage exchange because the organism will regrow. Remove all implants completely, do a sonication of all implants for organism, do a radical debridement, send three to four tissue cultures, four to five quadrants. And the important thing is after the debridement is over, everybody dewashes, it is re-prepared. It's like a fresh surgery and the entire team has to coordinate and do it in one go. The standard gold stage, uh, gold standard two-stage exchange, stop all antibiotics for two weeks, aspirate, send for extended cultures for 14 days. It can even be up to 21 days, directly in aerobic and anaerobic vials. Remove all implants completely, debride, debride, debride. That is the crux. Send cultures. Spaces loaded with appropriate antibiotics. We'll cover that in the next slide. Plan reimplantation in two to three weeks. There's absolutely no role of antibiotic holiday. The role of antibiotic holiday and repeat CRP is gradually going down. We can debate on that. And if there is DTT, bad bone, bad soft tissue, we need to extend the interval up to six to eight weeks before we do a final reimplantation. Now, coming on to the antibiotics in the cement, is not here. You always have to use a combination of two antibiotics in the cement when we are doing revisions. Uh, the standard is Genta and Clinda. If it is a uh, special situations where we have got staph, we do a Genta Vanco or a Genta Dapto. If it is Vanco resistant, it's Genta Lanozolid or Genta Dapto, Genta Phospho. If it's a gram negative pathogen, it is Genta Cholestine, Genta Phospho, Genta Miro, and Genta Cipro. These are the combinations. And for Feast uh, Yeasts, we have Genta Amphotericine B or Boriconazole. Note um, the better uh, cements are ones which we get from the industry itself because the preservatives and the combination is right. If you're making on table, it has to be in powder form, not liquid. So I can understand there can be problems with the liquid antibiotics, prefer preferably not exceeding. 10% and it has to be hand mixed so that we make it a porous cement and not a vac mixed one. Now, keys to success are isolating the organism. This is a must. There's, there's nothing about it. If we cannot isolate the organism, the revision is bound to fail. So take all the precautions. DTT, bad bone, poor soft tissue, loose implants are bad prognostic factors. Debridement has to be radical. Again, this is very important. Without, the, without that, the revision will fail. The, um, when in doubt, do a two-stage or even a three-stage. All antibiotics has to be given at optimum doses. We tend to give underdose. We tend to uh, give it for um, at a lower uh, dose as um, for the body waste. So we need to work on that. The common pitfalls include superficial cultures from sinuses, which can give false positive or even sometimes false negative results. Underdosing of IV and oral antibiotics. Never use oral antibiotics monotherapy. They, they uh, develop resistance, so they have to be two or three drugs. And again, bioactive antibiotics not to be used with spaces or drains. They come at the time of the spinal implantation, and uh, that is because we need to avoid any kind of resistance to form. Now, interval antibiotic suppression for DTT. Here, we need to take into account that if we are uh, having difficult to treat, we use rifampicin, six months plus quinolone for three. Rifampicin resistance, so sensitive antibiotics for running short of time. Uh, Ciplox resistance, we use mirocholestine phosphomycin. Fluconazole resistance, we have got voriconazole or lifelong suppression. And vanco resistance, we do a implant removal or lifelong suppression. To conclude, avoid long term prophylactic antibiotics. Isolate the organism, aspirate, and extended culture. Extended culture is very important, so that's where the microbiologist comes in. A DARE procedure for early diagnosis of infection. One stage only for selected cases and very good centers who have experience. Two stage is still the gold standard and post of management 
targeted bioactive IV and oral antibiotics. Thank you. I'm done, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Shakardi. Uh, uh, useful and informative uh, presentation. Our uh, next speaker will be Dr. Fatah. Uh, he will talk about the initial five years of your arthroplasty career. Dr. Fatah, can you share your screen, please? Um, hello, can you? Okay. So I hope you can see my presentation right now. So Harry, hello, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very um, prestigious meeting and uh, session. Actually, uh, my talk is, I think, one of the most difficult talks because it will be very difficult for me to speak in front of one of my important teacher, uh, Dr. Chun. So, um, Talking about experience in front of him will be a little um, a stressful for me. Uh, but um, again, thank you for inviting me. So, um, so these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, for uh, th this is a very important graphics, uh, and the, um, the the investors of this. Um, 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 graphics and the um, article had a Nobel Prize in psychology because it's a very, very commonly seen effect, Dunning-Kruger effect. At the very first years of our career, we feel that we can do everything. We have a lot of confidence, but within increase, uh, within time, the, as the, our experience increases, we feel that we're not that perfect and we come into a balance within time. So this is very important. Uh, I, I'm going to talk, yes, about the first five years of, of my arthroplastic career, but it's not only about the arthroplasty, it's, a, it's, it's a valid for every, every kind of experience in um, not only in arthroplasty, but as a surgeon. So first step is to explore yourself. This is very important. As you are aware of your skills and your limits, that will, uh, that will carry you to uh, if success within time, but not very, very quickly. So after being finishing the residency, during the five years of my career, I keep observing and learning. This is very important. And learning from, yes, from um, um, seniors, teachers, you always will have teachers. This is... Um, the CCOT executive committee meeting. They are very important. They have always been very important people for me. And it's not surprising to learn from seniors, but yeah, these are also other uh, teachers from, from uh, all around the world for me. I, I keep trying to learn uh, from those people, but also uh, as, as um, you work with different, different people in different levels in their uh, profession, you can learn from anybody, not only from seniors, but a good observer can learn from everything. And this is possible only with a team work. Uh, so this, uh, this was my team in, when I was in the United States. And this brings a kind of competition, but a friendly competition. Uh, because um, the, uh, trying to learn from people around your level is important, but it also it has a competition in it. So these are all uh, my friends from different parts of the world, and I uh, keep learning from them also. Uh, it's not only like a friendship, but keep learning from them, but there should be a limit for that. Like learning, but how much learning, because you should not be very uh, brave to attempt to apply what you learn immediately. You should keep observing and see what is going wrong when, you, uh, when you're practicing. So it should, you should develop a feedback mechanism. Um, so language is a barrier and you, that's the step one in order to, in order to exceed this um, 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 a barrier in front of your learning because our job is international, it's universal. So the language 
is an important thing here. I used to work in the Rothman Institute uh, from 2013 to 2015 as a fellow. Uh, it looks very shiny and bright, uh, but it's, it's not like something like that. It's an imagination, okay? The photographs and the image is nothing, but this, is, this was my office. It's a very ordinary office. And this was the lab I used to work. I also work in the OR, but they are they look very um, like similar to our places in our countries. Uh, the thing here is the functionality. So the most important thing is what you have at the end of the day. The physical conditions are not everything. We, for example, this one was also the um, photograph. Uh, from the office I used to work in the United States. This is, uh, it was not like that for years, but for a couple of months, the ceiling was dropping. So it's, it's, it can be seen anywhere, but we didn't stop working. So uh, we should not engage our um, successes to the physical conditions, okay? Uh, and we should keep uh, functioning in every different uh, and sometimes difficult situations. I put this photo because uh, you see three uh, men here. This is me from Turkey, Puyas from Iran, and Sneer from Israel. So in political arena, uh, you cannot keep these three people in the same room. Uh, but we were close friends and working for the same project uh, for, for, for a long time uh, because our work is universal. And the heart does not have color, it's red in everybody, like the color of the blood. So the being universal and being in interaction with every kind of people that you can learn is important. And then uh, as, as you learn, it's important to share your knowledge and values because uh, after the first five years of your experience, you need you will need a lot of people around you to work with you will you, you you are going to constitute a team sometimes you need to do that so you have to keep sharing your knowledge and values it's our one of our responsibilities and anybody from any part of the world so this was one of our um courses i think it was the seventh year of my orthoplastic experience but it was possible with only the, the um, activities I have done during the first five years of my uh, career, I interact with anybody in, from all around the world. So uh, at that course, there was 24 uh, surgeons from 24 countries. And next one is um, in October. So I just want to uh, invite you to this course. It's arthroplasty course. You can contact me from this email address. Uh, lastly, but not least, the family is very important. Whatever I say or whoever uh, say, uh, in the first five years of uh, your career, you're not going to give enough importance to your family and you will not um, going to dedicate your time uh, to your family. Uh, because in the first five years, it's always about your career. You want to um, like uh, be successful in your institution, in your hospital, and we all. I mean, it's 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 very common to uh, like put the family into the second place. Unfortunately, this is uh, this is always I can almost always this is the case. And whoever uh, tell you this should not be in this way. Uh, it's always like that. But what you should keep in mind that um, whatever success you are reaching is uh, is with only possible with the support of your family. So after that five years, don't forget that your family is there and all of your success was possible with the support of your family. So uh, I think this is important to keep in mind. Today, this morning, I should uh, see this interesting article in Harvard Business Review. I would like to just share this uh, last sentence with you. So any organization uh, may, uh, may, may uh, give you a feeling of underutilization or a disconnection, but putting your efforts for good 
uh, use and making it uh, m m try to make a difference is important. And last uh, sentence say that that uh, effort may not get the recognition it deserves. We, we very commonly feel this, but it could bring the satisfaction back of doing the important work and doing it well. And most importantly, at the very last, it will set uh, you up for a better position at a wider, wiser uh, organization. So we should keep in mind that the, the, what we focus on is to make the job right and not to be over brave. Uh, we should be aware of our limits and keep doing the right thing uh, as much as we can. At the end of that long, long years, uh, you're, you're, you're going to be in a better position in a wiser organization. So lastly, I would like to in, uh, invite you for our um, the course in Istanbul and also the Arthroplasty Fellowship Program in Istanbul yeah, University, where I'm working. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Very good. Well, thank analysis. you very much, Mate. I think there are no questions unless there's anything burning because we are 10 minutes late and uh, I think somebody will be hot on my tail if we continue to waste uh, other people's time. Shai is waiting to start there. I can see any, any burning questions? If not, then I'd like to thank Mohammed and uh, Piat, my, my co host, and uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, sir, for being with us and giving your precious time and your tips. And thank you all the speakers and uh, our moderators also, Dr. Piyank and Muhammad, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you for being there. And I think this concludes our HIP session also. And now we'll quickly shift to our last session that is about case discussions. For that, our chairperson uh, is Dr. Shahid Noor and our moderators are Fariduddin Ahmed and Jeevan K. Dr. Shahid Noor, uh, is a premier arthroplasty surgeon based in Karachi. He is the president of Pakistan Arthroplasty Society and a counselor of the Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association. So the screen is all yours. I think uh, Dr. G. Wan Kim is here and uh, Dr. Fayduddin Ahmad. Kindly unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I'm here and we can start the case discussion sessions. I think first case is to be presented by, by my by me itself. So I'm just sharing my screen. So I'll quickly move on to the case because we are running short of time. So this was a complex primary bilateral knee a 45 year old male, no other comorbidities. He came to me with this X-ray with the severe virus bilateral knee and uh, he wanted a perfect knee. So what I planned, he also he was in constraint of some money. So the knee was very bad with large osteophytes. You can see the in the supraportalar pouch also, there was a huge osteophyte. So what I did was a standard PFC Sigma knee was not happy with the post-op X-ray, especially on the left side. I had used 17.5 mm insert in this patient as a backup TC3 implant was not available. His LCL was a bit lax, but he was happy because he was walking the next day of the surgery. So he kept moving. This was his three month X-ray. I could see some sort of lysis around the tibial component in the left knee. And when he came after six months, his tibial component was loose and it was toggled off. He came with pain. So what I planned in this patient as when I opened it up, I was having a backup of TC3. I usually do a dupe implant. So I was ready with the TC3 implant. But while op after opening the knee, I found that the femoral component was okay. So what I did, I did put a stamp, revised the tibial component and did put a uh, a TC3 insert, a revision insert in the PFC Sigma femoral component. So I explained the patient also about this thing and uh, told him that he might need some sort of revision in future also. So this was done somewhat around four and a half years back. It was done in uh, 2017. 
so this patient was lost in follow up and suddenly he uh, reappeared after 4 years with this problem his left knee was absolutely fine and now he has a toggle right knee component also so but he still somehow he is managing this is his video i think so this is his latest video is walking with the more weight bearing on the left knee right knee is bit painful he can walk but he is painful so what i am planning to revise the right knee also with a stem uh, with two zone at least two zone fixation on the tbl component with stem or with a sleeve if needed and uh, revising the femoral component also on the right side any comments sir chait sir um <clears throat> i think uh, uh, people who are trained abroad uh, for example from uk and usa they don't see any cases in usa and europe and when you come back to your country you are faced with a challenging deformity where your clinical skills are not there to deal and then the logistic problem of having the full inventory of implant uh, and i had faced this problem 20 years ago when i came back from england um, my advice to all young surgeons would be uh, to understand the principles of correction of deformity so there are two elements one is clinical assessment whether the deformity is correctable or fixed so a correctable deformity will require less soft tissue release and a fixed deformity will require more soft tissue release the second problem is bone loss and bone loss can be managed in different ways for example you use a bone graft and a screw but it sh should always be supplemented by a stem if you had put a stem in the beginning most of your problem would not have been um, have occurred the third comment is that you've used a stemmed implant and a tc3 poly on a ps femoral component so that's a miracle uh, that it has lasted because it's a mix and match that it's a ps femoral component and a tc3 poly so and that is going to cause a massive wear uh, and constrain but is still surviving um, so that's my little uh, input uh, so this is a everyday knee in pakistan uh, and whether it be bangladesh or india or other spaces so when we train people it is yes it is important for them to visit hospital for special surgery and europe and england but i think there should be more fellowship center in india and in pakistan and in bangladesh where young surgeons from this region would have opportunity to see we do these cases every day so that's my little comment thank you sir thank you any other comment from other uh, panelists dr david are you there i think is not there i'm here like a bad penny hi sir Actually, you uh, you know this mix and match thing uh, how I, i don't disagree with it i do it quite uh, commonly um with this kind of deformity actually honestly i would put in a standard cr uh implant and 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 get get that balance it would not be an issue for me usually but um you know again in my part of world just like sai chahid uh we we just deal with this all the time uh and we're used to to this uh problem in fact the the main thing here if you want stability if you preserve the posterior cruciate ligament somehow or other it seems to stabilize the whole knee um the 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 big problem you have with these knees here and why you have to put such a large insert in is because hey you want to take the recommended cuts on the tibia that's just too much on the tibia number two um your lateral collateral ligament is incredibly lax your medial collateral ligament is incredibly tight and when you try to balance the mcl to the lcl you will fail it's much better to try and balance your mcl to your pcl and that will give you a stable knee uh, if you're going to revise it then uh actually since about 8 4 5 years ago you could have actually used a metaphyseal sleeve and those things are incredibly incredibly stable so that's what i would have done thank you sir thank you for a nice comments uh, can i add one more comment uh that soft tissue release uh and there are 
osteophyte and there are thick soft tissue attached to the superficial medial collateral ligament and you have to be able to release that uh, conventionally it had been said to go more distally but that is going to create more instability so in these various knees uh, you might have to go posterior medially so posterior medial uh, soft tissue release is the key um, uh, of balancing this knee and i totally agree with david shun that you should have a conservative cut on the tibia so that you don't have to use a massive size uh, poly but uh, people should come to karachi and uh, visit david shun and and in various centers of india to see this happening every day i mean in my list yesterday we had four bilateral and a revisions and two total hip replacement and uh, the prosthetic fracture so we have large huge list and we see it every day thank you thank you sir thank you for your nice comments so thank you uh, dr vinay tether for nice case presentation now i'll request uh, dr yukrit please present your case dr yukrit please please unmute yourself Okay, uh, thank you for my opportunity to present the case. Um, okay, this case is belong to the female, 65 years old. Uh, she has both knee pain for uh, 10 years and 45 years ago, she had uh, crashed by the car and uh, have the bilateral femoral shaft fractures. After one year of treatment with the uh, traditional medicine, uh, she can walk with get it, without get it, sorry. Uh, but the last 10 years, the pain in the knee was progressed uh, and uh, did not improve by the medication. This is uh, the uh, walk of the patient. Okay, she can walk without getting it, but uh, she has pain on the knee. Okay. This is the theme of uh, both knee. Um, you can see the OA change of both knee, uh, severe, right. severe OA, and the deformity of the bilateral femur, like this. And tibia is uh, still good, but the deformity is in the femur. So this is a scanogram of the patient. Okay, you can see the severe virus of both knee and the uh, uh, Malonite of the bilateral femur. Okay, so the question is, uh, how we deal with the extraarticular deformity in this case? Uh, who want to do the osteotomy first and follow by the TKA or the simultaneous osteotomy and TKA? Uh, or you can correct uh, the deformity uh, in the, the intraarticular correction. Uh, uh, have any comments from uh, the participant? Uh, I mean, you have two options. I mean, uh, either to do a two-stage procedure and do correction, either by an uh, intramedullary device or an extramedullary device, and once it is healed, then you can proceed with your procedure. And then you have to assess whether this deformity can be corrected by your intra-articular cut. And a significant deformity will lead to such a cut that your collateral attachment will be involved and that is going to lead to instability. And mm -hmm. uh, so you have an option of using a navigation uh, and having, uh, 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 you can use a PS, uh, PSI, patient-specific instrumentation, but with a significant deformity. If the deformity is more near the knee joint, then it is going to be more significant. The farther it is away from the knee, the, it is easier to correct by intra-articular cut. Uh, so it is planning, pre-operative planning, so that you don't face a uh, problem intraoperatively and postoperatively. So that's my comment. Okay, thank you. Um... you know, this was the second case I did with, with CAS. And I will tell you one thing, CAS don't help. It's really pretty useless. You have to do everything by eye. And, uh, and if you're no good at it, you're just going to get it wrong. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you have to do a lot of adjustments. And basically, it's the same... As when we fix longboard fractures, it doesn't really matter 
what the bone looks like in between. It just you just need to know what the knees needs to do after you replace the, the, the re replace it, and you need to get some kind of mechanical alignment going. If you're any good at that, then you'll be all right. If you're not, it'll fail. Okay, thank so you, Doctor. Totally, totally agree with uh, David Chun. So don't use a technology that you are not proficient in in an extremely difficult case. For surgeons who are not used to navigation, the easiest thing is to do a two-stage procedure. Do the osteotomy, let it heal, and then do a conventional total knee replacement. Okay, thank you. Um, my planning is a double setup. If I can correct with the intraarticular uh, correction, I will go on the surgery. But if I cannot uh, do it with the intraarticular, I will do the uh, osteotomy first and uh, use the navigator for correct the deformity. So uh, we plan to state bilateral navigator axis TKA on the right knee on the uh, August 8th and the next uh, one month do the left knee. Uh, we, I use the mobile bearing uh, from the depute. This is my planning um, preoperatively. I, I think I can uh, preserve the, uh, uh, the lateral collateral ligament from the bone cut. So I'm go on the surgery. Um, I'm do the intraarticular collection from the right knee first, and it is a uh, one one month post operative from the right knee. The patient can walk well, with a, a little bit pain. Okay, so I'm go on to the uh, left knee surgery. Sorry. Okay, this is the left knee. Theme. This is a post-operative um, scanogram. Yes, I do the intraarticular collection and I can preserve the MCL and LCL insertion. Uh, do you have any comments, Dr. David Chun? Um, my comment will be uh, the deformity is in two planes. For example, if we consider the right femur, the distal femur is in varus, and if you see the lateral, it is in extension. Um, so to have a two planar deformity, yes, uh, uh, you see the tibial component uh, aligned, but short term results are good. I'm a bit concerned about the long term survival. That's my query. Um, so, so this is not a simple case. People must understand that this is not a simple case and assess the, def the, the problem. So for young surgeons who have done fellowship, the first thing is to assess the severity of case. Is it a, a simple case? Is it complex or is it challenging? This is a challenging case and should be done by experienced surgeons. Arthroplasty is never an emergency procedure. So if, you, if I cannot do it, I would refer this patient to somebody who has experience of dealing with extra articular deformity. So my comment will be very nicely done, excellent procedure. My concern is long-term uh, survival of this implant. David? Yeah, you know, Ukrit, I'm glad you spent time with us and you learned something. Oh, uh, this is really, really well done. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, David. The, the only thing is that I would say I wouldn't use a rotating platform because I think, you know, just like uh, Sai Shai says, uh, I, I, I'm just worried it, it's going to cause problems uh, because really with these kind of knees, your ligament imbalance is massive. You know, you're making cuts to try and balance the mechanical axis. And as a result of which, your ligaments are all over the place. And again, I would say that you've done the right thing. You use a CR implant, which means that, you know, yeah, you learn the lesson that the CR maintains the, the gap between your distal femur and your tibia. And then your, the balancing of the ligaments is easier. If you cut that thing off, you're in deep shit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David Chun. Um, because of the COVID-19 uh, situation in Thailand, the patient is lost follow up for a month, but um, I am asked her from the phone, uh, she can walk well without getting it and a little bit pain on the, the, the left knee, um, but uh, the, the, everything is good. Thank you very much. Thank you. When we do arthroplasty, obviously uh, experienced arthroplasty surgeons is looking for survival beyond 10 years. And you see preoperative uh, video, there was a lurching gait. 
and my concern and david concern is same yes two three months fine but if it is going to put a, the pcl is gone and the alignment yes restored but my concern would be long-term survival and early revision of this implant and okay. then the question will be that do we correct the extra articular deformity or not so for young surgeon for for the beginners you must understand number one this is a challenging case now if you have to do it the easiest is to deal with deformity and sometimes you can ask your deformity correction colleague for example uh, i have a team and if i get a periprosthetic fracture i ask my top trauma surgeon to work with me for example if mm -hmm. i have a extensive mechanism rupture i chip in my sports injury team to help me in reconstruction of patellar tendon or quadriceps tendon or other things so there is no problem is working in team you don't have to do everything in isolation it works very nicely in my department we work as a team so nicely done best of luck yeah, thank you very much thank you great now i'll request uh, dr nitesh please uh, present your case dr nitesh please Unmute yourself, Dr. Nitesh. Kindly unmute yourself. Okay. Sorry, sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Nitesh Galot, and uh, I'm working in the Department of Orthopedics of All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Jodhpur. So, uh, the patient is 49 year old female, complain of pain and limited mobility since past three years, pain in both the hips. <clears throat> she had a spine surgery 10 months back. She was bedridden since then. <clears throat> And uh, the walking forward with forward bend portion, walking aid, minimal walking distance. <clears throat> and uh, her movements uh, of the left and right hip, there was a flexion deformity of 30 degree on right side and <clears throat> 10 degree on left side. The Harris hip scores were 43 on the right and 35.5 on the left. And she had a VAS score of seven uh, while walking. Uh, we did an X-ray. She had bilateral protrusio S double I and with a lot of destruction of superior part of the head, we could not uh, identify any obvious uh, pathology or precedent for uh, etiology for the protrusio. See, so we went uh, went on with the idiopathic. Uh, Ideosial line was drawn and uh, the CE angle of VBUG was 85 degree on the on the right side and 75 degree on the left side. Uh, according to the grading by Sotelo, uh, Gaze and Chanley et al, it comes into moderate and severe category. Now, this is the lateral view of the patient was uh, standing with forward bending because she had a flexion deformity of both the uh, hips. We did a scanogram of the spine along with the pelvis and uh, this was the picture on the lateral and the AP view. CD scan uh, showed the right side uh, has a protrusion. It had a small uh, deficit in, on the antero superior part. This is the left side. And the axial CT scan showed uh, severe destruction and ballooning of the medial wall inside. So the important issues to be dealt with in this case were uh, she had a superior spine fusion at the lumbar level. So all the movements that of the flexion extension will be happening at the hip after the surgery. She had a bilateral disease, severe great protrusion, and a medial and, a medial and superior shifted center of the head. And greater together was almost touching the estabulum wall laterally. So, anticipated surgical difficulties which we uh, uh, which we had to keep, keep in mind before going for surgery were difficult access to the neck because of the medialization and impossible and if so possible this is a difficult hip dislocation sciatic nerve is usually passing closer to the joint than usual deficient medial wall uh, which we will have to augment <coughs> uh, soft thin walls anterior and posterior of the estabulum and a difficult closure of the posterior capsule due to lateralization after the implantation so uh, I would like to ask the uh, panelists, what should be the way of moving forward in this case? First, you have to have the right religion. And that religion is called cement. 
you don't have a religion, you have a problem. So what's your religion, my friend? What's my, I didn't understand, sir. Uh, do you use cement for your hips or do you use some other crap? Uh, I use uh, both, uh, both the uncemented and the cemented ones. Yeah, in this case, what did you do? In this case, I went for the cemented, actually, uh, with uh, bone, bone wrapping. Like then don't use the metal back, always use a poly cup. And always okay. use a polished tapered stem and get you out of any kind of trouble. Right? And it's okay. also a tough thing there because some of our patients, not Indian patients, personally in Southeast Asia, our patients' femora are very narrow. And you, you sometimes want more stable stem and you can't get some of these bigger uh, ingrowth stems in. Okay. okay. So my comment would be uh, that anticipate the problem you've already anticipated. And that's the message for the young surgeons that not all bad looking hips are total hip replacement. You must categorize them that this is a simple, complex or challenging. I would categorize this for young surgeon as a, a challenging. Anticipate problem, you have highlighted that. And how you are going to deal with this uh, problem of bone loss, there are a variety of ways in which you can deal. And one of a very good way is uh, impaction bone grafting, and you might require cage to pro uh, to protect that. And inside, you can put a cemented polyethylene cup. So, so deal with that. Bringing the hip down and soft tissue release is going to be uh, another surgical, advanced surgical technique. Uh, patient might be osteoporotic. And in your pursuit to bring the femur down and in the process of reduction, and you have a very strong fellow a senior registrar who said, sir, I will help you in reducing. And then there's a big sound and everybody keeps quiet. So, so it is arthroplasty is not brutal force of trauma. It is gentle. It is a plastic surgery. It is biomechanics. Uh, it is understanding the, the basic philosophy. And then finally, your end product should be have good result initially. But then you should be, if you want to pursue your career in arthroplasty, you should always think about 10 years beyond. So your fixation has to be great. Your bone pathology has to be corrected. And you should have a best possible bearing surface. I agree with David on polyethylene. When you are choosing polyethylene, the game changer is cross-link poly. The game changer is cross-link poly. That is going to avoid the polyethylene wear and early aseptic loosening in mid and long term. Uh, you can use on the femoral side. It is not the cemented, uncemented. If you're using cemented implant, do it with perfection. And if you're using uncemented, do it with perfection. So if yes. you're using cemented implant, you have to use third and fourth generation technique and know your implant. If it is a double tapered shiny uh, implant, then you need a centralizer, cement restrictor, wash, cement gun, pressurization, uh, then the results are going to be good. So, so uh, in this case, uh, I we plan for the uncemented hip. Uh, in, uh, the right side had a more flexion deformity. Uh, so we first operated that one. She had more pain on this side. Standard posterior approach because it was not, we were not able to dislocate it. So in situ neck cut was taken. Extensive fibrous tissue in the estabulum that was rejected. And the medial wall was membranous in the anterior superior part here. So uh, auto, auto graft impaction bone grafting was done by the Exeter technique. And uh, this was the result after the uh, impaction bone grafting. You can see the graft inside. And uh, the implant we put a uh, 52 mm estabulum shell with a uh, side line uncemented hip. Can we see the final x ray, Nitesh? We are getting late. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, this was the right side with the autologous impaction bone grafting. And after two weeks, we went for the left surgery, same, but this time we were able to dislocate it. And same bone grafting was done and a bit uh, larger implant. And this was on the opposite side. Now, uh, compared to the uh, pre-operative, we were able to destore the medial, uh, we, uh, do the lateralization of the cup. Uh, we were able to maintain the uh, equalization of the length, leg length. And this was the patient, she was able to stand uh, erect uh, with no pain. This is a recent study we just come out, they have done on four, more than 4,000 patients. 
So uh, protrusion stabilizer is associated with a lot of complications uh, and intraoperative fractures. We have to be careful. Literature guidance is to grade it, uh, check the status of medial wall. Anti-positive walls have to be checked on CT. Options on the table have to be kept, the cemented, the uncemented, the mesh, and the cage. Because if the good bone grafting cannot be done, then there can be middle wall blowout also. Then in that case, you, uh, you will have to use a mesh. Middle rimming not to be done and don't over lateralize the cup. Anything which could have been done differently or which could have been done better in this case. Nitesh, thank you. Thank you. We are getting thank very late. There are, there are many ways of dealing with same problem. David Chun would do it in a cemented and do a perfect result. And you've done it very nicely for this. So the message for the young surgeons are, there are many ways of dealing with problem. You do it as what you are good in and how you have been trained and you can deliver. Don't do it by changing your philosophy by just one workshop or seminar. You have to see it being done perfectly by a surgeon who is experienced in dealing with these complex cases. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can move to the next presenter. So next presenter is uh, Rajat. Please, please present your case. Last case of the session. Rajat, kindly be quick. Actually, we are running too short of time. We are running too late. Okay, sir. Okay. So are you able to see me? Yes. 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 So, uh, first of all, uh, thank you to the organizers of the APO for uh, for asking me to present a case on THR. So, uh, just I'm from Lucknow, and we are presently hosting the ICON in 2023, and we'll be glad to welcome you all. So, my case presentation is uh, is as a 56 year old male with a history of RTA five months ago. He's a laborer by occupation. He complains of inability to bear weight on his right lower limb with the pain, and he's on traction for the last five months. So we get, got an X-ray. Uh, the examination showed there is tenderness at the hip. There's global restriction of the movements. There is shortening about one centimeter. The, all the systems, other systems are within normal limits and there are no other comorbidities. So this is the X-ray we got. So can I ask the panelists like how to proceed? Um, assess the patient more radiologically, get a CT scan to assess the bone loss and the column, you get a UDA view and CT mm. scan before proceeding. Yes, sir. So, so that is what we did. We uh, Unfortunately, I don't have the UDA views, but I have the CT. Uh, so, so things do we need to address is we have to address the pain, we have to address the stability, we have to address the motion and the short take. So we got a CT done. So I have the 3D CT scans, So which is basically showing the both column fractures is there and it is around five months. And there is some bone loss. You can see as there is some aspirate deficiency. So... Can I ask the panelists like what what do they prefer in such a case? Do they like to proceed for an osteosynthesis or do do they wait? Uh, do they straight away go in for a hip replacement in the such cases? As I've said previously, combine the team. I don't do pelvic reconstruction, but I have in my team a consultant who has a vast experience of dealing with pelvic fracture. So combining these two together is not a problem. So you can do a one stage, you can do an osteotomy, you can fix and put a plate on the posterior column and then use the head and do reconstruction and you can use a, a uncemented. So pelvic fracture, sometime if the head is severely damaged, acutely you can do a stabler reconstruction and you can do a total hip replacement. And this same thing can be done here or you can do a two-stage procedure. Uh, uh, so both of them are possible. But if this case comes to me, I would not do it alone. I would have my pelvic reconstruction surgeon available for me. Okay, sir. So well, I mean, the we... thing is you need to see what you want to do, right? So it, you just take a troch osteotomy, take off the trochanter, take off all the muscular, to preserve that. And then you can easily fix them back with all these new devices they have nowadays. That gives you a fantastic view of everything. Then you just put a cage down, use the native femur as a, a infection grafting or allograft and, and Bob's your uncle and you'd, you'll be done in two hours. Okay, sir. So what we did, sir, we did a, we, we templated the hip. We, we went in for a, a hip replacement. So a standard uh, postural approach with a 360 degree aster, asterisk exposure. The defect was addressed by cage and an impaction bone graft and a cemented hip was done. So 
most important thing which i point which i want to point out that you should have a full 360 degree astropro exposure so there is a cage with impacted bone graft now cement is pressurized and the final astropro implantation and don't don't uh, don't hesitate to use a fluoroscopy while uh, putting in the astropro component so this is the post up x ray which we got so this is that i'm glad you got the right religion pardon sir I'm glad you got the right religion. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. So this is at six weeks. So the cage has incorporated and the stem looks good. And at three months, and uh, hopefully the patient is walking well and doing well as is as it turned up till now. Uh, so you use a dual dual mobility stabler cup. what was the bearing surface and what was the head sir material? the head sir the head was a metal on poly only and uh, it was cemented hip sir i understand i am talking about the bearing surface i am mm. talking about the bearing surface it's a acha uh, the bearing surface sir. that was a poly so poly it so, was metal on poly metal on poly so so he is a young person you could have used a cross link poly so so when we talk about arthroplasty think about first year and think about 10 years and think about 15 and 20 years so that's my message so it is not a early result we've seen the case of knee it is not the 6 month follow up one year follow up start thinking about 10 and 15 and 20 years survival as well so initially cemented implant bone grafting would do a good but if you had used a crossling poly then the survival of this beautiful surgery would be even longer and the rate of revision surgery you see all across the globe the rate of revision is on the increase whether it be india or usa or france or pakistan so you don't want your cases as a young surgeon to be failing in 5 and 8 years that's the message thank you sir That's a nice case. I'm a bit worried about your stem. It it is in bit of varus, I think. Yes, sir. The uh, yes, sir. I, I agree, sir. But the patient is patient came to me say like six months ago and he's walking well. So it's uh, hopefully the result stays well. Again, six month follow up is very early. I mean, you cannot publish your arthroplasty uh, article with six months follow up. It is has to be the mid term is five years and long term is beyond ten years. but very nicely done uh, there is always chances of improvement so the arthroplasty surgeon has to have the genes of dna of doing it per to perfection always look at your x ray and patient how could i have done it better what technology could i use to improve the survival in short term and long term that's my little advice thank you sir thank you dr rajat for nice case presentation and with this i think we conclude the arthroplasty session for the day and for this uh, conference and thank you for all the chairperson panelists and all the moderators for these sessions thank you shahid sir thank you dr david thank you dr rajesh i think he is not here thank you everybody thank you bye bye thank you very much thank you sir i think with this uh, for uh, we'll move forward for the next session and that is spine session i think dr tane yeah are you there hello yes i'm there i think you should take over from here yes yes so after uh, uh, excellent arthroplasty session we come to uh, an, another exciting session which is of the spine and uh, they are divided into two sessions the first session and the second so i would directly start with introducing our chairperson who is there professor kenneth chung sir he is an internationally acclaimed spine surgeon he doesn't actually need much introduction he is the head of department of the orthopedics and traumatology in university of hong kong he has been the past president of srs that is scoliosis research society and is currently the editor of the international journal of orthopedics he has a lot of book chapters to his name and publications and he is associated with big bodies like the ao spine and he's been the ao spine chairman of ao research as well as commission 
So I welcome you, sir. It's an honor and privilege that you have joined us for this session at the Young Surgeons and to give your valuable inputs to the young surgeons. I also invite the Dr. Pinto and Dr. Vineet Kumar, who are here, and all the speakers who have joined for the session of the spine. We have six, six, one, two, seven speakers, and I will hand over now to uh, Dr. Vineet Kumar to take over the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tane. So, without wasting time, with the permission of the chair, I would like to invite the first speaker for this spine session, Dr. Dong Jiang. Dr. Dong Jiang, kindly unmute yourself and you can begin with your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. I will start the, the presentation. The first definition of first fracture is, uh, uh, was as follows. Dennis redefined first fracture by three column theory. In AO classification, A3 type is incomplete post fracture and A4 type is, in, uh, is complete post fracture. I'll discuss about A3, A4 type post fracture on throat columnar lesion from T10 to TL2 or L3. General consensus for management of A012 was conservative and BC type was surgery, but A3, A4 still controversial. Even AO spine has been conducting research of clinical trial for TL boss fracture management. In AO spine knowledge from trauma study, experts said, this is a great zone. If I decide a fracture is stable and the patient may be treated conservatively, someone else will suggest surgery based on their experience. Surgery is not as risky as before. There are plenty of reasons for controversy. Spinal cord and cauda echina injury can induce an irreversible neural tissue damage, but consistent conclusion on clinical outcomes are lacking. There are frequent of trauma and combined injury. Both fracture has various criteria and high level of evidence is lacking. These factors include complex decision making. I will discuss about this content, the kingdom, com kingdom of controversy. There are several issues for decision of surgery and or conservative treatment. After post fracture, kyphosis and wide height loss progress. The opinion that post traumatic kyphosis can be the source of back pain is predominant. In this case, a poor post fracture shows further collapse without kyphosis. There was no aggravation of pain. In contrast, this patient showed further collapse with kyphosis and complained persistent severe back pain. Surgery has multiple advantages. So they also show also resulted in better function, higher rate of return to work, and better collection of kyphosis. Severe kyphosis sickle and may, might need major surgery for deformity correction later. Surgery has multiple disadvantages, such as cost effectiveness and surgery-related complications. There are many articles reported no difference between surgery and conservative treatment. There are also several articles with favor on surgery. For the decision making for surgery or instability, evaluation of PRC injury by MRS is essential. Because articles reported that AO type A fracture preoperatively was changed to type B intraoperatively. However, in, even if MRS is used, it is often unclear whether the PRC is damaged. And in this case, both surgical or non surgical treatment can be applied. In the systematic review with meta-analysis, it concluded that we did not reveal any difference. Surgical indication. Neurological deficit is widely accepted indication for surgery in current. There is minimal debate for surgery in neurological deficit, except for isolated partial low of deficit. Some physicians argued, argued that neurological deficit is not an absolute contraindication for conservative treatment. Unstable rust fracture with sagittal index greater than 15 degree, kyphosis greater than 35 degree, and PRC injury were considered as surgical indications in general. There's weak evidence for a correlation between canal compromise and clinical symptoms. This importance in, is decreasing. Timing of surgery. Early surgery usually means surgery within 24 or 72 hours. There is 
controversy whether early surgery is beneficial for neurological recovery and fracture reduction. Early surgery has multiple advantages. This advantage of early surgery uh, second hit for a multiple injury, higher mortality. Therefore, early surgery is not recommended for unstable patient. The scientific evidence for delayed surgery is weak. There is a lack of high quality studies comparing early and delayed surgery. In summary, all the surgery can be recommended for cervical and thoracic spine, but cannot be recommended for unstable patient. Surgical approach and technique. There are several issues. Often conventional approaches has advantages. There are debates for length of fusion and reduction power compared with MIS. MIS technique have advantages for pre preservation of bank muscle and spinal motion, only postoperative recovery. The article focused on A3 fracture reported no significant difference. Finally, there is no definite guidelines for selecting MIS or open conventional. In summary, MIS technique can be tried for young active patient, bony chance fracture, kyphosis with range from 15 to 30 degree, and TLX4. This patient shows A3 bust fracture with TLX4, I4 form, posture reduction, and proctor script fixation. Here, kyphosis was significantly improved. Anterior approach has multiple advantages and disadvantage of relatively higher risk. This patient shows severe canal, canal involvement and kyphosis. I performed anterior carpectomy and mesh cage insertion. Posterior approach has advantages and disadvantages also for instrument failure and recurrence of kyphosis. Combined anterior and posterior approach can be an ideal method theoretically, but because of operative risk, there are no obvious advantages over anterior or posterior alone. This patient sold a four type post fracture. MRI in CT showed significant fat loss and cannot compromise. <clears throat> I performed instrumentation followed by posterior fusion without laminectomy. You can see a result of indirect decompression by ligament taxis. German Association of Trauma Surgery reported prospective multicenter registry. In this paper, there is no difference in re neurological recovery. Combined approach was favorable on correction of deformity, and posterior only approach was favorable on functional result. But there was no limit, but there was limitation due to case matching and different injury severity. Further cannot remodeling, there are a wide variety of conflicting results have been reported. In conclusion, no correlation between the degree of canal compromise and clinical symptoms. In summary, tailored surgical approach and techniques are needed according to the patient condition. Post surgery using indirect compression could be a general option. MS pocket and expectation can be an alternative. Fusion versus non fusion. Instrumentation without fusion shows multiple disadvantages in the past. However, recent research. Researches showed no difference between fusion and non-fusion techniques. The segmental fixation with a fusion showed multiple advantages, then it can be an option. This patient showed A3 fracture. MRI and CT showed body height rolls and corner compromise. I performed proximal screw fixation with a fusion, and you can see a successful restoration of spinal alignment and body height. Non-operative treatment. There are several methods for non-operative treatment. The brace is generally accepted non-operative method for stable A3-4 fracture. A prospective RCT concluded that there are no difference in outcomes and complications between patient with brace and without brace. Necessity and duration of Im immobilization is also controversial. There's no definite recommendation. Monfold recommended bed rest for four weeks and brace for 12 weeks. In the management of circular lumbar bust fracture, A3 or A4 type, there are kingdom of controversy due to limited evidence, complex decision making due to better surgical indication. Surgery should be performed as soon as patient is medically stable. Surgeons must consider tailored approach and technique. MIS shorter, short segment fixation with a fusion and non operative treatment can be an alternative option. Thank you for your uh, listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jang, uh, for your presentation. Uh, may I now uh, invite the next presenter, Dr. Paul, to present his, to deliver his talk on the topic, subaxial spine unilateral facetal dislocation.
Dr. Paul, please. Thank you very much, um, Chairman and moderators. Uh, my name is Paul Kolinen. Um, I'm a spine surgeon working at the Queen Mary Hospital and University of Hong Kong. My topic today is uh, unilateral subaxial cervical facet dislocation. This is an injury which is relatively, relatively uncommon and still has some controversy surrounding it. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you will have more confidence to correctly diagnose it and design an appropriate management plan for your patients. Now, the definition of a unilateral facet dislocation is when the cranial facet is forced anterior. It represents actually a spectrum of injury from subluxation to dislocation to fracture dislocation. The biomechanics of this unique injury has been exhaustively studied and has been attributed to a combined flexion and rotational injury. We now know through cadaveric studies that hyperflexion alone would not lead to rupture of the normal spinal ligaments because the fracture occurs before that happens. But you add on rotation to the injury and the PLC rupture and dislocation occurs easily. Cadaveric studies have also shown us that the sequence of failure when such a force is applied to the spine, whereby the ligamentous complex fails first, followed by the joint capsule, then the PLL, and finally the facet gives way. The classification system for facet dislocation is largely a subset of the classifications for subaxial spine injury. Some purely describe the morphology, such as Allen and Ferguson. Some add on a scoring system to guide treatment, such as the uh, STSG classification, and in the AO spine classification, facet injuries have their own category as type F with modifiers for special conditions such as AS, OPLL, and DISH, so on. So first of all, how do we diagnose them? Well, these patients present to us with neck pain and torticollis. The chin is pointed away from the sublux side and head, head tilted towards the sublux side. And invariably, they will have posterior tenderness and reduced range. In unilateral dissociations, uh, root lesion is more common than cord lesion. In contrast to bilateral dislocations, unilateral cases typically lead to less than 25% of slip. And on this film, you can also notice that the widening of spinous processes. Now the bow tie sign is a feature seen on the lateral X-ray, which represents the non-overlapping of the facets at the dislocated level. But this sign admittedly is not always easy to outline. Another radiological sign on the AP view x-ray is the rotated spinous process. The way I remember it is, if the facet, for example, the right side jumps forward like this, in this picture, the head turns to the left and the comb of the rooster, which represents the spinous process, points to the side of the dislocation. The CT scan, of course, shows the dislocation very clearly and you can also see any fractures. And another use of the CT is to look for associated fractures of the pedicle, of the lamina, and on the axial cut, you can see the inverted hamburger sign, which represents a reverse placement of the facets. MRI is useful to visualize the soft tissue, and invariably in these types of injuries, you will see disrupted ligamentous complex and facet capsules, and you can also see if there's any spinal cord compression or intramedullary signal change. One main purpose of getting an MRI also is to look for ruptured and extruded disc fragments, which can get pushed into the canal during reduction and can lead to devastating iatrogenic injury. So let's look at a typical case. 27-year-old rugby player complains of sudden neck pain in the middle of a match during a scrum, no neurological deficit. So immediately we can see that something is wrong in C3-4, but what exactly is the radiological abnormality here? So you can see not only is there a 25% slip of C3 over C4, but there's also an abnormal non-overlapping configuration of the facets, as well as widening and displacement of the spinous processes. Now, assuming you can spot the diagnosis, the immediate questions arise. You want to ask yourself, is this fracture unstable or not? Do I need an urgent MRI? Am I gonna do close reduction immediately? If I do surgery, is anterior or posterior better? And if the patient is having spinal cord injury, what is the prognosis? So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll know the answers. So let's look at some of these controversies. Now, the condition of a unilateral lock facet has been considered a relatively stable injury. Is this so? Now, cadaveric study like this one shows that in the locked condition without fracture, uh, shown by the white bars, all of the biomechanical parameters representing instability are reduced, even when compared to normal, the black bars. Whereas once you reduce it, represented by the gray bars, it becomes highly unstable once again in all directions. So yes, this is a relatively stable injury. You probably immobilize the patient externally anyway, 
but you don't need to rush to put in a halo. Another major controversy in this condition is the role of MRI before close reduction or even before surgery for that matter. And if you look at the literature, you will find many articles discussing this controversy, of whether it is prudent to do awake close reduction when MRI is not available. The proponents of getting an MRI suggest that the original trauma impact is likely to be the more significant determinant of outcome. And since disc rupture is not uncommon, you should get an MRI in order to prevent hydrogenic neurological injury. And proponents of not getting an MRI suggest that, well, timely reduction is more important. And this applies especially to bilateral dislocations and especially in awake patients. A more general recommendation should take into account the patient's given neurological status at that time. For patients with near, near, near complete neurological injury, immediate reduction probably holds the best possibility for recovery of neurology. And in patients with mild neurology presents the more difficulty in decision making. If the patient is awake and alert, probably getting an MRI allows for better surgical planning, but close monitoring is needed. And those with delayed presentations are probably best managed uh, by obtaining an MRI first. I stress though, this is still a controversial area. A third controversial topic is the approach. Do you go anterior for direct discectomy infusion or do you go posterior, be able to control the facets and reduce them, but with a decompression, which may be indirect. In 2008, the Spine Trauma Study Group surveyed 25 experienced surgeons, spine surgeons on this topic, and they found that there was only slight agreement on this issue. And a few months ago, the AO Spine Latin America group performed a survey of almost 300 respondents. Uh, and even just for unilateral dislocation, there's a wide variety of practices for anterior, for posterior, or even non-operative management was reported in up to 25% of responses. The anterior approach has the benefit of achieving a good decompression before reduction, and the posterior has the benefit of addressing the primary pathology, which is the locked facet. Both methods achieve effective reduction in experienced hands. So how good are the outcomes then? This study uh, published in the Global Spine Journal looked at 34 patients, about half of them unilateral dislocations, all operated anteriorly, and the authors identified that the biomechanical failure rate was about 8% all these patients had end-plate defects preoperatively. This is actually in agreement with other studies published. For example, Johnson showed in 87 cases, all anterior approach, the biomechanical failure rate had a statistically significant correlation with end-plate fracture and facet fracture. And in this series, the fixation failure rate was about 13%. So the conclusion here is that if you have an end-plate fracture, going posterior is probably safer. Okay, how about posterior then? Brian Kwan published his paper, which was a prospective RCT of anterior versus posterior approach just for unilateral dislocation, looking at primary outcomes of discharge rates and secondary outcomes, mainly of complications and quality of life. He found that there was no statistically difference, uh, a significant difference in discharge time. The posterior group had a trend towards more pain and wound problems, while the anterior group had swallowing issues. None of these were statistically significant though. Radiological union was very good in both groups, 100% for anterior, close to 90% for posterior. On the right side shows that the anterior group represented by the gray bars achieved a better restoration of fluoridosis, which is a finding that is intuitive and expected. Of course, a combined approach offers best stability, but this is probably reserved for bilateral dislocations and rarely needed for unilateral. So finally, how are the outcomes? This study looked at the outcome for operative versus non-operative groups, and they found that um, across the board, non-operative groups had lower quality of life and disability pain scores. And these differences are two to three times the clinically meaningful differences, suggesting that non-operative treatment has inferior outcome. If your patient is so unlucky to have sustained a spinal cord injury during an accident, that's bad news. Uh, although unilateral group tend to have less devastating neurology, showing uh, on the table on the left. And coming to the right side, having a facet dislocation compared to not means that your um, outcome at Asian motor score at one year will be definitely poor. And this is a finding with statistical significance. The bottom right shows that the severe group, both uni unilateral and bilateral fare equally bad. So finally, back to our patient. The patient has a pre-reduction MRI done luckily with no disc extrusion. 
goes to go on to having a close reduction. And just a quick note on how I do it. You start with enough weight for the skull, add weight per level of injury, close monitoring, and when reduction is achieved, you extend slightly back and reduce the weight. So the patient went on to having a good radiological outcome and clinical outcome. So this is my last slide, the takeaway messages, and I'll leave this with you. Uh, thank you very much. And if I may, I would also like to invite you all to Hong Kong to join us this November, both in person, hopefully, and online for the 17th uh, International Orthopedic Forum combined with our 60th anniversary scientific meeting. We have an extraordinary faculty with nine visiting professors from around the world. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for your presentation. Uh, so I would like to invite Gun Wu, Dr. Gun Wu Lee for the next presentation. Dr. Wu Lee. Yes. I uh, kindly proceed with your presentation. Yes, thank you. I'm Gun Lee from South Korea. I'm honored to be presented here at a, such a great conference. And today I, I'd like to talk about surgical science intervention in spine. Here is the content of today's presentation. I reviewed the literature about post-operative surgical site infection and focused on risk factor and prevention technique for SSI. And if the SSI is presented, how do we handle the SSI? Recent meta-analysis study reported that pool incidence of SSI was about 3%. In the spine, so right spine had the highest incidence and followed by cerebral spine and lumbar spine. In addition, posterior approach surgery and instrumentation surgery showed a higher incidence. SSI sometimes leads to disastrous consequences, such as a need of many times surgery, deformity, paralysis, <coughs> death, and socioeconomic burden. Thus, prevention of SSI is absolutely better choice than cure. So we have to remember the way to prevent SSI. Before the prevention for SSI, we have to know the risk factors for that. In the literature, several significant risk factors have been reported high BMI score, more than 35, chronic stress use patient, longer surgical time, low hematologic status such as, such as albumin or hematocrit or platelet, higher ASA criteria, poor medical illness history such as diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis and etc. are significant risk factors for SSI. Thus, we should correct these risk factors preoperatively. Now I talk about preventive ways for SSI. First, we focused on considering optimization of preoperative nutritional status, serum blood cell count, and we make much effort to do with less surgical time efficiency as possible. Second, many studies have demonstrated that intra-wound vancomycin application can be a great method for reducing SSI incidence. Next, obese and chronic steroid use patients should be considered on the risk. In addition, previous medical illness influencing postoperative SSI should be checked preoperatively and managed properly. Smoking cessation is also a critical modifiable risk factor and should stop prior to surgery. Finally, in skin preparation, alcohol-based agent is generally superior to other agents. And in surgical exposure, every effort is made to preserve tissue vascularity, minimize tissue trauma, and bleeding. However, though our best efforts for prevention, SSI occasionally can be presented. If then, how can you manage the SSI? The most important thing is an early detection of the SSI and that can lead to lower morbidity and mortality. When is early or late timing of SSI is not defined yet, but in general, the reference time point is post-operative one month. 
In the early SSI, symptoms or signs of SSI include increasing pain, fever, erythema, and wound drainage. Wound drainage is a common sign which may be pre present in up to 90% of SSI patients. Importantly, in anterior surface spine surgery, some SSI had atypical symptoms such as throat discomfort and fever without drainage. The atypical symptoms are often misdiagnosed as other diseases such as bronchitis and pharyngitis that lead to be delayed diagnosis and, and disease progression. In suspected as SSI after anterior, anterior cervical spine surgery, lateral X-ray of the cervical spine has to be checked and we should confirm whether the abnormal findings such as pre-vertebral soft tissue swelling, bone change, and subtle metal migration are presented. At the same time, elevated CRP level was also a sensitive factor for SSI. It was generally picked at post-operative day two or three and returned to baseline within two or three weeks. Abnormal elevation of CRP should raise critical suspicion for post-operative SSI. Currently, the established treatment for deep SSI was surgical debris and prolonged administ administration of proper antibiotics. However, it was controversial on whether or not the implants should be removed in cases without solid fusion. For that, generally the timing of infection was a key factor to determine the choice but there is no standardized about the treatment or timing. Generally, the early infection became evident within post-operative two or three weeks. After infection, certain bacteria formed biofilm on the implant surface that can interfere antibiotic therapy. Thus, for early SSI, surgical debris was theoretically effective to disrupt biofilm formation and facilitate systemic antibiotic therapy. As to delay the SSI, removal of the implants might be a better choice. However, about 30% of early deep SSI cases needs multiple debris surgery. In some studies, on average, four procedures were needed for being completed, complete healed. Multiple debris would increase the morbidity of complications and Especially in anterior cervical surgery, the possibility of esophageal injury could be a great concern. Therefore, some experts uh, demonstrated that anterior debris with prophylactic metal removal might be a better idea option. SSI after spine surgery is not common, but sometimes life-threatening. Thus, before the presentation, Prevention for SSI is more important than cure. Hence, we have to be aware of its risk factors and preventive methods. Thus, we have to remember always the preventive methods for SSI. Here, I summarize the methods such as your correction of modifiable risk factors, including hematologic factors, intraround vancomycin application, smoking cessation before the surgery, the correction of the medical illness, and better surgical efficient procedure. However, after the presentation of SSI, the early detection is the most important. For that, we should remember the reliable clinical symptoms such as increasing pain, fever, wound problems, and some atypical symptoms. Especially in anterior, anterior cervical spine surgery, we focused on atypical symptoms like throat pain and pharyngitis. And the other important thing is that we decide how to handle the metal implants, removal intention in cases when the fusion is not achieved. There has not yet been determined how to do it, but the timing of infection, such as acute, subacute, and chronic, is a key factor for decision. To better determine the decision, where further, uh, where further studies are necessary. Thanks for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. So, may I now invite Dr. Yudha Mathan, our next speaker, to kindly deliver his presentation. Dr. Yudha, please. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. 
allow me to share screen, sir. Good afternoon. Okay, uh, and sorry, uh, uh, is my screen available? Yes, you're visible. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the moderator and all of the committee for the uh, precious opportunity. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Yuda from Indonesia. And this opportunity, I'd like to share our experience in diagnosing and management of pyogenic infection in spine. Uh, we are from Yogyakarta, Indonesia. So as an introduction, uh, pyogenic infection is a uh, really low actually in compare of uh, in general of osteomyelitis but uh, the the incidence create severe mor morbidity for the patient that's why uh, it's necessary for us as a spine surgeon to understand how to manage and how to diagnose this condition as a risk factors all of the literature said that increasing life expectancy immunocompromised condition and this uh, following condition increased the possibility and susceptibility of the spine infection. Overall now, the improvement of spine care and spine intervention management also bring us to more uh, favorable condition to create uh, spyogenic or non-specific infection in spine. As introduction, uh, basically, Every infection is infecting pathogen that multiply that creates host reaction and give us signs and symptoms. So knowing who or the pathogens who did it and what that has been damaged will be the basic uh, knowledge to how to manage this condition. So the objective of my presentation will be the objective of recalling this mechanism and how we diagnose and manage this condition. As a case, uh, I brought you the female 49 years old with pain on the back, unrelentless for more than one year, going back and forth to, uh, uh, to previous and other department without any neurological deficit. And then we have a destruction in L4, L5 with pus formation here. And then the second case, also with unrelentless back pain, but with previous injection from other department coming with a non-neurological deficit as well. Uh, this condition will be discussed later on after the presentation. So basically based on the inoculation road, uh, road, as we know, the pathogen can come as a hematogenous condition or direct inoculation or in contagious. However, the condition is most likely happen, happen in the lumbar spine. And then following spinal surgery, spine intervention actually very rare. However, it is creating or increasing the susceptibility, as I said before. How about the contagious is really uh, more rare than the, uh, the other two inoculation road. As the pathophysiology, I think it's already previously uh, described whether it will be coming from the vein or it will be coming from the artery, uh, which uh, ever the root is, when, whenever the host is not able to contain this infection, the infection will, will multiply and create destruction. And in this case, destruction will create structural uh, problem that will relate to patient's spine problem. So we see here in the pulseless vein or whether going to be uh, arterial root. The problem will be pain, instability, deformity, or neurological disturbances if it creates a canal compromise and disruption or uh, compression on the spinal canal and spinal root. Uh, and one of the problem related with the infection is also the abscess formation uh, regarding the infection process. And what or how we manage this will be depends on the uh, problem or the consequences created by this mechanism as seen this in the yellow boxes, whether the root can be uh, direct inoculation, hematologic condition. However, if it goes to the spine and create problems here, the management will be based on the um, destruction or the consequences mm -hmm. created by the infection. Regarding the clinical features after it creates infection, the symptoms will be, uh, unfortunately, will be vaguely complained by the patient. It's about 90% is all, uh, more than 90% of the patient will create big pain. But 
generally it only give about 14 to 50 percent of general uh, infected uh, condition so whenever the patient have back pain that is progressively worsened with spinal tenderness we should suspect that there there is possibly we need to go with further investigation to rule out this infection how about neurological deficit it only happens less than 30 percent of condition Infection in spine, as we know, can go with the vertebral osteomyelitis, discitis, or abscess formation, in which uh, the general condition or general uh, complaint of the patient will be about the pain on, on the back with uh, low uh, systemic condition is likely to be shown in the patient. The supporting examination, as we know it, we have two main investigation, laboratory and supporting radiologic examination. The pain radio radiography only uh, only changes appears after two to eight weeks after onset of symptoms. So usually it is not sensitive enough to know the problem. The main uh, the main uh, diagnostic tools that we can have is MRI because in MRI we have uh, higher sensitivity, higher specificity, and the modality of choice. However. Sometimes the patient cannot uh, underwent an MRI, we might need to go with other examination. And the importance of MRI, what we usually miss is we have to know the ideal location or the focus of infection in all of the cut, the sagittal, axial, and, uh, and coronal plane, in which unnecessary surgery may be, uh, may be withhold and uh, choose other treatments. As for the MRI, to increase the sensitivity, we can uh, go with fat saturated and STIR image in here shown higher intensity in STIR and fat saturated to, to get more sensitivity of the MRI. How about CT scan? CT scan is very good uh, for bone delineation of the destruction and maybe in cases when, when MRI is not possible, we can choose other modalities if we have this kind like uh, bone scan or FDG pad uh, to evaluate whether there's hotspot in the infection process. This uh, also should be supported with the laboratory examination, uh, seeing whether the ESR increase, CRP increase, leukocyte count increase, and procalcitonin uh, to suggest that uh, there are infection. However, the sensitivity is still higher in the ESR. And then all of this uh, evaluation only knowing that there is an infection. But what we have to get is the cultures so that we know what caused it and guide the treatment in which uh, all blood culture must be taken and will be positive for 30 under 78% of the cases. However, it will need supporting of the guided biopsy or surgical biopsy if it is not supporting. For uh, the treatment, the treatment can be non-operative and operative as previously mentioned, the goal is eradication of the pathogen. And this is, can only be done if we know the pathogen and give the correct antibiotics. And that recommendation, it sets two weeks to four weeks of uh, IV for oral antibiotics. However, the challenges is how to get the, uh, the bacteria. So uh, after we get the bacteria, bacterial susceptibility here, uh, we have to give the agents mm -hmm. according, accordingly with the etiology of the infection. How, how to manage this mainstay of the treatment still, if it is possible, we create or we give antibiotic treatment. However, the structural problems should be addressed also, whether it will be an external brace or put it in an internal uh, stability or instrumentation as a fixation. This condition bounds to surgical uh, treatment as an option. So, we will see a lot of algorithm, but the basic thing is get the microbe and then evaluate whether it's stable or not, and then we can continue with uh, instrumentation. About uh, the discussion on instrumentation, the need of stabilization will depend on the tissue destruction, whether, whether it creates deformity, instability, and as we know, the stabilization will help to heal better early mobilization, decrease inflammation, and create better fusion. However, there are controversies in, in giving instrumentation in active infection of pyogenic or non-specific condition, in which the uh, hallmark is the uh, race for the surface in which we need to 
uh, to think about this condition, whether we will create things more susceptible condition by putting implants. However, papers shown that if there is indication, uh, we can do instrumentation, although less than 10% of the, paper, uh, the, the subjects will get, uh, get possibility of recurrent infection. So this is our cases uh, for the infection. If it creates uh, sagittal uh, compromise and coronal involvement, we do instrumentation. However, the anterior reconstruction, we usually perform it posteriorly, as in the paper said, it's uh, already enough. Also in this case, if it is created with spondylodisc uh, in this case in the de novo scoliosis, we correct and we stabilize and do we, we perform instrumentation with only posterior decompression. However, improvement have, have, have shown that if we do not need any, uh, any instrumentation, it might be necessary to consider these options and which percutaneous endoscopic disectomy and drainage can be a uh, chosen modality that combine diagnostic and management in which brought us to our first case, the female 49 years old, leukocyte count higher, CRP high, ASR high, and showing the, uh, the, the pus here and left side, and but without any uh, discerning uh, 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 instability. So what we did in this case, so we perform uh, two, two insertion of the bridement. First we debride the abscess, and then because the primary infection as in the pathophysiology you said in the L4, so the bone we debride it with the, with the uh, second needle from pedicle, until the fluid is clear. So it's a good modality uh, to, to be taken. This is the patient we see after five days of treatment already resil uh, relieving in good pain and we get a positive culture after that. The case two is a little bit different showing the versatility of the, 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 the bridement in which in this case we see in the posterior part there are also um, a sequester. So in this case, we perform sequestrectomy and in which this also can be considered in cases in which the uh, infection or spondylodiscitis comes to you without any uh, possibility or there's no any structural uh, instability in the patient. So as a summary, a compressive, comprehensive diagnostic modality is needed and identification of positive microorganism is essential and this can be uh, combined by doing also uh, management and diagnostic treatment. However, it should be tailored to patients' uh, distinctive pathology based on comprehensive evaluation. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much for the, present, uh, for the time. Uh, thank you from Yogyakarta. Thank you, Dr. Mathan. Uh, now I'd like to invite Dr. Chu to deliver his presentation. Thank you. So I'll be presenting on management of spine metastasis. So the principle of management, the main aim is to reduce pain, maintain and improve function and prolong life. And it's a multidisciplinary management. Tomita has uh, classified the surgical strategy based on wide marginal excision, marginal intralesional excision, palliative surgery or supportive care based on a scoring system. Recent advances in local tumor control with radiotherapy, uh, wide and, and block excision are less indicated now because it carries higher mortality and morbidity. And with the recent advances in minimal invasive surgery, surgery can be done in patients with poorer prognosis or poorer score to improve their quality of life. Management generally is divided into radiotherapy and surgery. Radiotherapy can be conventional or stereotactic uh, radiotherapy. So stereotactic radiotherapy can deliver high dose of radiation to tumor with safe limits to surrounding tissue. For example, in this patient with renal cell carcinoma, stereotactic radiotherapy can be effective. Surgery can be divided into decompression and stabilization. For decompression, we usually do circumferential decompression or separation surgery. For example, in this case, 
where tumor invade the cause neurology. We perform a laminectomy and we remove a zone of a tumor cell around the cord to, pre, uh, to, to get a zone free of tumor around the spinal cord to allow uh, effective radiotherapy. Stabilization can be uh, performed by doing percutaneous semen augmentation, open instrumentation, or with the, the later, uh, the newer technique of percutaneous pedicle screw instrumentation or minimal invasive stabilization. So how is percutaneous screw inserted? First, we do stab wounds and we dissect the tissue, the fascia and the muscle up to the bone to create a track. With image intensifier, we insert trocars and subsequently wires. And through this wire screw can be inserted safely into the pedicles. And this is the lateral and the AP uh, view of the screw inserted. So is it safe compared to conventional screw? We have done comparison in human cadavers and they have, they show no difference in perforation rate. We have compared uh, percutaneous screws between the European and the Asians and we found that the accuracy is comparable to open. We have also analyzed the thoracic region, the lumbosacral lumbar spine region, and also the upper thoracic region and found that the accuracy is comparable with open method. So therefore, uh, similar safety with conventional screw. When compared to open surgery, is minimal invasive surgery any advantage? We have studied between European and Asians and we found that uh, compared to open surgery, minimal invasive surgery has less blood loss, less need of blood transfusion and shorter hospital stay. So we think it, had, it has, it has uh, advantages very operatively. So the question, another question is how do we decide whether to use open or uh, minimal invasive stabilization? So if stabilization only needed, then MIS is preferred. Fusion needed, we need open. If there is previous radiotherapy at the area, we prefer MIS as we can put screws further away from the radiotherapy site. And we consider wound length of stabilization or versus discompression. For example, if there's a spinal cord compression, we need the compression. This is the wound length. And if you can stabilize with similar wound length, then open method is preferred. If you need longer, we still can consider open method, but however, due to tumors in certain areas where, whereby we need to use very uh, uh, stabilization much longer than the decompression wound, then minimal invasive is preferred. Another, another situation is we have an adjacent fracture whereby we need to extend the stabilization, then minimal invasive may be preferred. Or another situation, if you have a tandem compression of a, a spinal cord uh, and we need decompression in both sides, the wound length difference between decompression and stabilization is not much difference, then open method is preferred. Another condition, con, con, another situation whereby we need to consider open is when there is poor image intensifier view. Just note that certain malignancy are very effective uh, with chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, or targeted therapy. So for example, these uh, hematological malignancies, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and lymphoma. So this uh, tumor may not need radiotherapy or surgery. So therefore, not all spine metastasis patients require surgery. Clinic assessment is vital with the assistance of radiological assessment. Because surgical complication from surgery involves uh, many, many different uh, problems, which includes infection, paralysis, bleeding, and others. And it has been reported can be up to 70% and reoperation rate of 10% with high mortality. So therefore, oncological treatment cannot be given if this occur, which leads to further cancer spread and painful death. What are our strategies? We generally use Mayo clinic algorithm and norms framework and additional 
uh, assessments using the SIN score and epidural spinal cord compression grading scale. Mayo Clinic algorithm generally assess neurological deficit stability and radiation responsiveness. Norms framework assess neurologic, oncologic, mechanical, systemic factors. Well, SIN score is a score to assess the stability of the spine by these six factors to, stay, to classify them into stable, indeterminate, or unstable uh, vertebral metastasis. Epidural spinal cord compression uh, scale is uh, used when SBRT is needed, generally classified into high-grade compression and low-grade compression. In high-grade compression, surgery is needed. So let's look at some case examples. So this is a 53 years old man with renal cell carcinoma with severe instability, back pain, but no neurological deficit. So based on SIN score is unstable. Based on Mayo algorithm, there's no neurology, but there's spinal instability. So uh, stabilization is needed. And based on norms framework, it's a low grade, uh, no, uh, no myelopathy, no uh, nerve compression, radio resistant tumor, as renal cell as, uh, as noted here is radio resistant with unstable mechanically and patient is able to tolerate surgery. So therefore stabilization with SPRT is the upper form. So no decompression needed. Another patient, breast cancer, paraplegia, instability back pain, previously radiotherapy to T12. So based on the algorithm, there is instability and there is neurological deficit. L3, there is impending instability. And based on norms, there is a high grade uh, compression. There is a radio pre or previously irradiated tumor and separation surgery is needed. There is unstable, uh, the stabilization is needed. And this is followed by SPRT two to four weeks later. So we perform a minimal invasive stabilization with circumferential decompression and subsequently radiotherapy. Another patient, 25 years old with lymphoma, back pain, and uh, low-grade paraplegia, Frankel D. This patient has a tumor that is very responsive to radiation, as seen here, lymphoma. So uh, external beam radiotherapy can be given and the inst mild instability can be treated by brace. So post-radiotherapy, the tumor is uh, well treated. So another consideration we need to uh, look into is a systemic uh, uh, factor. If patient has medical comorbidity, poor life expectancy, and cannot tolerate surgery, then surgery may not be an option. Then terminal care would be the, the right treatment. We also need to consider preoperative embolization in tumor that is uh, highly vascular. So in summary, the principle of management mainly main aims is to reduce pain, maintain function, and prolong life, and it's a multidisciplinary management. The management includes radiotherapy and surgery. The management algorithm that can be used is Mayo Clinic Algorithm, Norms Framework, SIN Score, and ESCC Scale. In conclusion, management of spine metastasis should be tailored individually to each patient. Close collaboration with every discipline involved will ensure total patient care. Surgery should be done only if you can provide pain relief, maintenance of, and maintenance of an improvement in function without causing more morbidity to patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chi, for your talk. Uh, may I now invite our next speaker, Dr. Aditya. Dr. Aditya, you may kindly unmute yourself and begin your presentation. Yes, sir. Is it visible? Yes, you are visible. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, this kind of MRI picture in uh, countries like India, we come across quite regularly with upper dorsal uh, vertebral collapse with abscess. And here, uh, the subcutaneous level uh, first collection, which is 
draining from the uh, spine side. So this is the very common scenario we come across. And uh, to discuss this more in detail, today I am going to discuss uh, about the diagnosis and medical management of spinal tuberculosis. I am Aditya Kashigar. I am from Mumbai, India. So my uh, talk will be mainly divided into diagnosis and medical management. So investigation wise, uh, bloods are important like CBC, ESR. Uh, so the serial CBC, ESR values one can uh, have. Also, there is questionable uh, role of Mantus test these days now, which is not uh, followed these days. And the radiological X-rays and MRI CTs are very much important. The role of uh, molecular investigations are very much important because they have great sensitivity. The turnaround time is very less and mainly they detect the resistance in quick time. So the main thing is gene expert in this. I would like to highlight it's nothing but CBNET cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test. It detects uh, MTB DNA in smear negative samples as well. The turnaround time is very rapid. It detects resistance to rifampicin and uh, it helps in uh, MDR treatment early initiation. In smear negative cases also, the sensitivity is almost up to 47.7%. So sensitivity by gene expert is 95.6% and specificity is 96.2%. Uh, the result is available in 48 hours and as compared to the 35 to 45 uh, days in usual cultures. And mainly, the if at all, uh, the bug is MDR1, then we come to know that early. So uh, the role of gene expert is basically if negative test comes in this, that doesn't rule out the disease. So uh, empirical treatment still can be started in high clinical suspicion of TB. And obviously, the conventional drug sensitivity, uh, sensitivity test is must. The next one in this is line probe essay, which is a PCR based test for detecting drugs resistance. Uh, the first kit, uh, kit helps in uh, finding out resistance against rifampicin and INH. And second kit helps in resistance against ethambutol, aminoglycosides, and quinolone. Uh, it is it is useful for smear positive cases, but the advanced second version also detects a uh, bug in negative samples as well. And WHO actually approves this for respiratory samples only. The turnaround, uh, turnaround time is around 48 hours. It detects uh, drug resistance associated mutation. It works well with high TB burden and detects resistance as earlier uh, said in INH, rifampicin, fluoroconolones, aminoglycosides, and ethambutol. The sensitivity and specificity is also almost 80, 90% plus. So these tests are highly sensitive because of their short turnaround time and ability to diagnose early resistance. These are quite useful. The next one in this is Bactec midget test, which is micro, uh, mycobacteria growth indicator tube. This is a non-invasive, non-radiometric system. It basically detects the oxygen reduction in the uh, culture media. It's more sensitivity. Uh, it, it is more sensitive and efficient and rapid than the usual LZ medium and provides rapid differentiation of uh, mycobacterium TB from mycobacterium non-TB uh, other than TB mycobacterial uh, types. Tests which you should not be doing are Mantus test, the gold uh, contiferon test, and P serology because they don't uh, uh, help in detection of uh, TB at all. X-rays are vital uh, in radio when it comes to radiological diagnosis. The X-rays are the first line of uh, 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 investigation. It shows osteopenia, end plate erosion, vertebral collapse, and even the soft tissue shadows can be seen with uh, X-rays. Like we can see here, physiform uh, bilateral paraspinal soft tissue lesion in the dorsal spine. X-rays have some fallacies like 40% decalcification is necessary to see any X-ray changes. 
lytic lesions which are less than 1.5 cm can be missed it takes at least 3 to 4 months uh, for actual detection of any uh, anything related with tb on x ray so the main radiological investigation of choice is mri because it causes early recognition or uh, skip lesions can be seen in whole spine screening sequences it delineates well a good extent of the lesion we can prognosticate by doing serial every 3 or 4 monthly mri and these days it's considered as a gold standard so one can see marrow edema on uh, bones end plate breaks para vertebral or costo vertebral soft tissues frank destruction collapse abscess can be seen and obviously the cord compression uh, and interesting changes in cord also can be appreciated so sensitivity and specificity of these multiple parameters are well uh, evident on mri role of ct scan is mainly because of the uh, bony destruction what uh, one can see and if at all we are going ahead with any surgical intervention then the the uh, configuration of the collapse can be studied this is very important slide because uh, the mainstay of diagnosis is tissue diagnosis. So whether you are doing this by CT guided or USG guided or fluoroscopy guided, one should always insist on doing diagnosis by attempting a biopsy for that lesion. Because obviously with that biopsy, you will be doing the uh, histopathological study and cultural studies and that will lead to eventually the drug sensitivity pattern. And obviously, the documentation and medical as medical legal aspect is also important uh, important associated with it so uh, so the biopsy sample has to be divided into two sample a uh, in 10% formalin which has to be sent for uh, histopathology and sample b which has to be collected in normal saline and these are the eight tests what usually uh, we advise uh, when we send our sample to microbiology and pathology department so let's say if a patient is having spinal TB along with the pulmonary TB, then one may not do spinal lesion biopsy because it has been proven that the pulmonary tuberculosis treatment itself will take care of the spinal tuberculosis. So now we'll come to the treatment principles. So mainstay of treatment is obviously anti-tubercular drugs. Uh, and in conservative treatment, obviously the rest, braces and follow-ups I'll be highlighting on. So we'll come to anti-tubercular drugs. So usually it's of uh, initiation, initiation phase of four drugs in which isoniazide, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, ethomethyl to be given for first two months and continuation phase varies from four to ten months uh, consisting of uh, isoniazide, rifampicin and ethambutol. Second line drugs are various with these kind of various drug regimes, drug dosage regimes. So uh, these are the index TB guidelines published in 2016, mentioning same uh, two months of HRZE plus uh, four to 10 months of HRE. All patients required close monitoring uh, of, for development of neurology and uh, serial MRIs to be done every third month. Now we'll come to the drug resistant part, which is very important. So the M MDR TB is nothing but multi-drug resistant TB in which the bug is resistant to rifampicin and INH. The XDR1 is, uh, to addition to this, uh, they are resistant to quinolones and second line injectables. And total drug resistance is, they are resistant to all sorts of uh, TB anti-TB medications. So who are at risk at developing MDR TB? So people who don't take their TB medications regularly, uh, who develop TB disease again after having TB medication taken earlier in past, who come from areas of a world where drug resistant TB is very prevalent and person who has come in contact with drug resistant TB person already and obviously immunocompromised status like HIV. So the primary drug resistance, uh, the drug resistance in a patient who has never received anti-TB drug before, so caused by infection with primary drug resistant organisms or infection from a person with acquired resistance. 
the secondary type is organism all initially sensitive but got resistant to one or more anti tb drugs later on during the course of treatment and this is may be due to non adherence to the uh, recommended regime or fa faulty uh, prescription by the treating doctor so so the it can be a, a multi drug resistant tb or resistance to only one single drug or it can be poly drug resistance tb so the principles uh, are never add single drug to the fa uh, failing regime add three to four new drugs which are known or expected expected to be effective four or five drugs with proven efficacy in intensive phase with one injectable agent at least six months of injectable therapy and total duration of total 20 to 24 months and duration guided by clinical improvement so usually to start with patients are put on six weeks of rest with a restricted ambulation braces are helpful especially in kids and where there is growth anterior destruction medications obviously will be giving as per the drug sensitivity pattern along with calcium and vitamins and uh, pain medications role of steroid usually uh, the steroids acts as uh, uh, neuroprotective and, and anti inflammatory in these conditions so usually methylprednisolone 1 g intravascular for 3 days is uh, advisable there are newer drugs available but their role in management for extra pulmonary tb is still questionable so at 3 months follow up usually uh, one should do repeat imaging and that has to be compared with the uh, the first mri obviously the blood investigations also will come in picture so these are a few examples uh, at at initial stage later on at 3 months and later at later on at 1 year there is quite significant reduction in the lesion so at the end of your completion of treatment uh, lab obviously every third month we have to do lab studies and radiological imaging and uh, uh, one should decide on completion of treatment depending on the clinical and radiological improvement of lesion you can come across sterile residual abscesses at the end of your treatment at one year uh, but nothing needs to be done for these lesions so there are certain deviations from the routine like clinical deterioration on anti tb treatment at 6 weeks if neurology is intact then uh, one should consider repeat biopsy if neurological deterioration is happening so obviously we have to subject patient to the surgical decompression the deviation to from routine is at 3 months if clinical and radiological deterioration happens then diagnosis and if diagnosis is certain then consider second line akt and if diagnosis is uncertain then repeat biopsy or empirical second line akt If Doctor clinic, Aditya, can you just summarize? We have one minute more. Yeah. So, uh, if clinical improvement of radiological unchanged borderline worsening, then continue same treatment at twelve months. Residual releases on MRI. Continue AKT for a uh, longer three to six months. So, these are the few examples which have shown very good results on conservative treatment with func good functional outcome. So, facts like sterile pus need not be drained. neurological deficit are not absolute indication for surgery good healing is possible with non surgical treatment and functional outcome can be very well, very well preserved with conservative treatment so this is the first case where there is complete resolution of uh, tb on conservative treatment thank you thank you dr aditya now we'd like to invite our last speaker dr bosco dr bosco to please begin yeah. your presentation am i audible yeah you are please yeah so i am dr aju bosco and uh, i am an assistant professor of spine surgery in madras medical college i am also the vice chair of the young surgeons committee of sicot and i will be presenting on the surgical management of spinal tuberculosis so tuberculosis is one of the oldest diseases known to mankind and in the past few decades significant advances have been made in the diagnostics And management. Okay, we are not able to see your screen. Can you yeah. share? Yeah. Yeah. One second. Is this screen visible? Yeah. No. Yeah. Now we yeah. are able to. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. 
I'm Dr. Aju Bosco, and uh, I will be presenting on the surgical management of spinal tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is one of the oldest diseases known to mankind, and in the past few decades, significant advancements have been made in the diagnostics and management of this disease. Yet, sometimes the disease behaves in a bizarre fashion, and the course of the disease is unpredictable, and it is a well-known yet unknown disease, and the resurgence of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and the increase in the population of immunocompromised persons has made this disease a global health burden. So uncomplicated spinal TB is a medical disease. Professor Tully proposed the middle path regime in which chemotherapy is fundamental for the treatment of disease and surgery is advocated for the management of complications and consequences of treatment. The indications of surgery are non-responsiveness to chemotherapy, clinical radiological evidence of instability, patients presenting with neurological deficit or at risk of an impending neurological deficit or worsening of neurological deficit or a new onset neurological deficit during chemotherapy and the presence of deformity. Oga et al. has shown that tuberculous bacillus does not adhere to metal or a biofilm or form a biofilm and surgical instrumentation is safe and indicated even in active disease. The principles of surgical management are to achieve an adequate neural decompression, to debride and drain the disease focus, to maintain and reinforce, reinforce the stability of the spine and to correct the deformity or halt the progression of deformity. The goals of surgery being abscess drainage, disease focused debridement and debridement and achieving a fusion with or without stabilization. Tuberculous spondylitis with cold abscess is a common entity. The hallmark is that tuberculous abscesses evolve very slowly over time, causing gradual and chronic compression. They lack inflammatory response typical of pyogenic abscesses. Even large, canal, large abscesses causing canal encroachment in a stable spine are well accommodated in spinal TB. And emergency decompression is not needed if the stability of the spine is preserved. In these two pictures, even large extraspinal abscesses like a gluteal abscess or a posterior abscess in the lumbar region can be cured with chemotherapy. The primary management of a tuberculous cold abscess is medical management. And isolated cold abscesses without pressure symptoms or neurological deficit, coexistent instability or deformity can be managed medically. Multidrug chemotherapy in adequate dose and duration forms the mainstay of treatment. And complete resolution of abscess following chemotherapy is the usual outcome. This is uh, an Atlanta axial tuberculosis who presented with a prevertebral abscess. After nine months of standard anti-tubercular chemotherapy, the MRI shows a complete resolution of the abscess. What is the role of surgery in a cold abscess? Abscesses which are non-responsive to chemotherapy, abscesses in a drug-resistant tuberculosis, abscess causing pressure symptoms, neurological deficit, and associated with deformity or instability are treated with surgery. These are three scenarios, a retropharyngeal abscess from a cervical spinal TB causing dyspnea, strider, and dysphagia, a psoas abscess causing pseudoflexion deformity of the hip, and a thoracic spinal tuberculosis with mediastinal abscess causing bronchial compression. This retropharyngeal abscess is managed surgically by draining it through a transoral or an anterolateral approach. And the, bronch the mediastinal abscess can be drained, the thoracic spinal abscess can be drained through a costal transvasectomy, a lateral extracavitary approach, or a transthoracic approach. Lumbar abscesses and psoas abscesses causing pressure on the skin are usually drained using ultrasound guidance or CT guidance. But in abscesses which are loculated or multiseptic, an open surgical drainage of the abscess through a non dependent incision is beneficial. Insulation of streptomycin with or without isony acid in the abscess cavity has been advocated by some authors. An epidural abscess causing cord compression and neurodeficit is treated with debridement, abscess drainage, and decompression with stabilization and reconstruction. This is one such case which was managed, and it shows that at nine months after surgery, there is complete resolution of the abscess. Presence of spine at risk signs along with the cold abscess is a relative contraindication for conservative therapy. This is one case which we treated with stabilization and reconstruction. Patient at three years follow-up showed excellent functional outcomes. Spinal TB mainly affects the anterior column. It is predominantly an anterior disease. Anterior approaches enable adequate exposure, debridement, and reconstruction of the spine. Hogson revolutionized the Hong Kong procedure. It was the gold standard 
and it is radical debridement along with arthrodesis without instrumentation, but it was associated with higher morbidity and there was a risk of graft slippage, fracture, resorption and subsidence in more than 50% of the cases as shown by in a study by Professor Raj Shikran et al. And this was modified. The modified Hong Kong procedure added anti additional anterior instrumentation and stabilization. Some studies showed that there was less incidence of graft resorption and graft related complication and less incidence of deformity. Anterior approaches have a greater learning curve. They may need the help of an access surgeon. Anterior procedure is recommended when posterior structures are intact and are best avoided in pan vertebral disease. Anterior approaches are the gold standard in cervical spinal tuberculosis. In other regions, however, it has largely been replaced by the posterior approach. A posterior approach is versatile, more commonly performed due to the ease, familiarity of the approach and a lesser learning curve. It can achieve adequate exposure for circumferential neural decompression. We can achieve a biomechanically stable fixation with pedicle screws, and there is a better ability to achieve deformity correction with pedicle screws. There is a possibility to easily extend the instrumentation without extending the approach, which is difficult in an anterior approach. Avoidance of thoracotomy related complications is one important advantage of the posterior approach. Transpedicular decompression and posterior instrumentation facilitates faster recovery prevents deformity progression, and prevents neurological sequelae in early TB. This is a patient with L4, L5 tubercular spondylodiscitis who presented with back pain, radiculopathy, and neurological deficit, who was managed with posterior stabilization. And at six years follow-up, the patient had a good lordosis and a well-healed spine. Through various posterior and posterolateral approaches, the anterior and lateral column of the thoracic and lumbar spine can be accessed safely. And these are the transpedicular approach, costal transversectomy approach, and lateral extracavitary approach. In the lumbar spine, we can access the anterior column through a transfacetal or a transpedicular approach, and we can decompress. But in a thoracic spine, a costal transversectomy enables a better access to the anterior column. The cord can be decompressed under direct vision. It allows the placement of a strut graft and avoids morbidities and complications associated with an anterior approach. This is a case of a lumbar spinal tuberculosis, which was managed with posterior spinopelvic stabilization and anterior reconstruction through an all posterior approach. When is a combined approach advocated? A combined approach is advocated in scenarios where there is severe osteoporosis, multiple vertebral body involvement, severe kyphotic deformities, and especially in inherently unstable junctional pathologies. They can be performed as a single stage or a two stage approach. The anterior approach removes the infected foci and allows direct neural decompression and rigid anterior column reconstruction. The post, through the posterior approach, posterior instrumentation enables better deformity correction and reduces the stress on the grafts placed anteriorly, thus helping in maintaining the sagittal alignment. This is one of our cases with a lumbosacral spinal tuberculosis with severe destruction at the lumbosacral junction. In the first stage, a posterior stabilization was done through spinal pelvic fixation. After stabilization, there was a large anterior void, and this was addressed in the second stage through a retroperitoneal approach and anterior column reconstruction with a mesh cage, mesh cage packed with autograft. Patient at two years follow-up showed excellent functional outcomes and a stable well-aligned spine. This is a case of a cervical thoracic junctional tuberculosis, which was managed with anterior debridement and reconstruction with a mesh cage through a medial clavicle resecting approach. The clavicle was used as a graft inside the cage. And in the second stage, a posterior stabilization was done. The CT scan taken at follow-up shows good consolidation of bone within the cage. The patient had excellent functional outcomes. These are to show that a combined approach is useful in junctional tubercular pathologies. This paper shows a, describes a strategy to for the choice of approach in cervical thoracic junctional spinal tuberculosis. The cervical thoracic angle is measured on the MRI and based on whether the lesion comes within the triangle or it is above or below the cervical thoracic angle, we can choose an anterior low suprasternal approach or a clavicle resection, medial clavicle resecting approach, a manubrectomy or a median sternotomy approach. An anterior only approach is limited for purely cervical thoracic junctional tuberculosis. A combined anterior and posterior approach is reserved for extensive tubercular lesions of the cervical thoracic junction involving more thoracic segments, whereas a predominantly posterior approach is, is reserved for scenarios in which 
more involvement of the upper thoracic segments is seen than the cervical spine. Role of minimally invasive surgery. It can be used either as a standalone or in combined combination with open procedures. Posterolateral endoscopic debridement has been shown to achieve good outcomes in limited, limited involvement, single segment spinal tuberculosis. A thoracoscopic debridement has been shown to achieve good outcomes in thoracic spinal tuberculosis. A video assisted thoracoscopic surgery can also be done and all these can be combined with percutaneous screw fixation. A minimally invasive T-lift is useful in tubercular spondylodiscitis of the lumbar spine and lumbosacral spine. Successful outcomes have been reported with these procedures, but their role in cases with severe neurological deficits and extensive osseous destruction is still questionable. Chemotherapy alone cures spinal TB. However, 3 to 5% of the cases can progress to significant kyphosis of 60 degrees or more requiring deformity correction surgeries. Anterior procedures can be successfully employed in healed TB, but it becomes difficult to approach the apex of the deformity. Combined approaches employ anterior carpectomy, posterior column shortening and instrumentation and anterior and posterior fusion. Due to the excessive surgical duration, blood loss and other morbidities, they are best avoided in moderate deformities. They are reserved for severe deformities. Transpedicular decancellation procedures, pedicle subtraction osteotomy, a posterior closing with osteotomy. We are running out of time. Yeah, posterior vertebral column resection and COVO are the procedures used. The surgical management of spinal and tuberculosis should be tailored individually to achieve optical, optimal outcomes, age of the patient, location of the bony lesion, medical comorbidities, severity of the deformity, the number of levels involved, the region of the spine involved, and experience and preference of the surgeon should be taken into account while planning. To conclude, the recent trend is for all posterior global reconstruction in the thoracic and lumbar spine. Anterior debridement and fusion remains the standard in the subaxial cervical TB. Combined procedures become invaluable in patients with vertebral defects involving two to three vertebrae, revision surgeries, and in thoracolumbar spinal TB. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bosco. So this, with this, we come to end of this session and uh, over to the question and answer session. So I request all the panelists to kindly put up any questions if there are any. We had a reasonably interactive discussion in our chat box. So any direct question to the presenters? Well, maybe I can ask a quick question. Um, actually to quite, quite a few of you, because I think, um, and, and congratulations on all the talks, um, I think one common theme that I see uh, in many of these talks in controversial era is the use of MIS kind of techniques. Maybe could each of you, for those of you who've talked about MIS, could you tell me what are, when are situations you will not use MRS, MIS techniques? And for those of you who did not mention MIS, could you tell me whether your particular area you think you can use MIS? Maybe we can start with Dr. Zhang because Dr. Chang talked about using MIS techniques for um, birth fracture reductions posteriorly, but when would you not use it? Mm, uh, thank you for your question. So in some cases with severe kyphosis, like some over, over 30 or 35 degree, uh, I usually not apply some the MIS technique because I think the MIS as techniques have, have several advantages, but it also has some disadvantage for the pump correction or the kyphosis correction. So in usually uh, I apply some the MIS technique for less than 30 degree of the kyphosis. And can you also achieve ligamental taxis uh, with the retro pulse fragment using MIS techniques? Yes, I, I, I completely agree. Right, I see. Dr. Kojanan? You did not mention about MIS techniques. Something that you can you think you can do for um, unilateral facet dislocation? Oh, in fact, when I was doing the literature review on this, I didn't have time to include this, um, but I did come across some papers, case reports, talking about using um, percutaneous techniques posteriorly um, to do a levering maneuver to do a closed reduction. Uh, and in these cases, I think they were published by Japanese surgeons. And in these cases, uh, 
they they did these on, uh, also under general anesthesia and um, under fluoroscopic guidance. So uh, I, I guess it is still in the um, kind of a case series uh, as experience type of stage. Uh, these surgeons eventually did go in uh, later to fuse the spine. So I'm not sure they had a lot to gain by um, by doing the percutaneous procedure as, com as compared to doing a one-off reduction and fixation or doing a close reduction first. But uh, I guess that just adds to the uh, armamentarium that you have in complex cases, even perhaps those who have poor medical condition, multiple trauma, who may not be able to tolerate um, uh, the initial surgery, you can do a minimal invasive reduction. But I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's common practice though. Right, and then I think we have a number of series of talks on infections, surgical site, Dr. Lee. Do you think there's a role for MIS procedures? I mean. Um, Dr. Martin talked about using uh, endoscopic irrigation of the uh, of um, for pyogenic infections. What do you think, Dr. Lee? Oh uh, yes, well, in infection, MIS procedure also a uh, great option for uh, restabilization. But uh, in infection cases, first of all, we we have to uh, remove the infection focus uh, for the in through open procedure. So in that case, uh, open fixation is more better for better choice for than MIS procedure. Yes. Yeah, I, I probably tend to agree with you, particularly when we talk about deep surgical site infection, we really want a very clear debris yes. of the area um, yes. and not just the metal clearing the pus. Um, yes. One thing that you didn't talk about, and I'm going to ask you as well while we, while we have you, uh, implant exchange. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you talked about the, um, um, the biofilm, right? Yes. Um, how about implant exchange at the type of your wound debridement? Have you done that? Do you think it's a good good idea? Oh, yes, but I don't have any experience the matter exchange, but yes, there is a... Uh, Yes, good, great option. Yes, I see. Well, certainly something that people have advocated for those who cannot have the implant removed immediately. Um, you yes. can exchange the implant and, and um, hopefully remove that, um, those that have biofilm. Yes. Um, and then how about the pyogenic in the tuberculosis? I kind of asked Dr. Mata and this in TB, he can possibly also consider the MIS techniques. How about um, Dr. Bosco? Is the MIS technique something that you can consider or you uh, have used? No, uh, my, my institute is uh, traditional. It's one of the centers where we, where we studied the 15 year follow up of chemotherapy. We do open, we don't believe in MIS in uh, tuberculosis. We, we do an extensive debridement and uh, we stabilize when needed anteriorly also. Uh, I, I just described it because I had to cover it up uh, on the topic. So I don't believe in MIS in TB. At least I don't do that. Right. And maybe finally, Dr. Chu, when would you, you are, I know you are very good at MIS techniques, so when would you not use MIS techniques? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the main thing about uh, MIS is you must be able to visualize the vertebra when you use the image intensifier. So there are certain areas whereby it's difficult, especially upper thoracic region, cervical thoracic junction, uh, or in patients who is very obese, uh, you may not be able to visualize uh, uh, the vertebra adequately on the image intensifier. Another group of patients is very osteoporotic patients. So if you cannot see on image int intensifier, you cannot put the screws. So that is uh, quite straightforward. Um, another situation that I, as I have mentioned, uh, MIS versus open, if your MIS has no significant advantage over open, that means the wound size is just a little bit smaller, then is you rather go with open. And uh, finally, like what Prof. Uh, Dr. Zhang said mentioned, if you need to do reduction uh, of a kyphotic uh, deformity or uh, scoliotic deformity, uh, MIS uh, technique may not be adequate in redu reducing these uh, deformities and you may want to consider uh, an open method. Thank you. Very good, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Professor Chewing. And it has been a wonderful participation and a great learning for all. And I think it's over to you, Tane, for the next session, I think. Yes.
after this lovely uh, wonderful first part of this fine session we are heading right away to the second session and uh, i have the honor again to introduce the chairperson for this session thank you very much professor chung and all the speakers for the first session uh, really appreciate it i will be introducing uh, my my one of my mentors dr ram chadda sir uh, welcome sir dr ram chadda also doesn't need much introduction he is one of the leading consultants in one of the major hospitals in mumbai he has been the president of the associations of spine surgeons of india he is on the editor board of asian spine journal and many other journals he has also recently been elected as the chief national delegate of asia pacific orthopedic association and he gives a numerous talks and it's really really lovely to hear him and uh, have you sir and now we can have all his inputs for his this session and i also welcome the moderators for this session dr chandra and dr ahmed so we'll di directly start with the first speaker thank you very much thank you tanay dr tanay so uh, with the permission of the chairperson uh, may i invite the first speaker dr satoshi maki and he will be speaking on degenerative cervical spondylolytic myelopathy okay thank you for your introduction um, i would like to talk about when and how to operate degenerative cervical myelopathy um Thus, the mechanism of DCM is compression of the spinal cord by degenerative changes in cervical spine. The definition of uh, DCM roughly consists of OPLL and cervical spondylolytic myelopathy uh, (CSM). Uh, most of the Japanese spine surgeons determine treatment options for OPLL and CSM separately. In fact, in Japan, there are guidelines for OPLL and CSM respect respectively. Therefore, this time I would like to talk about OPLL and CSM separately by referring to the guidelines of OPLL and CSM, which is based on the systematic review. In the first half, first half uh, we'll talk about OPLL, and the latter half, I will talk about CSM. Uh, 493 articles were finally included in the systematic review. And if you're interested, you can read English version of this guidelines for OPLL in the Journal of Orthopedic Science. Uh, we have to know uh, the natural history of OPLL to know the surgical timing for OPLL. Uh, the patients without myopathy have high chance of remaining progression free. However, uh, those who already have myopathy at the first presentation have higher rate of uh, progression over continued follow-up. We also have to know risk factors for onset and aggravation of myopathy in OPLL. Risk factors are uh, segmental and mixed type of OPLL and occupation ratio 50 to 60% 60, 60 or more and small AP diameter of the spinal canal and trauma. We should carefully observe patients with these characteristics and educate patients not to fall to prevent traumatic spinal cord injury. Uh, indication of surgery and appropriate timing for cervical OPLL. Uh, there's no recommendation for prophylactic surgery for OPLL patients with no or mild symptoms. And conservative treatment is recommended for patients with mild symptoms uh, with JOA 12 to uh, 50 points or more. And appropriate time, surgical timing for OPLL. Uh, surgery is recommended for patients with moderate to severe OPLL and post-operative improvement is poor in severe myopathy with chair-bounded or bedridden, such as near grade of five or JO score four or less. How to determine surgical treatment options for patients with OPLL? Uh, the first clinical question is, is Ontario approach recommended for patients with massive OPLL or uh, with kyphosis? A recommendation uh, is and chair approach is recommended for patients with massive OPLL or accompanying kyphosis. However, the complication rate and reopation rate were high with the anterior approach. The agreement of the experts were about 90% and strength of evidence was weak. 
And the second qu clinical question is the, is the addition of fusion to posture decompression beneficial in patients with OPLL? Uh, the recommendation is the, it's difficult to make clear rec recommendation for additional fusion in patients with OPLL undergoing posture decompression. But additional fusion may be useful in patients with KLI negative and high canal occupation, occupational ratio. The agreement of the experts were 66% and strength of evidence was weak. I would like to present the algorithm for determining surgical procedure for OPLL in our facility. Uh, first, we look at K-line and if it's positive, uh, we look at K-line in next flex position. I would like to add some explanation on this. Uh, K-line in next flex position is relatively new concept uh, which is uh, considered for risk factor of poor outcomes after laminoplasty. Here, uh, the K-line is positive in neutral position, but uh, could be negative in flex position. Uh, if the K-line in neck, neck flex position was positive, we choose laminoplasty, but if it was negative, we go to uh, laminectomy with posterior spinal fusion. And K-line was negative uh, risk. Uh, we look at the uh, risk of complication in anterior approach, such as age or comorbidities. And if the risk is high, uh, we go to LPSF. And if it's low, we choose ADF. I would like to present a case with OPLL. A uh, 74-year-old male present gait disturbance and hand clamness. And um, he has past history of radiation therapy for laryngeal cancer, uh, which indicates he's not a good candidate for anterior approach. His J score was eight point, and he had a motor weakness below C7 spinal segment level. His X-ray showed uh, he has OPL in his cervical spine, and MRI showed max maximum compression at uh, C45 level and intermediary signal ch intensity change at the same level. CT myography showed K-line positive in neutral position and K-line negative in flex position. Uh, we performed C45 laminectomy and fusion and the post-operative outcome are good so far at one year after surgery. Um, please be noted that the procedure I chose is not the only correct answer, but I don't think uh, the laminoplasty for this patient yields good outcomes. Next, I would like to move on to the CSM. Uh, 480 papers were included in the systematic review. Uh, the natural history of CSM is almost same as OPLL. Uh, surgery is necessary in moderate to severe and progressive CSM cases. And in mild CSM cases, the progression is not frequent, but once it progresses, uh, the prognosis will be poor. And how to determine surgical treatment options for patients with CSM? Uh, the first clinical question is, uh, which is a better surgical treatment for CSM, ADF or laminoplasty? Recommendation is there's no clear, clear recommendation as to whether ADF or uh, laminoplasty should be performed for CSM. ADF may be uh, more suitable for patient with kyphosis and large anterior compression of the spinal cord. Laminoplasty may be more suitable for mount level lesions, uh, which is uh, more than uh, three levels or more. Uh, agreement of experts are 100% and strength of evidence was weak. The second clinical question is, is, is the addition of fusion to posterior decompression beneficial in patients with CSM? Uh, the answer is it is difficult to make clear recommendation to add fusion surgery to patients with CSM who undergo posterior decompression. Agreement of expert is uh, 56% and strength of evidence was weak. Um, there's no algorithm like OPL well, when deciding on the surgical procedure for CSM and it must be decided comprehensively. Uh, we should uh, determine based on number of levels involved and presence of malalignment, which can be resulted in post up kyphosis and risk of complications in ADF. Um, please note that uh, the number of stars are based on my impressions only. Uh, I would like to present a case uh, with CSM. 
a 60 year, a 68 year old male uh, presenting gait disturbance and hand clamness. And his JOA score is not, uh, nine, and he had motor weakness below C6 uh, spinal segment level. Uh, his x ray uh, revealed that a local kyphosis of 20 degrees uh, from C3 uh, to 6. And MI revealed compression at C45 and uh, C56 and C67 and intermediary signal change at C67. We performed C47, laminoplasty, and fusion from C3 to C7. The post op course uh, outcome were set satisfactory, maybe due to his long duration of symptoms. I think anterior surgery is another option for this, this patient, but uh, we had better avoid laminoplasty for those patients with uh, kyphotic alignment. Um, now I'm wrapping up my talk. Uh, the answer to uh, when to operate patients with DCM for uh, patients with mild symptoms uh, with JOA score uh, 12 to 15 scores or more. Uh, uh, these uh, For these patients, uh, non-surgical treatment is indicated. For patients with severe symptoms and progressive disease, surgery is indicated. Uh, K-line is a uh, useful indicator for selection of uh, surgical procedure for OPLL. And we should decide on a surgical procedure for these, uh, CSM comprehensively, looking at a number of levels and myalignment and comorbidities. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Um, uh, Satoshi Maki. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Tanai Prabhu. I'm inviting him to uh, be to talking on conservative management of lumbar disc. Dr. Tanai, yeah. am I muted? Can you hear me now? Hello. Yes, yes, yeah. we can hear you. So the disc uh, conditions is one of the most common uh, scenarios in the spine entity. And it's one of the most common surgeries done by all surg spine surgeons, especially youngsters like me. But we must know the role of conservative management in the lumbar disc prolapse, which I'll be speaking about. Let's go to a case scenario of a 41 year old female presented with sudden onset left-sided radicular pain since two days, left-sided straight leg raising was 40 degrees and S1 dermal hypoesthesia at the left side. This is her MRI image seen on the sagittal as well as axial. You can see a huge disc which can be seen almost central. And so what are the treatment options which one it comes into mind? Would you like to do an open discectomy, a conventional microdiscectomy? Discectomy with fusion, and the latest trend is the endoscopic discectomy. But you must also keep in mind there is one more option that is conservative management, and that's what I'll be speaking about. You can see this lady almost after almost more than a year doing all range of movement very well, as well as her straight leg raising was completely fine. This is her MRI in the baseline, and then after 14 months just over a year, complete resolution done in the sagittal. And this is the second, which is in the actual cuts. You can see complete resolution seen. Let's see another scenario. Another youngish lady who is a 40 year old female having a similar huge juicy disc as we call it. This time it is central and little bit posterior lateral on the right side. After almost close to four years, this is complete resolution. She can do all range of movement Similarly, we conserved her. Straight leg raising test was complete, but still on MRI, you can see this ghastly looking picture. But as my mentors and my teachers have always taught that we must clinically evaluate the patient, don't go by just the MRI. So we must correlate and then take a wise decision. So the, always the question is, when do we conserve? When do we operate? And I will be speaking about the conservative part and my colleague later will talk about the surgical part. Just to go through the epidemiology is usually in the age group of 30 to 40 years. Males are commonly 
affected than the females most common level being 45 and followed by 51 because of the mobility there postrolateral type is the most common type there are various et uh, etiologies and from uh, awkward posture to lifting to accident to slouching and even a sneeze or a huge cough can cause the disc to pro prolapse out the pathophysiology is known by on is is the extruded disc and the degenerate material which impinges on the nerve root the nucleus pulpus is a immunogenic which induces the inflammatory response and chemical reaction and that is why it produces radicular and pain syndrome and radicular pathy these are the stages of discs which are degenerative prolapse extrusion and complete sequestration in the last stage usual locations of the disc it can be central as well as it can be posterolateral which i told you the common the other one is the foraminal and the far lateral the future slides of the mri will just show it in detail the common investigations as we go are the x rays we must see how the alignment is see the osteophytes sometimes if it's a chronic disc you can see a, a kind of a cap around or calcification seen posteriorly over the disc see whether the disc space is increased or decreased if it's a subtle disc then it will be decreased space this is the normal and we can also see the spondylolisthesis retrolisthesis which must be kept in mind whether it is in front or backwards and the levels seeing the height of the pedicles as well as the movements you can also go and do the ct scan sometimes the ct scan is also helpful in high and is highly accurate non invasive tool in the evaluation of the spinal disease ct provides a superior image of cortical and trabecular bone compared to the mri as we know it provides contrast resolution and identifies the root compression regions such as the disc herniation it also helps in differentiated bony osteophytes from the soft disc and helps us diagnose foraminal encroachment of the disc material due to its ability to visualize beyond the limits of the dural sac and the root sleeves so there are a lot of advantages of the ct but it cannot differentiate between the scar tissue and the new disc herniation unlike we can do it in the mri it does not have sufficient soft tissue resolution to allow the differentiation of annulus and nucleus mri is the gold standard in visualization of the herniated disc material and its relationship to the neural tissue including the intracranial contents this is just a diagrammatic picture most of us know this is the normal mri on the left and this is the herniated disc you can see how it looks in the actual view the foraminal areas spinal canal this is the disc herniation as i said mostly it is central or mostly posterior lateral this is the central herniation is the paracentral and far lateral so sometimes you should not miss out those on the mri which is far lateral in my practice and always taught by my teachers and mentors you must always do a whole spine screening sometimes some etiology and some kind of things can be also seen in the dorsal as well as in the cervical region so i recommend all of you all to do a dedicated part as well as the whole spine screening in all your patients other diagnostic test electromyography is done ssps are done they are to rule out the peripheral neuropathy uh, positron emission tomography can be done in few cases so broadly the treatment in any disc is conservative either we give after that the block or injection that is the epidural and of course the surgical which my next colleague will be speaking more in detail about i will be speaking about the conservative part in our practice and even mine majority of the disc prolapse respond very well to conservative management sometimes i even see when the patient come to us that he is almost surgical and i feel like you know and after few days of rest patient is actually much much better so resolution of the first disc prolapse takes place almost 75% patients in over 3 months of time this is mine or our protocol where we do a complete bed rest for 2 weeks 22 out of 24 hours just for eating toilet and getting up for bath it can vary from surgeon to surgeon after that we recommend to do little walking and then physiotherapy once the patient is better this is the complete bed rest in your whatever comfortable position in supine or on the side preferably not on the stomach because it causes pressure in the abdomen these are the simple physiotherapy exercises like bridging knee hugs pelvic lifts extension control hamstrings and the knee rolls which can be done 
taught by your physiotherapist go step wise go slowly from first gear to fourth gear don't do all exercise in at one time these are the different exercises which we do once you're better while walking and exercise that is the best form but if in case there is some small disc and it's not surgical patient is not yet getting better we can try the epidural block or steroid in some specific patients this can be a combination of kinacot with uh, the local which can be easily done in the operation theater under siam guidance this is done commonly by the orthopedic spine surgeons as well as nowadays pain management specialists anesthetists also so you can give this role of for epidural steroids so to conclude in the end is prognosis what we see is extruded disc or the large disc herniation as well as sequestrations have greater tendency to resolution or they become better than smaller herniation so you see in the earlier picture which i showed you many times you feel that that is a surgical but those are the common one which resolve but the small fragment sitting in the foramen or far lateral they are the one who are the trouble makers recurrence of this pro prolapse can be prevented by proper exercise regime after taking good rest avoidance of stress at the lower part most of the people become much 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 better and they totally completely resolve so we must always try a conservative line of management as much as possible at least in my practice and many surgeons and my mentors have taught to get this disc which is so huge to a complete resolution in the sagittal and axial as i showed you thank you so much for a very patient hearing i will be happy to answer some questions in the end of the session thank you dr tanay uh, prabhu for finishing his lecture in uh, time our next speaker is uh, dr sharif ahmed junaid from bangladesh and he will be talking on the role of surgery in disc dr sharif kindly unmute yourself dr sharif there yeah he is that you can share your screen yeah 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 please yeah i am mute can you hear me now yeah we can hear you you can share your screen now thank you respected chair persons moderators all the panelists and learned audience good afternoon it's a great pleasure for me to be here i uh, thanks the organizing committee especially dr raja dr tanoy and dr jamal ashraf for inviting me so today the conservative management of dix prolapse dr has... sharif we are still not able to see your screen can you share your screen from... can, you, can you can you see can you see see now no no we are not able to you just need to share no, your no, sorry sorry for just a minute just a minute. sorry sorry you can click on the yeah perfect now, now we are able to see it thank you understood sorry for interruption no so is it clear to you all hello we are waiting we are waiting for your presentation to open we can see your screen we just need to see your can you see, can you see now it's hello? still not open it's still not open we can see your desktop screen with all the just to can you see now no unfortunately your presentation has not yet opened sorry sorry I, I just let me can you please double click on role of surgery in disc final 
can you double click on that icon please yes sir yes sir so is it open now not yet sir just a minute if you go to the previous screen your previous screen also had role of surgery apoa could you please take go to the left corner and go to your previous screen please yeah, now we yes perfect please go ahead okay. sorry sorry for interruption so thank you mr chairperson moderators and learned audience so let's start with the case so this is a case of 33 years female with a history of 7 month low back pain radiate to the right lower limb she had also intermittent pain over the last 3 years on on examination her straight leg rising test was positive and her neurology was normal except a hypoactive right achilles reflex and at that time as she had a symptom of 7 months and it was not improved that's why she was advised for operation but unfortunately she denied due to some reason and i am sure if the same patient presented to you some of you may advocate for operation and some of you may still convince to him her for conservative treatment so let's see so after one year follow up uh, surprisingly this was completely resolved and she was almost pain free so disc surgery though it is the most common operation performed by the spine surgeon but there is always a controversy regarding the best modality of treatment and majority of the disc prolapse can be treated by conservative means uh, but sometimes surgery may be considered only as a last resort or if a patient has a significant neurological deficit so a randomized trial on surgical versus conservative for lumbar disc herniation it is clearly shown there is no significant difference over a period of time of 2 years between conservative versus operative treatment rather operative treatments allows only early mobilization and early symptom free but question is how long should we wait and what is the chance of resolution of disc herniation in that particular case let's see in a systematic review of probability of spontaneous regression of lumbar herniated disc it is clearly shown that sequestrated and extruded discs has a higher tendency to resolution in comparison to disc bulging and disc protrusion though it is resolved but rate of complete resolution of herniation is again still very low that is only 43% for sequestrated discs and 15% for extruded disc again this spontaneous regression symptoms can, can be resolved within a mean time of 1.3 to 1.34 months but radiological resolution may takes longer duration on an average 9.27 to 13 months so whenever a patient presented to you if it is a contained disc you can advise him for surgery because early surgery can give him a or her a good result but in case of non contained disc we we should always try for conservative treatment and dr probo has all already discussed very nicely this so regarding indication if your patient presented with cordaiquina syndrome or rapid developing neurological deficit or severe neurological deficit that starts within 24 hours it may require immediate decompression but the patient 
if the patient have failed conservative treatment or intractable pain or persisting slight neurological deficit, or the patient has a tendency to threat of chronification, in that case, you can do it on elective basis. And you have to carefully look, very careful, look carefully whether there is any signs of red flag. If any of the signs of red flag is present, you must consider it as, as an urgent and should refer immediately. And you have to carefully look for other patients, whether they have at least two symptoms present, present, and at least two signs should be present. In addition, one investigation should be present. If these two symptoms, two signs, in addition to one investigation is positive, you can consider him or her a patient for surgery with a very good outcome. So, and the goal is to decompression of nerve with little collateral damage on access route. You have to preserve the stability as well as to preserve the disc. And in, this can be achieved either by open discectomy endoscopically or standard microdiscectomy. Whatever the procedure, the outcome is almost similar. And you have to carefully, you have to look very carefully whether the exact the pathology is. Is it the posterolateral herniation? Is it the central? Is it the far lateral or phenomenal or lateral disease? So if you once fails to recognize the exact pathology, then you cannot expect a good outcome. So now next question is what determines the outcome? So it is the duration of the preoperative nerve compression. It is the duration of the preoperative acute low back pain and duration of the preoperative time out of work. The more the duration of the symptom, the lesser the chances of recovery. If your patient is presented to you within a three to four months of symptom, you can expect a good result. Whether if the presentation is delayed, say for four to six months, positive result cannot be achieved. Again, the important thing is at the time of presentation, how much deficit with the patient present to you. If the patient present with minor deficit, and if it is presented less than three months, with a very good outcome, but if the presentation is more than four months, still there is incomplete outcome or no outcome at all. And if the patient has severe deficit, say for motor power one to two, and if in that case, you have to judge the patient very, very cautiously because delaying in treatment can unfavor the outcome. So, in that particular patient, if it is presented within a 35 days, there is a good outcome. And if it is more than 70 days, uh, worse prognosis. So next question is whether to fuse or not to fuse. That's a very relevant question. So if the patient presented with a massive disc herniation like this, or patient presented with a segmental instability, maybe the anterior slip greater than three millimeter or local kyphosis greater than five degree on lateral XA, you can consider him or her for a fusion. But again, study also shows there is no <coughs> difference between the conservative as well as fusion. And the most frequently we have to confuse regarding the how much amount of dicks should we remove whether it is limited or aggressive. Answer is, if you do the limited discectomy, there is, it requires shorter time, shorter recovery, but there is a great, more chances of recurrence. But if you do the aggressive discectomy, though there is chances of little recurrence, but there is always chances of prolonged pain. So 
the most important thing is when not to operate. So you have to select the patient very carefully, whether this patient has clinical and radiological discrepancy. That means clinical and radiological correlation is mandatory. Is the patient is primarily back pain? No, these are not a good candidate because only radicular pain will improve. And you have to apply must adequate conservative treatment before going to surgery. And in case of painless disc prolapse, you should never try for surgery. So if I summarize the presentation, if a patient presented with red flag, it needs immediate decompression. And without red flags, you have to see whether it is a content disc. You know the content disc usually though not improved by conservative, but you have to try. If it is improved, that's okay. But if it is not improved, and if it is a disc bulging, you have to apply the selective nerve root block. And if, in case of disc protrusion, you have to consider surgery. And in case of non-content disc, it is always better to treat by conservative. Once it is not improved, you should consider the surgery. So in conclusion, I would like to say, successful treatment based on good history, clinical findings, and correlation with the image studies. Just every case on their own merits. Consider the patient as of your father, mother, brother, or sister. Follow the ethics in every steps of the procedure. Treat the patient, not the disease. Thank you. Thank you for patient sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharif Ahmed Junaid. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joel Sadiang Ebe, and he will be talking on uh, management principles for spondylolisthesis. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizing committee of the APOA Young Surgeons Forum India chapter for inviting me to be a part of this Congress. The topic assigned to me is management principles for spondylolysis. Spondylolysis is a very broad subject and books and research papers have been written to elucidate this pathology. This 10 minute talk will present a general overview on the topic with a focus on management principles. It is defined as the slippage of one vertebra, vertebra over another. In the oft-cited uh, landmark paper of Wilkes, he classified spondylolysis into five different types. Now, this plastic is congenital dysplasia of the upper sacrum or the neural arc of L5. Because of this dysplasia, there is um, insufficient strength to withstand the forward thrust of the superincumbent body weight. And the last three um, lumbar vertebra gra gradually slips forward. The pars interarticularis may remain unchanged. If it remains unchanged and the ring is intact, the sleep cannot exceed more than about 35% before there will be pressure on the cauda equina. There is a strong her hereditary element in this type. Now, the ismic type is um, the basic lesion in this uh, type is the pars interarticularis. There are secondary changes that may occur but are not fundamental to its etiology. There are three types. Lytic is due to separation of the pars, resulting from a fatigue fracture. It is the most common type below age 50 years old. Um, yes, statistically, it's seldom seen in patients below age five, but it does occur even in infancy. At the end of the first year of school, the incidence is 4.4%. Uh, Flexion, extension, and twisting motions are all probably important in producing the stress fractures, but extension is the most important. Subtype B is elongation of the pars without separation. It is fundamentally the same disease as subtype A. Repeated microfractures in the pars allow it to heal in an elongated position as the body of L5 slides forward. Not shown in the diagram is acute pars fracture. These are an acute fracture of the pars secondary to severe trauma. And these type of fractures are extremely rare. Now, the general 
degenerative lesion is due to long-standing intersegmental instability or modeling of the articular processes at the level of involvement results. In addition to degeneration of the disc, there are multiple small stress compression fractures of the inferior articular processes of the allesthetic vertebra. As the sleep progresses, the articular process change directions and become more horizontal. One side nearly rotates more than the other. The, this is an integral characteristic of the disease. The typical hourglass deformity seen on the myelogram is due to rotation of the upper vertebra with displacement of the pedicle. Post-traumatic um, spondylolysis is a lesion secondary to a severe injury which fractures some part of the supporting bone other than the pars. This allows forward slip of the vertebra above on the one below. Unlike the acute isthmic fracture, an isolated pars fracture is not present, and this slip occurs gradually. Not shown on this slide is um, pathologic fractures. Because of local or general bone disease, the bony hook mechanism, which consists of the pedicle, the pars, the superior and inferior articular processes, of fails to support the forward thrust of the superincumbent body weight. And forward sleep of a vertebra of, on the one below it uh, uh, occurs. Now we have the mirroring classification, which is based on the superior end plate of the vertebra below the sleep vertebra into four equal quadrants. Alignment of the least or the sleep vertebra in relation to the divisions in the end plate below determines the grade. Slippage between 0 and 25 of the end plate below or grade 1, between 25 and 50 or grade 2, between 50 and 75 or grade 3, and between 75 and 100 or grade 4. Anteriorly sleeped vertebra that descend anterior and inferior to the end plate below are classified as five or spondyloptosis. So given the benign natural history of low-grade spondylolysis, non-operative interventions should represent the mainstay of treatment. As the natural history studies have shown, there is no role for treating asymptomatic low-grade spondylolysis. Even most high-grade lesions can be treated uh, conservatively at the, at the start. So treatment options for low-grade spondylolysis in children uh, include pain medications, bracing, activity restriction, therapeutic exercises. Uh, the treatment focuses on pain management, although prevention of further slippage may be a consideration as well. Non-surgical management, pain control can be facilitated in some ca cases with NSAIDs, acetaminophen, in conjunction with activity modification. For patients presenting with radic radicular or neuropathic pain, we can use gabapentin, pregabalin, or amitriptyline, can, which are effective in diminishing the symptoms related to nerve root irritation. At times, stronger pain medications such as tramadol or narcotics can be given especially if there is severe pain at rest. But typically, activity modification and over-the-counter pain medications or anti-inflammatories are adequate to improve the symptoms. There are other, these are other modalities that can be used to, um, to improve the symptoms. Physical therapy. It is a central part of initial treatment. In all patients with symptomatic spondylolysis, these are the goals. Even for those with high-grade sleeps and radicular symptoms, physical therapy plays a critical role in improving the stabilization of the lumbar spine and decreasing pain. Unfortunately, there are very few controlled studies evaluating specific exercise regimens, and most studies with a non-surgical group do not specify their treatment protocol. In general, a neutral spine strengthening and stabilization protocol is recommended with avoidance of hyperextension of the lumbar spine. Thank <laughs> you.
In 2003, Mactimoni and Michele proposed management recommendations for a first-time diagnosis of low-grade spondylolysis and or spondylolysis. Once diagnosis has been established, the recommendations include a Boston brace at neutral without lordosis for 23 hours per day. Additionally, the patient should work on uh, physical therapy. Follow-up should be first done at four weeks when once pain-free, the patient can be permitted to return to sports with a brace. They will likely need trimming of the brace to allow them to return to sporting activities, but they should continue to avoid any extension of the spine with sports. At the six-month visit, a lateral x-ray should be performed to evaluate for any progression. At that time, if there has been no progression, the brace should be weaned over a period of six months. The last step should be returning to sports without the brace, especially if they have a great deal of extension in their sport. Some pr practitioners propose much less strict guidance for return to play with athletes with a first-time diagnosis of spondylolysis. There are multiple surgical techniques in a surgeon's armamentarium to address spondylolysis, some of which are the following. Repair of the pars. Uh, in order to have a have a good outcome, it is uh, very important to have a careful patient selection in offering a spondylolysis repair. Few factors influence the decision to repair the pars, namely duration of symptoms, adequacy of non-operative treatment, concordance of pars injection with temporary symptom resolution, the age of the patient, segmental instability, lumbar disc health, and unilateral or bilateral involvement. The workhorse for a low-grade symptomatic um, spondylolysis is decompression and spinal fusion. This is a case of a 50-year-old male presented with many years of mechanical low back pain, now has persistent bilateral L5 radicular symptoms, refractory to NSAIDs, physical therapy, and epidural blocks. He was treated with an L45-S1 decompression posterior lateral fusion using iliac crest and local bone graft, AP and lateral radiographs showing a grade 2 isthmic spondylolysis, T1 and T2 sagittal MRI images showing the L5-S1 spondylolysis with modic changes and a degenerative disc at L4-L5. E2 axial view showing pars defect. Two year post operative AP and lateral radiographs following L4, L5, S1 shows solid posterior lateral fusion. Uh, Dr. Jill, your time is up. Uh... Tea leaf. This is a 55 year old male present. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jewel. Uh, her time is up. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Shinji Takahashi, and uh, he will be speaking on conservative uh, uh, management of osteoporotic vertebral fracture. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you for the moderator, chairperson, and organizer to giving me the great opportunity. My topic is conservative management of osteoporotic vertebral fracture. Okay, so osteoporotic vertebral is a very common disease and linked to a lot of poor outcome, including chronic pain, such as malalignment, ADL, and QOL decline. Among fractures, hip and spine fracture are associated with increase of mortality. In addition, if the number of vertebral fracture increase, the mortality also increase. So the prevention of fracture is very important. We sometimes experience surgical complication in osteoporotic patients, such as proximal junction of kyphosis, cement travel and revision surgery. Therefore, conservative management is very important to reduce the chances of major surgery. We previously performed two cohort study using conservative treatment. 
So today, I'd like to talk about the evidence of conservative treatment based on our data and reviewing the previous papers. Regarding physical therapy, this study investigated the type of exercise and fracture rate. The extension exercise had the most beneficial to reduce the fracture rate. Fracture rate was 89% in flexion exercise, but 16% in extension exercise. Moreover, the extension exercise is beneficial for QOL improvement in patients with osteoporosis. So on the other hand, we reported that paravertebral muscle atrophy was observed after osteoporotic vertebral fracture and the paravertebral muscle atrophy increased the risk of chronic back pain and new fracture. Therefore, we recommended the isometric extension exercise after bony union, five to 10 seconds per one time. One set is 10 times and three sets per day. And if the patient has spinal malalignment and severe back pain, we recommend trunk muscle exercise program combined with rehabilitation clinic to improve their global alignment. Next is BLACE. We previously investigated the effect of BLACE in, in the multi-center prospective study. This study shows no evidence of BLACE for healing vertebral fracture. This randomized control study from South Korea compared no blaze, soft blaze, and rigid blaze. However, there is no evidence, no difference in clinical and radiological results. This Japanese randomized control trial, which compared cast, soft blaze, and rigid blaze, also demonstrated no differences, but the skin travel was more frequent in cast treatment. So, but the, their previous two papers had a small sample size. Therefore, we conducted randomized control study with large sample size, including 71 hospitals and 284 cases. We compared rigid and soft blaze and followed up for one year. There were also no differences between two groups. So these two reviews mentioned that limited evidence has suggested the safety of spinal orthosis for the treatment of OVFs. At present, compelling evidence is not available to suggest that the rigid blaze is superior to a soft blaze or no blaze. So we recommend use of semi-rigid blaze. If the fracture is above T8, we prescribe no blaze. Next, the medicine. This retrospective study compared the teleparatide and bisphosphonate after the onset of vertebral fracture and showed the less compression ratio in teleparatide group. And also this randomized control trial compared the teleparatide use and bisphosphonate demonstrated better outcome in terms of compression ratio, kyphosis, and uh, pain bars. However, many other studies, including our studies, showed no difference. So this still remains controversial. On the other hand, imminent fracture risk is very important to prevent the next fracture. During the first two years after the onset, so we have to, um, we should treat the osteoporotic medicine. The strongest medication for bone increasing is bromosomab in the lumbar spine. Next is teleparatide. Moreover, the bone increase after bisphosphonate is poor in teleparatide. In the case who received bisphosphonate, 
Realm Source Marvel is much better. So far, I talked about conservative treatment, but this type of fracture is resistant to conservative treatment and surgical intervention is sometimes necessary for these cases. And these risk factors are reported for this poor outcome. Especially non-union is reported in 10 to 20%. And uh, this MRI finding T2 high or T2 diffusible signal change a risk factor for non-union. And uh, these are predictive too. So, and in addition, the MRI finding is associated with chronic back pain. So we perform the balloon kyphoplasty in the patients with these risk factors and severe back pain at four weeks follow-up. So the summary, the extension exercise can reduce the risk of fracture and improve QOL. There is no conclusion about the evidence of blessed treatment. Osteoporosis medicine is important to reduce imminent fracture risk. Thank you for your attention. And please uh, participate in the APSS 2021. It's uh, hold from June 9 to 12. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Takahashi. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Shah Waliullah and he'll be speaking on the recent advances in surgical management of osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shinji, for covering the conservative aspect of uh, this osteoporotic vertebral fracture. Right now, I'm going to talk on the recent advances in the surgical management of osteoporotic vertebral fracture. So, So I'm just starting with a case. This 70-year-old uh, gentleman presented with a uh, low-grade fracture, but after a failure of uh, like four weeks of conservative treatment, he's still having a back pain. So the kyphoplasty has been done somewhere else, and this patient had responded pretty well with the uh, this conservative treatment, and Doctor, she was well. Sorry, and he was well. Doctor, I'm not seeing your screen yet. Excuse me, sir. Your present your presentation not seen, please. Uh, yeah, your screen like sharing has not. See it started, Dr. Walula. Is it visible? Not yet. Could you escape and try again? Is it visible, sir? Not yet. Sir, sir the other one has not stopped sharing. Shinji, can you please stop sharing so that I can start with sharing? Someone else has started sharing, so I'm not able to share my screen. Uh, Dr. Takahashi, are you sure that you have stopped your sharing? Yes, I stopped sharing. Can you start? Try again, Dr. Baliola, please. Yeah. Is it visible, sir? Not yet. So because in the screen it is showing that someone else should stop uh, sharing, then we can go for. In the interest of time, till we sort out this technical glitch, 
can we take a few questions for the first few speakers is that okay with you dr shah waliullah yeah yeah sir i'm just trying why it is happening yeah, my is showing the moment you story. come in we'll stop yeah is that okay dr tanay and dr uh... yes sir absolutely right we'll go ahead with a few questions okay. to all the speakers and then we'll get back to uh, is it visible now sir it's still not visible not yet Yeah. Let's look at the first presentation by Dr. Satoshi Maki. He spoke about degenerative cervical spondylomyelopathy. Uh, uh, Dr. Satoshi, may I ask you? You shared uh, two uh, queries in your presentation that I would like to have. One, Shah, I would request you to just uh, leave the meeting and join back again. Uh, close your okay. Zoom and just join back again. That might solve the problem. Okay, uh, Dr. Marki, you spoke yes. separately about the OPLL and separately about the CSM, and mm -hmm. we appreciate that. Now, in the case that you showed, where you did a short posterior segment for an OPLL, uh, we believe and we understand that OPLL in that particular patient was not a focal presentation but a segmental presentation. Uh, what made you decide to do a short segment? in that particular patient from behind where you did posterior plus a posterolateral fusion uh basically uh, we used to fuse uh routinely like c2 to uh, t1 fusion surgery but um in that case uh the only i, I think c4 or 5 segment is uh, has a motion and the uh on his neural neurological examination i think the that's the only part that symptomatic so i fused the uh, lim, uh, the single level uh, but we, we routinely fused a, a long fusion surgery my question is was it the entire surgery limited to that one level or did you decompress more and fuse less i um in that case i only decompress c4 uh, four five level and fuse only that level all right you also mentioned skip laminectomies where do you do skip laminectomies i think uh i mean i uh the skip laminectomy i talked about is basically about the uh what is called uh shiraishi method i use them for like um only single level cases and uh when i have a concern of uh post op kyphosis but high risk for anterior surgery i choose a uh, skip laminectomy so these are patients who are high risk patients where you've looked at such options right uh yes thank you very much it was a brilliant presentation thank um, you dr tanay prabhu uh you mentioned that uh, you give 22 out of 24 hours of bed rest and you give it for a period of about 3 weeks as a part of your conservative trial uh, the cochrane review suggests that bed rest beyond a day or two till pain relief is all that we need um where do we now uh, look at the way forward thank you thank you very much for the uh, lovely question as for the uh, Sort of uh, literature, it is actually very, very variable. They are suggesting that even few days are enough. But in what I have seen in our practice and our even our mentors, which we are following, we just realize that a a period of this much time is quite a lot. And in our setup, like in India, we can always take few days off, and we can take this conservative math method. Unlike in many other countries, like in Europe, US, maybe this much. time period will not be sufficient they may be much more aggressive and a few days trial and after that they may go in for the block or surgery also according to the indication sir but in our setup right now uh, this is working quite well and uh, they are quite happy and i've seen in our practice regularly they come back with much much better clinical relief even it look like a mri which is classical surgical so we are following that sir and we are getting good results sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanay. I think we have Dr. Shah Waliullah who's back with his presentation. Maybe uh, share screen and go ahead with Dr. Waliullah, please, sir. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm really extremely sorry for some technical glitches there. So I'm going to present my talk on the recent advances in surgical management of osteoporotic vertebral fracture. So let's start with this case. A 70-year-old gentleman that present with a small fracture, little subtle fracture, but he was not responding to the conservative management. So the kyphoplasty has been done somewhere else. So this patient responded pretty well with the, uh, this kyphoplasty and he was asymptomatic for six months. Then problem starts after that thing. Then he has started developing back pain again. So on that period, uh, the patient was advised for the, uh, again for the conservative management. Then he came back, back to us. So at this point, he has started developing neurology. So first of all, we tried to conserve, but as he has started developing neurology, so we tried to, uh, we, we thought we need to do something else for this patient. So as the disaster is waiting to happen, so we have again entered in the battle of this uh, surgical management. So we did this uh, uh, like a posterior fixation and augmented with the screws. So, and we tried, uh, we tried our level best to give our best result to this patient. This patient was uh, well for three months. Then afterwards, she came back. He came back again, and this time he presented with a L3 radiculopathy. Because even after the augmenting with the screw at the L3 level with the cement, the screw got loosened up. So these surgeries are full of complications. So try to make conservative management first of all. If the conservative management get failed, then try to go for the surgery. So try conservative management first. There are limited indication for the surgery in this field. So majority of the osteoporotic vertebral fracture heals well and respond good to the conservative treatment. And approximately 15 to 35% of these patients that they don't respond to conservative treatment, like unstable fracture or patient presenting with intractable back pain or a severely collapsed vertebra or the patient presenting with a pseudoarthrosis. So we have two options. I'm going to discuss my talk in two terms like vertebral augmentation and surgery. So first of all, uh, regarding vertebral augmentation, we routinely do like vertebroplasty and capoplasty in our practice. But as my talk is on the, in the interest of my talk, that it, it is on the advances. So I have included some more uh, topics like osteopics, spine jack. These are the other vertebral augmentation systems that have been described in the literature, like radio frequency, capoplasty, and Kiva system. So I'll just take a brief for this uh, for, for system. First one is the osteopics. This is a titanium mesh. After going inside, it is expandable titanium mesh that expands and after putting cement inside, it can provide a restoration of the vertebral height. And in the, another one is this Kiva system. And in this one, nanometer coil has been introduced inside the vertebral body. And then afterward, P cage has been laid down over the coil and then cement is augmented. So this system also restores perfect vertebral height for the collapse fractures. And the system is vertebral body stenting. In this one, what we do again, our uh, expandable titanium cache has been introduced, and after uh, inserting this one, cage has been expanded, and cement get, get, uh, can get introduced. Another one is a spine jack. A spine jack is similar to uh, like our uh, like uh, that we use in our uh, like uh, uh, daily uh, use in car. Like it jack up the vertebral height, and after jacking up the height, we can put uh, cement inside this one. And now comes to the routine, our routine practice like uh, vertebral plasty and vertebral plasty and kyphoplasty. The basic difference between the vertebral plasty and the kyphoplasty is only that in kyphoplasty that we use to put a balloon. And after putting a balloon, we inflate the height of the, uh, maybe try to inflate uh, and match the height of the vertebral body and then put a cement. While in vertebral plasty, if the posterior wall is intact, we directly put a cement. But as we see, the literature says there is still debate and controversy regarding the effectiveness of vertebral augmentation as compared with the conservative treatment. Vertebral augmentation can be performed with the local anesthesia and pain related nerve ending can be damaged by the thermal action of the cement that results in the analgesic effect. Regarding the complication, kyphoplasty has less uh, complication as compared to the vertebroplasty and the complications that have been noticed like the osteomyelitis, Cord compression, thecal sac uh, injury, pulmonary artery embolism, respiratory failure, cement extravasation, and adjacent segment failure. This another one case that is a cement adjacent segment failure. This 67-year-old uh, gentleman that has a previous cardiac surgery presented with a thoracolumbar osteoporotic fracture, 
and uh, after not responding he has given a, a, a capo uh, capo vertebral augmentation has been done but as the time goes by after the six month patient again developed a adjacent segment uh, fracture at this level so again a, a vertebral plastic vertebral augmentation has been done in this case now as we thought this ends up this story but it doesn't end up the story here again presented after a one year this patient again ends up with a, a, a adjacent segment failure so we did again kyphoplasty uh, in this fracture so these fractures are full of like uh, complications so we need to take care of multimodal treatment like uh, also the pharmacotherapy and everything we need to try regarding the complication the symptomatic leakage of the kyphoplasty has been less as compared to the uh, vertebroplasty but it has been recommended like uh, for to perform uh, to avoid leakage meticulous evaluation of the pre operative images a total injected cement volume should be less than the void a small amount of cement should be used not so much and frequent assessment of fluoroscopy while doing performing the uh, procedure high viscosity cement in a dry stage a typical injection time should be 3 4 3 to 4 minutes not more not less what has been recommended in the is the literature that water plasty should only to the apply to the selective group of patient not to the uh, all patient so that Uh, so that carefully performed to achieve initial pain management while considering potential side, serious side effects. Until better evidence has become available, the potential benefit of the vertebral plasty remain unproven, and it should not be routinely offered uh, offer to those uh, those osteoporotic vertebral fracture. The next one comes to the surgery. Surgery is advised if the patient presents with an unstable fracture, continued intractable pain, pseudo arthrosis, or a collapse of vertebra with neurological deficit and kyphosis. There are high rate of perioperative complication and implant failure because of the osteoporosis, and uh, surgery can be done like the anterior spinal surgery or posterior spinal surgery or a combined surgery, and sometimes osteotomy may be needed to correct the deformity. Regarding, there are certain principles that we need to follow. We need to try to put a uh, bigger, uh, longer span, longer span, and bigger, uh, bigger fulcrum to be given to the osteoporotic segment so that we can avoid failure. we need to uh, put uh, cement augmented screws at the proximal and distal junction distal uh, fra uh, fragments so that uh, impl implant pull out screw can be increased we can also do like certain hybrid fixation like in this case we did the percutaneous kyphoplasty then afterward percutaneous screw fixation and then we can do like the uh, like the cage plasty that we can do like uh, to uh, increase the height of the vertebral column and to provide su support to the anterior column we can do the cage plasty like in this case we did and there are certain times like uh, we have failures like the implant because of the back out so in that cases we need to keep uh, rely on our old tested implant that is hard shell and sublaminar wiring and now i am come to the surgical strategies what are the strategies that we need to uh, take up in our account like uh, to improve the outcome like we need to increase the diameter of the screws increase the length of the screws make a small pilot hole and under tapping of the screw track longer concept should be taken and we should supplement anterior fixation use of laminar hooks or wires use of transverse connectors and triangulation techniques these need to be done to increase the outcome of our surgery and there are novel screws or construct design like expandable screws or the fenestrated screws that we can use so that uh, cement augmentation can be done with these screws and the like uh, improvisation in our armamentarium are the conical screws and the hydroxy epitide coated screws they can improve the bone screw interface and the novel surgical technique like cortical bone trajectory that we can use to improve the outcome of our surgery in osteoporotic cases and there are novel surgical techniques like cement augmentation can be done to avoid failures prophylactic vertebroplasty can be done to avoid adjacent segment uh, fractures pharmacotherapy is a backbone novel wire material like biodegradable cements can be used and combination of the techniques should be used at every case should be tailored one So my take home message no single technique for optimizing surgical outcome in osteoporotic vertebral fracture tailored surgical techniques are need needed for individual cases surgeons need to pay attention in advance in osteoporotic spinal surgery to improve fixation there is a need for greater effort through the multimodal approach including the conservative treatment surgery osteoporosis treatment and drug that promote fracture healing to improve the quality of life of patient prevention and management of osteoporosis is the key element in managing osteoporotic vertebral fracture to reduce the risk of subsequent vertebral fracture baseline drugs like calcium vitamin d classical drug like bisphosphonate and estrogen receptor modulator and newer drug like denosumab and teriparatide 
should be started as per the individual demand. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah Vayula. Uh, we'll just... Ram Chadda sir has just got disconnected. Uh, Chadda sir has got disconnected. So, I think the moderator, can you ask a few questions? So, uh, so can I ask uh, the next speaker? Uh, our next speaker is uh, Kozi Nakazima, and he will be uh, presenting on surgical side infection. Uh, prevention is better than cure. Has Dr. Koji joined in? Uh, see you, uh, Dr. Koji. In the participant there? list, uh, actually, unfortunately, I don't find him. Okay. I think Dr. Koji has not joined in. If that's the case, we can have a short five minutes of questions and we can move to the next session. So I think Dr. Ramchandra sir has got disconnected. So may I request uh, the presenting uh, uh, present panelists uh, whether they have any question to the presenters. I think there was a question for uh, Dr. Junaid in the chat box. He can answer that. Yeah. And then Dr. Koji has started. Yeah, he's joined. Oh, in he's here. Okay, okay. Please go ahead, Dr. Koji. Yes, come back. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you, Chairman. I'll talk about prevention for surgical site infection. The incidence of SSI in spinal surgery is said to be ranging 1 to 2%. National surveillance in Japan has shown that the rate of SSI in spinal surgery is higher than that in fracture or arthroplasty surgery. Uh, spinal SSI is known to be difficult to treat. This patient underwent C2 to T5 instrumentation surgery, but unfortunately, infection occurred. And several irrigation surgeries were conducted. Finally, the wound was closed, but it took one year. Uh, SSI can cause a variety of adverse events for a patient's outcome, longer hospital stays or higher medical costs. The impact of SSI is so large that prevention is needed. Here are today's topics. First, I'll talk about antimicrobial prophylaxis. Antimicrobial prophylaxis, AMP, is considered to be one of the most important prevention tools for SSI in various guidelines. And cefazolin is recommended as the first choice of antimicrobial agent due to its coverage spectrum bactericidal activity and favorable antibacterial, antibacterial tissue concentrations. Uh, in 2019, many hospitals in Japan were forced to use alternative antimicrobial prophylaxis agents due to a shortage of cefazolin. Then the incidence of SSI in spinal surgery increased during the period when alternative agents were used. Cefazolin should be used whenever possible. Several guidelines show that effective blood concentration must be reached before skin incision. So timing of administration is recommended be between 60 minutes before and just before the surgery. Re regarding the dose, I'll introduce one experimental research 
Even when two gram of cefazolin was used for orthopedic patients, the blood concentration was only slightly larger than the MSC of cefazolin resistant coagulase negative staphylococcus. So I recommend two gram of cefazolin as initial dose. One gram is acceptable as additional dose. Post-operative AMP duration remains controversial. CDC guideline recommended that we should not administer additional antibiotics after the surgical incision is closed and in arthroplasty. But this is not the case in the real world, especially in spinal surgeries. And one RCT was reported in which there was no significant difference in infection rate between pre-operative AMP and pre- and post-operative AMP. Based on these results, WHO stated that there was no problem without additional post-operative prophylaxis, but uh, many concerns remain. This is likely due to the small sample size. Another RCT showed that there were no significant difference in SSI rates between AMP uh, during 24 hours after the surgery and AMP until removal of drain tubes. 24 hours may be optimal duration. Uh, so we adapt the duration within 24 to 48 hours after surgery, but this issue remains uncertain. Next topic is topical application of vancomycin. It is so-called vancomycin powder and used widely in spinal surgeries. There are many reports describing the advantage. And several systematic reviews have shown that vancomycin powder can reduce the risk of an infection in spinal surgery. And on the other hand, in regard to RCT, and there was no significant effect in vancomycin powder. And furthermore, and there are some concerns about vancomycin powder, especially SSI caused by gram-negative organisms is said to be increased. So we should be careful in this point. And to summarize, vancomycin powder is expected to have a preventive effect on SSI. However, be careful when implementing it. Criteria for use should be established by each hospital. And another way to use vancomycin is intravenous. Dr. Yamada reported that he used the cefazolin and additional vancomycin intravenously for high-risk patients, and a good prevention effect was observed. And this is one way to consider instead of applying locally. And next is about preoperative measures. I'd like to focus on nasal and body decolonization. And guidelines suggest decolonization when staphylococcus aureus is prevent, present in the patient's nasal cavity. We can use two agents, mepirocin ointment for nasal cavity and chlorhexidine gluconate solution for body wash. And the famous RCT was reported. Mepirocin ointment and chlorhexidine body wash could reduce any kind of infections caused by staphylococcus or is including SSI. However, in the field of orthopedic surgery, there has not been enough evidence. One RCT showed no difference between a piercing ointment and a placebo. Uh, although there is a shortage of evidence, it is a good method to consider because it is thought to have fewer adverse events. I instruct the patient to use these agents five days before surgery and continue just before the surgery. And there are many interesting topics in intraoperative measures. In this talk, I will focus on diluted povidone yielding irrigation. And diluted yielding irrigation is widely accepted in variety of operation. And for spine surgery, two RCTs were published showing a preventive effect with 0.35% povidone yielding solution with no apparent of the adverse events. Um, diluted yielding irrigation is a good method to consider. I prepared this solution with 20 milliliter of 10% yielding in 500 milliliter of normal saline. The wound is filled with this 
uh, solution for more than 30 seconds, and then additional irrigation with normal saline is conducted. Yeah, and based on today's talk, uh, please review the measures at your hospitals. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Koji. That was an excellent presentation. Now, as I said, we'll just uh, have one one short question to the presenters who have uh, sort of presented till now. Uh, the third presentation was on surgical management of disc herniation. Uh, Dr. You spoke, yeah, Dr. Junaid, yes, you spoke about contained discs needing surgery more than the non-contained discs. And you also mentioned about the size of the disc. My question to you is, is disc surgery actually removal of the disc or is disc surgery decompression of the nerve root? And does size really matter? So thank you, sir, for asking a nice question. Actually, disc surgery actually to decompress the nerve root. It is not the removal of the disc. And, and clinically, it does not depend on the size of the disc because sometimes it is seen that if there is a very small disc, but say severe pain, actually it is due to irritation of the nerve root that is called radiculitis or chemical due to mediators of the neuro uh, like prostaglandin or uh, like substance that causes the irritation of the nerve root. Thank you so much for clarifying that, that it's not the size of the disc, but it's the nerve root compression which matters. Thank you so much. Do we have Dr. Jewel with us? Uh, Dr. Jewel uh, Sadiang. Uh, Ma'am, you mentioned in Wilsey's classification something which was added as the sixth point where you mentioned about uh, an iatrogenic or a post-surgical uh, sort of a breach. Could you elaborate on that? Probably your presentation was cut short a little bit. How would you look at managing those situations? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for your question. So in the original classification, it was not included, but there is an iatrogenic um, component so that um, sometimes um, even in simple surgeries, like, um, like a simple decompression, a few months later or a few years later, the patient would develop um, a list disease because um, Sometimes um, the um, surgeon may be over aggressive in the decompression. So again, we treat these patients as we would um, the usual spondylolisthesis, which is uh, they we would try to conserve first and see if the um, symptoms would resolve with conservative management. And thereafter, if it doesn't really um, if it doesn't really resolve, then Maybe we could um, we could uh, suggest um, if it was if the initial surgery or the index surgery is just uh, decompression, we could suggest a fusion or a revision of the fusion if um, if that really happened. So, um, but these are not um, very common um, incidents um, in our practice. Um, this is uh, quite rare, sir. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, ma'am. That was something because it is an additional to the other five parts of the Winsey's classification. Now to conservative management of the osteoporotic vertebral fracture, Dr. Shinji, a small question to you. Um, do you have any particular test or criteria by which you decide that yes, this patient is now moving from conservative care to surgical intervention? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, so the conservative treatment, we um, uh, we do their breast treatment and bed rest for about four weeks. And we check the dynamic X-ray and MRI in the patients with severe back pain. And if there is instability, we perform the um, balloon kyphoplasty in the patients with severe pain. So your dynamic x-rays are done in the lying down and sitting position, I believe. Yes, right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. 
moving on to Dr. Shah Vaiyullah, you mentioned about recent advances. Now, what I need to know from you, Dr. Vaiyullah, uh, do you decide when you're doing only a cement augmentation, whichever modality you may do, versus combining it with a posterior surgery with or without decompression? How do you take that decision? Sir, uh, surgery is uh, basically if I see that the patient is having back pain more, like, uh, and if there is there instability is present, then uh, I will offer a surgery for this patient. Otherwise, simple uh, vertebral augmentation is good enough for this patient, and I'll keep an eye for this patient in follow up whether they require. Otherwise, initially, I don't offer surgery for this patient. Thank you very much. Uh, to the last speaker, Dr. Koji, who spoke about surgical site infection. Um, Dr. Koji, when do you believe that implants needs to stay in? And when do you decide that the part of the surgery includes metal exit? Yeah, uh, you mean that uh, in the treatment surgery for SSI, uh, we should reduce the metal or not? Yes. Yeah. So, is, there, is there any timeline that you decide when you have mm. SSI? Is it three months? Is it something else? When do you uh, plan metal exit and when do you decide to keep the metal? Or if you look at a third option, if you're looking at a situation which is too early, are you planning to remove and replace the metal? Okay. Uh, I uh, We usually... Uh, uh, Keep keep the metal uh, in the acute stage, uh, especially uh, four weeks uh, uh, from the surgery day. But uh, when it took one month or longer, uh, we don't uh, we don't remain this metal instrumentation, and we remove and uh, uh, use new uh, instrumentation. Yes. Thank you very much. That's all from my side. Over to the moderators. Tell me. Thank you, sir. So we are near to the end of this session. Um, uh, our next session is on pediatric orthopedics. And with the permission of the chairperson, uh, I would like to conclude the session. Thank you very much for patience here. Thank you to the moderators. Thank you to both Dr. Tanai and uh, Dr. Raj Vaskar for conducting this entire event under the supervision of Jamal Ashraf and the entire team. God bless you all. It's been fantastic. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tanay. And now Thank you, sir. we invite Rashid Anjum to moderate and uh, start the pediatric orthopedic session. Over to, over to you, Rashid. Thank you. Thank you, Raja, for a wonderful session on spine. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, and uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association and Dr. Jamal Ashraf sir in particular for giving us this opportunity. And uh, I would like to invite the chairperson for this session, Dr. Rojuta Mehta. She's a leading pediatric orthopedic surgeon and the driving face of women's orthopedic group in the Indian Orthopedic Association. She is heading one of the largest pediatric orthopedic departments in the country. And she has been a teacher to all, almost all of us, the young pedipodes in India. So it's an honor for us to have you here, ma'am. And I would also like to introduce and welcome my co-moderator, Dr. Amna Baljon. She is a young pediatric orthopedic surgeon from uh, King Khalid University, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So with the permission of the chairperson, I would like to invite our first speaker to talk on the current concepts in the diagnosis of DDH. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Ruba Jamal from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So with your permission, ma'am, I uh, would like to know. Thank you. Yes, absolute pleasure. And I request all the speakers to really be brief so that we have more time for discussion. Yes, yeah, sure. So over to Dr. Ruba Jamal. So hello, everyone. Um, let me share my screen first so we can start off.
So hello everyone, my name is uh, Roba Jamil I'm a senior registrar of orthopedic surgery from King Fahad Hospital, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Today we're gonna talk about, um, sorry for that, today we're gonna talk about DDH current concept and the role of ultrasound. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try to make it uh, brief as much as possible, only highlighting the important points. So let's start off with the definition of DDH. The definition of DDH encompasses a spectrum of pathology, which includes unstable, malformed, even sublapsed and dislocated hips. The dysplasia, uh, the, this word means that um, any form of dysgenesis of the acetabulum and the femoral head in the form of uh, lack of depth, lack of coverage, uh, that uh, varies uh, with uh, it, that varies in the clinical manifestation. When we talk about the terminology, it's very important to highlight the precise why they choose the uh, uh, terminology developmental instead of the previously um, term the previously used terminology uh, congenital, because uh, dislocation or dysplasia has been demonstrated to occur before uh, and after birth. Thus, the terminology uh, developmental occur. The incidence of this disease takes place um, between uh, 0.1 and 10% of live birth. Uh, they, uh, it's likely underreported and it's difficult, difficult to quantify the exact incidence because of this. Genet um, when we talk about genetics, it's important to mention the environmental and genetic factors that takes place which is mentioned in the literature. Uh, DTH by itself, uh, it is an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with an incomplete penetrance. Recent uh, literature has showed that at risk family, uh, uh, they have a 6% chance of having a child with a DTH if neither parents uh, have a DTH, but they have one prior child affected with DTH. This incidence uh, levels up, up to 12% if uh, one parent is affected, but no children, prior children affected. And the incidence uh, uh, percentage goes up to 36% if both a parent and one child affected. When it comes to treating uh, children with uh, DDH, it's very important to uh, to consider a team approach, a multidisciplinary approach, which takes place first from the, from the peripartum period in which gynecology and obstetrician takes, uh, takes place. They, they must carefully observe the risk factors during pregnancy uh, with the intrauterine ultrasound uh, and uh, other modalities. It's very important to understand that by the 11th week of gestation, the hip is fully formed. And this is the earliest time at which a hip dislocation can occur. When it comes to the postpartum period, pediatrics and family medicine takes their turn here. It's very important to uh, obtain a full neonatal examination of the hip, including the provocative maneuvers that it's well mentioned in the um, uh, literature, which are the Barlow and the Ortolani respectively. It's very important to educate the parents about hip care and prevent hip swaddling, as it's shown to be uh, one of the risk factors for uh, patients uh, with late presentations of DDH. There is a study um, that is uh, published in the Clinical Orthopedic and Related Research uh, Journal um, that was, uh, uh, that was uh, taken on, uh, that was um, held in the year of 2016. It's a retrospective review of prospectively collected data from a multicenter database that uh, was taken, uh, conducted from the 2010 to 2014, and they come up with uh, a conclusion that, that there are specific risk factors for late presenters. Late presenters of DDH, which means uh, presenting with, DD, with any form of DDH after the age of three months. Uh, 
they have concluded that there are two variables identified as risk factors for LA presenters, which are fetal presentation, uh, to be exact, uh, cephalic fetal presentation, and history of hip swaddling by the parents. This finding is consistent with the fact that infants with cephalic presentation are not monitored as closely and therefore they may be missed early um, in their course uh, of uh, disease. There are specific uh, characteristics of plate presenters that is mentioned in his uh, review. Uh, he found that uh, most the uh, late presenters tend to have irreducible hip, unlike the early presenters. And most of the late presenters, um, they less likely to have bilateral dislocation, uh, unlike the, um, the uh, early presenter group. When it comes to screening, there is a lot of controversy, uh, controversy and uh, debate that takes place. Uh, internationally, it's very uh, it's very well uh, known, or let's say it's very well established um, to uh, encounter every child and, and perform uh, ultrasound uh, on him on uh, after birth. Uh, they do not selectively screen uh, children. Uh, this leads to many problems, such as overdiagnosing and overtreatment. As we know that most of the children uh, at the age of, uh, from the age of first to thir third week, they may have subtle symptoms of BDH that will resolve spontaneously. So we are over-diagnosing a problem that it's, um, that it's not uh, existent um, to be, uh, that it's not existent. Um, here comes the American Academy of Family Physician that they stated that there is insufficient evidence to uh, recommend routine screening as a way to prevent adverse outcome. American Academy uh, of Orthopedic Surgery appropriate cruise criteria that was launched in 2018. They have strongly recommended selective screening of uh, uh, from uh, at the age of four to six weeks of age in only high-risk children. So when it comes to ultrasound and its role, uh, it has a major role in diagnosis and it has a major role in management that we will uh, highlight in the next um, slides. So Graf has introduced ultrasound for the diagnosis of, um, for the early diagnosis of hip dysplasia in 1983. It's the foundation of all contemporary sonographic technique. Uh, there are uh, multi-examination modalities uh, that, uh, that is uh, known uh, worldwide, but are the, the most common ones um, are the graph, targesine, which both are static methods, and the hard key, which is the uh, a dynamic method of uh, ultrasonography technique. When we, uh, it's very important to understand um, in uh, in terms of graph method, uh, it's very important to have a very well trained uh, technician that he uh, that is able to produce produce uh, a, a good quality. Um, uh, image and is able to, uh, to produce and interpret the uh, results eff efficiently. So it's, um, uh, it's based on, this is uh, the hallmark of this, uh, uh, the, hallmark of, the hallmark of it for an accurate analysis of imaging. Uh, the graph method, as we mentioned before, it's a, it's a static, um, uh, morphology evaluation of a resting hip in the coronal plane. So it's a static, as we said, it's a static, a static assessment of the morphology in the of the resting hip and coronal plane, and it's most uh, importantly to be done by a well-experienced technician. As you can see here, um, there is no form of um, provocative maneuver to be done. Dr. While, uh, Ruba, you okay. have less than half a minute. Please try to uh, brief, make it brief. You're just less than half okay. a minute. Oh. Okay. 
uh, it's very important to identify the anatomical landmarks. Um, um, it's very important to identify the anatomical landmarks since we are describing or since we are assessing the morphology features of the hip. Uh, the anatomical landmarks such as the uh, cartilaginous roof, uh, the joint capsule, the femoral head, the uh, bony roof and rim. Uh, these are important landmarks that uh, uh, the, the angles will be based on because uh, if you don't uh, identify these landmarks, it's very difficult to calculate the angles that we're going to mention uh, in the next slide, the alpha and beta angle. The alpha angle represents the acetabular roof, which means depth. The beta angle represents the cartilaginous uh, uh, roof, which means the coverage. So a normal uh, alpha angle takes uh, more than uh, takes place than more than 60 percent, uh, 60 degree. Uh, the beta Uba, angle. your time is up. You are our one minute almost. Our your time. Please make okay. it to the conclusion. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let's be fast. Here the the normal alpha angle is more than 60 degree. Beta angle hardly variable. Uh, as we said, uh, to make up, to, uh, to uh, describe, uh, to, 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 order, to, to make subtypes of uh, each uh, hip based on the graph uh, classification, uh, uh, the description of the hip takes place, the bony roof description takes place as well. So you uh, eventually will come up with a subtype accordingly and to determine the severity of the DTH. The TARGC method, uh, to be uh, very brief, uh, it's a static method uh, that it's um, that it uh, takes place uh, and uh, and highlight the femoral uh, head uh, coverage. Uh, the magic number is more than fifty percent, which uh, interprets a normal, uh, uh, which is normal. For the dynamic hierarchy et al. method, uh, it's now more uh, commonly used. Uh, it's the same as the. Uh, it's the same as the graph method, except that uh, in dynamic hierarchy, we add uh, we add a transverse plane of a neutral and flexed hip, and we have to use a provocative maneuver, usually Barlow, for a normal examination to take place. Uh, the hip has to be uh, reduced in all um, states. This is the last slide uh, when we talk about the role of uh, ultrasound in VDH management. It's an ideal tool for surveillance because of the lack of the radiation. It's recommended to uh, evaluate the hip every seven to 10 days during public treatment. So it's a tool uh, that will uh, give a good hint about the quality and the uh, progressiveness and the effectiveness of treatment, especially public harness. Some authors, and some surgeons, they use ultrasound uh, intraoperatively after a close reduction um, uh, instead of uh, post-op uh, CT scan uh, versus uh, poor selective cuts or MRI scan. Uh, so the take-home uh, message... Uh, so the take-home message, it's very important. Yes. Yes, your voice is Am breaking. I done? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruba, for a wonderful uh, talk on this. Actually, I must okay. tell all the speakers, Dr. Rujuta Ma'am is a very strict examiner. So all you, all of you should stick to the time. Even I will cut off half of my slides if that's the case. Okay. So for our next talk, I would like to invite Dr. Yavul Saglam from Turkey to speak on the long-term outcomes of late presentation in DDH. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my slides? Yes, uh, you can continue. We can see your slides. Okay. okay. My name is Yavuz Salam from Turkey, Istanbul Faculty of Medicine. Today, my topic will be long-term outcomes of late presenting DDH. We all know that DDH is a fairly common disease. Early detection and the treatment will continue to be a key factor in reducing both lifetime health costs and as well as long-term patient disability. So the breach position at delivery, family history, and the female gender have been most consistently shown to have an association with DDH. So 
The acetabulum, which is almost cartilage at birth, pressure from the concentrically reduced femoral head against to the true radiate cartilage is critical to, to grow a normal acetabular remodeling. As you have seen on the left side, a normal hip joint in the middle and acetabular dysplasia. On the right side, a highlighting the hip dislocation. So early diagnose comes with less aggressive treatment. Our goals will be to provide an anatomical and concentric reduction in the shortest time to maintain the stability and to prevent the vascular damage. In case of later diagnose, an hourglass capsule and contracted tendons such as iliopsoas and adductor longus can easily block the reduction. Completely closed methods of reduction at this stage may need gradual traction and progressive abduction, which may end up with avascular necrosis. The definition of late presenting DDH is controversial. A recent study from Australia considered any DDH discovered after newborn screening period, which is three months. Another study from UK considered late presentation as six months, which was selected at the failure rate of pelvic helmet harness exceeds half of the patients. Some countries believe that the delayed presentation is cases after walking age, but in the past, Saltrend was believed this point to be reached around the age of two, which pelvic osteotomy may need it. So there's no clear cutoff. The chronological preamble brings us to a definition of a late presenting TDH. Is a hip that has been dislocated or unstable for such a period then that normal development is unlikely even after successful concentric reduction. When we look at our reference book, Tashjian, there are treatment recommendations for different ages. The most consistent treatment modality for a late presenting TDH is anterior open reduction, which includes tenotomies, arthrotomy, resection of the pulvin and a teres tissue, labrum must not size be incised or excised. If needed, a femoral shortening and pelvic osteotomy can be done, posterior ca ep capsular application and a hip spica for three, month, three months. So what are the evidence-based evidence outcomes? I will give you evidence-based outcomes of some articles. This is an observational study from British Registry to assess an infant's with late presenting dislocation of the hip despite the sonographic screening and they conclude with universal and selective screening cannot fully eradicate late presentation. Another multicentric study from North America, they evaluated risk factors and the nature of the dislocation early versus late presentation and they conclude with cephalic presentation infants are not monitored closely, therefore may be missed early. The late presenting group was more likely to have a history of swaddling. Another observational study from Australia, Australian registry, they assessed the risk factors for late diagnosis and they found out that a lower birth weight, a birth in a rural setting, an early hospital discharge following the delivery less than four days were significant risk factors for late diagnosis. Breach presentation and delivery by C-section were protective for late diagnosis. Another study from Mexico, they looked at the outcomes of open reduction for late presenting DDH. The mean age at the surgery was two and the mean follow-up was around 10 years and they had 80% radiographic good outcomes. A trend was observed worse outcomes in children older than six years old. They had a 14% rate of AVN as well. This is a recent study from Egypt. They aim to create a simple radiological system that can predict the success of close reduction in late presenting DDH. There is a tendency towards the failure of close reduction with increasing the grade of the zone. Another study from UK, they looked at the presence of ossific nucleus and its relation to the AVN in 79 hips. And they conclude with an absent ossific nucleus and open reduction negatively affect long-term outcomes. And this long-term study, which comes from France, showed that 95% of the hip survival after traction followed by an open reduction in 30 years time. 
This is another interesting study from Norway. They investigated the change, the change of treatment modalities over 50 years period. The mean time in skin traction had decreased and open reduction rate was increased with time. The immobilization time in spike cast had decreased to six months after 50 years. And these changes resulted in improved femoral head coverage and better radiographical results. Another study from UK showed that a closed capsule reduction technique is possible in early AIDS, and this has a low rate of AVN and superior outcomes. The later is expensive and can lead to overtreatment. This is the last study from Malaysia showed a great economical impact of late presenting TDH with 86% of the amount having been used to manage late presentation of DDH that was mostly contributed to the cost of the surgeries. So what about the neglected DDH? A tipping point of eight years, probably the age that the treatment are likely to produce an, over, an outcome no better than untreated clinical course. So the results are poor after the years of eight. So my conclusion is screening procedures are the most, are the cornerstones. However, universal and selective screening cannot fully eradicate the late presentation. The later is always expensive, can lead to overtreatment and complications. My last words are from Reinhard Graf. Let others operate on the dislocated hips. You do an accurate physical examination and sonographic scanning. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yous, for a wonderful uh, presentation and also finishing well ahead of the time. So we can have one question if anyone uh, wants to ask any question, or we can have later on as, one, as the chairperson decides. I'm, Rashid, I feel uh, since both the topics are related, let's go ahead with the question now for uh, them. Okay. So sure. I'd encourage the panel to ask the, amongst each other because I think this is a platform for all you youngsters to really uh, blend together. But just to set the ball rolling, I'd like to ask uh, Ruba first. Uh, Ruba, are you there? Yes, hello. Yeah, yeah hello. So, so nice to see a lady from Saudi Arabia and may the woman power increase. But uh, <laughs> since this is a topic close to our heart because it affects the girl child more, I wanted to know what are the swaddling practices in Saudi Arabia and is something being done about it? Uh, yeah, it's still, uh, it's still a common practice, uh, unfortunately, but... Um... Uh, we're raising the, uh, this issue uh, with educating uh, parents, uh, uh, especially after uh, the mother take birth um, in, um, in most of the hospitals. So no more swaddling as compared to um, previous times. Okay, and one more quick question for you. If you had to recommend universal screening versus risk factor screening for your country, what do you think would be a better public health? A selective screening, of course. Selective screening, okay. yeah, yeah. All right, all right, thank you. And Yawuz, that was a very, um, I want to, uh, to tell uh, the audience, where do you place medial or open reduction in the gamut of treatment of DDH? Can, uh, can you repeat again, please? That's, that's for Yawuz. Um, Yawuz Aglam from Turkey. The question oh, is for him. Oh, okay. okay. Sh Sorry shall I that. answer your question, ma'am? Where do you place medial open reduction? What is the role of medial open reduction in the gamut of treatment of DDH? So we only prefer medial open reduction in the patients below one year of age in case if there is unsuccessful close reduction. Okay. And how do you all address a teratologic hip when it is diagnosed? How do you all address it? Do you attempt a close so, reduction if the baby is uh, no. in the neonatal phase or you? No, we wait 
until two years of age. And then we do a radical reduction, including all tenotomies, open anterior reduction, femoral shortening, and if needed, pelvic osteotomy. So we always wait until two years old for a teratological hip dislocation. Okay, Rashid, I think we can have question, one more question from amongst the panel, especially from you, since you worked such a lot with Dr. Jauhari. Um, actually, I do have a question, if you don't mind. Absolutely, yes, no, go ahead. go ahead. Okay, so uh, you mentioned in your presentation that the sequelae of late presentation of DDH is very harm and it costs a lot for the patient and the uh, uh, country. So um, I've read, I've encountered some um, literature that says that even some patient with a normal ultrasound that was diagnosed with his hip dysplasia at uh, early and that was treated might uh, develop uh, subsequent later dysplasia after one year or two years. So do you have some um, proposed any protocols that we follow those patients for a longer time, especially those with higher risk factors such as breach presentation would you prefer that after we have a good ultrasound and a good x-ray after a year of diagnosis that this is the patient? So as well as I know from the current literature, if there is a normal hip diagnosed by a technique uh, of graph around the age of three months, if the alpha angle is uh, over 60 degrees and there is no risk factor such as first female breach presentation and the family history, there is no uh, another uh, control or another screening for that child. But in my daily practice, if there is even one risk factor or if there's any uh, physical examination finding, I always follow these patients until the age of five. So uh, if there is no acetabular dysplasia at the age of five, I will stop screening. Okay. Um, one last question, I'm sorry. As you mentioned also, a breach presentation is a very common risk factor for uh, DDH. Um, have you encountered anything um, describing the duration of the patient being in breach during the pregnancy? Because some of the, the mothers might encounter that uh, they told her she had a breach for less than a month and it went to a cephalic uh, presentation. Does this have a correlation, the, um, the duration of breach presentation within uh, the womb and the uh, development of DDH? So until the, the gestation week of 32, uh, most of the baby, babies are uh, at the breech position um, in, in, uh, during the pregnancy. So if the baby is still breech after 33rd week of gestation, we call that a breech delivery. So we close them, uh, we, we closely monitor these child. Okay, because some articles mentioned the, um, the cephalic virgin intra uh, during the uh, pregnancy that sometimes they suggested that if they do external cephalic virgin, it helped decrease the breach presentation period. And they think that this might help, but I'm not sure if you have any experience with that. No, I, I do not have any experience with that. Sorry about thank that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I think we should carry on with the next paper. We will have a later part for discussion also. So next, I want to invite Dr. Nesti Panopio from Philippines. He will be talking on the management of Parthi's disease. It's one of the controversial topics in pediatric orthopedics. So over to you, Dr. Nesti. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to share with you an overview of management of one of the most controversial topic in pediatric orthopedic Parthi's disease. So for the background, it's a slow progression. It's a long-term progress that requires long-term follow-up. It's self-limiting, unlike adult posture necrosis, by its ability to heal and remodel. It's short-lived, therefore it's transient if official growth disturbance, and therefore salvageable because the blood supply will later on follow up by, uh, by revascularization. For the epidemiology, the 80% tool is always useful. Most of them are boys, unilateral in location, and onset is four to eight years old. Depending where you are and the study is, it's usually one to three per 10,000 per year. And it's usually more common or increased risk in Caucasians in high altitude countries like Scandinavia, but it's also more common in Southwest coastal plain of India. Thanks to Dr. Benjamin. 
So for the etiology, the exact, the exact etiology remains unknown, but many factors related to etiology has been mentioned. And over the last decade, it has focused on abnormalities of thrombosis and fibrinolysis, demonstrating a consistent relationship to protein C and S. So for the growth factor, it has been shown that these vertices have shorter stature in bone growth or bone age trails about two to three years behind, and authors have found evidence of reduced growth factors such as somatomedins. For the environmental, more common in rural, poor, and smoking has an effect to tissue plus nitrogen activator, supporting a thrombotic theory. So, and the genetic factor, some literature have an expression uh, association with expression of HLA antigen and lymphocytes of LCPD. And trauma is a causative factor always. However, it's difficult to substantiate because mild frequent trauma is frequent in children. So for symptoms, they are variable in every child. Some may have hip pain. Some may have gait abnormality, which is a combined altalgic and Vendelenburg gait. Some may have stiffness, which the loss of rotation, internal rotation is the first sign and abduction. And then the leg, limb length discrepancy because of the hip adduction contracture can exacerbate the discrepancy. For the imaging, the most commonly used is the pelvis AP and frog leg view. However, other investigations such as MRI is of, er, is of very much importance for early diagnosis to detect degree of extrusion and uncoverage. Perfusion and diffusion MRI is also used in some hospitals. Arthrogram is best investigation for hinge abduction, hip congruity assessment, and when there is doubt in terms of containment uh, 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 plan. And therefore, some other imaging is ultrasound, CT scan, and bone scan. However, during the past uh, 110 years, even at this present day and age, it remains to be poorly understood and there's no consensus in terms of prevention and treatment among all pediatric orthopedic surgeons. So the problem is a lot of doctors miss. Some of these cases do not present until the last phase, and although radiologic signs are very visible, symptoms are not apparent. The parents neglect because these require periodic clinical and radiographic follow-up until completion of the disease process. However, often than not, they neglect for follow-up because the child looks fine anyway. Patients ignore because Activity restriction or use of protected weight bearing, such as walkers and crutches are poorly compliant. So here in this diagram, you can see the bone necrosis that follows the vascular occlusion, the triggers changes in the soft tissue and bone of the hip joint. The necrosis uh, or the, the necrotic official bone is eventually restored and replaced with a new bone, leading to alteration of mechanical properties, which is the flattening and enlarging of the bone. So extrusion appears to be the prime factor that predisposes to femoral head deformity and more than 20% of the width that extrudes outside the acetabulum can cause irreversible femoral head deformation and is inevitable. So in order to use different classifications, as I mentioned, you have to understand the different stages of Pertis disease. So the modified Elizabethtown classification is a modification of the will uh, original Wildenstrom classification, useful in determining the stage of disease. The stage 1A sclerosis of the epiphysis with no loss of height. The sclerosis of the epiphysis with loss of height but no fragmentation is stage 1B. So for the stage 2A, there is a, an early fragmentation with just one or two fissures. However, with advanced fragmentation, it's stage 2B but no new bone lateral to the fragmented epiphysis. For the stage 3A, there's early porotic new bone formation at the periphery covering less than a third of the epiphysis. However, for the stage 3B, there's new bone formation and covers more than a third of the epiphysis. And the last one is there is complete healing with no radiographically identifiable a vascular bone. So the main goal on LCPD treatment is to achieve a spherical femoral head and concentric joint at the conclusion of the disease process. And lastly, the principle of containment is of high value in reversing exclusion. This met classification is designed to appropriate a specific management with a specific goal. For an early stage, which is a stage of a vascularity, it is, the role is preventive surgery, which is to retain the sphericity and prevent greater trochanteric overgrowth. If there's anything we want to do right here, right now, this is this stage. For the late fragmentation to early reconstitution or reos reossification, 
we need to do remedial surgery, which is corrective surgery of the consequent altered shape. And then the late stage, which is the most controversial of all, so salvage surgery is very much effective to relieve the pain. For the decision-making key point, our main goal is to prevent deformity again and prevent secondary arthritis. Not everyone requires surgical intervention. So the type of treatment recommends is based on age, the med stage or the stage of disease, the severity of involvement, and the presence of extrusion in ROMs. The younger the child, the better the prognosis, okay? So the standard treatment options include symptomatic treatment and containment treatment. So this is what we are going to follow every time we, we encounter a Pertis disease. So for the conservative management, the non-operative treatment is still important in treating Pertis. Remember, do not just treat the image, treat the patient and decide based on the clinical symptoms. If the child over a period of time is deteriorating, losing range of motion, having more pain despite trial symptomatic treatment, then that's the time that you do containment surgery. Bed rest traction of about one to two weeks, improved range of motion through physical therapy and activity restriction is a must to prevent further damaging due to pressure load. So when do you do x-ray? It depends on the stage of the disease. If it is uh, usually identified in the stage of a vascularization or fragmentation, do a serial x-ray every two to three to four months. If we encounter it during the healing stage, every six months to about a year. So containment can be achieved by only by two different methods. The first involves the keeping the hip in abduction, internal rotation, or flexion using a petri cast. And this is usually combined with soft tissue release and maintained or in four weeks to six weeks times in some uh, uh, institution and then followed by physical therapy. Alternatively, surgical containment can be achieved through either virus producing femoral osteotomy with or without pelvic osteotomy. And the most common pelvic osteotomy that we use is shelf osteotomy and some does it the triples one. So the main goal is to reorient this acetabulum so that it covers the anterolateral portion of the femoral epiphysis. For the late treatment, in the late stage, we need to have a remedial surgery intervention. The problem we encounter is the progressive extrusion of the femoral head and the hinge abduction. Containing for extrusion have poor outcome and usually obtaining sphericity is 17 times less of performed late. Whenever you see a hinge abduction, whether plain or radiograph or just a dye orthogram, do not do varus osteotomy. Instead, uh, the recommendation is to redirect the unhinged part via valgus osteotomy and most often than not accompanied with shelf and tiare acetabuloplasty in some hospitals. Salvage surgery is pretty much an area of controversy to a lot of us because some believe that you don't anymore touch the hip once in a very late stage because chances are the results are very poor anyway. However, there are those who are highly competent to do salvage surgery in some parts of the world, especially there in India. So the outcome is prognosis is judged by the risk of long-term arthritis, which is correlated to the Stalberg classification. The goal is to contain the hip, maintain the roundness, and keep it mobile. The better the outcome is between class one and class two. So some will achieve spontaneous resolution, some will require containment surgery, and some will not achieve success no matter what. So the challenge is there is still no robust evidence regarding the most effective non-surgical or surgical intervention. And future research, especially employing randomized controlled trials, very much welcome in, in this uh, very controversial topic. And in some uh, uh, lit recent lit literature, the future hope is uh, the, uh, the, the application of, or, or the uh, uh, surgery using multiple drilling method and, and the application is postponed. But it should be done early during the stage of a vascularity. Stay inside, stay safe. Stay inside your home, you stay safe. So treat the patient, not the range of graph. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nesti. Now I would like Dr. Amna Baljun to take over the matters and call the next speaker. Thank you. Over to I you, Dr. To Amna. I thank you very much. I would like to welcome Dr. Ankita Bansal in presenting the Elbow Trash Legions from India. Dr. Ankita. OK. 
okay thank you apoa and ysf for this opportunity i will be presenting on crash legion's elbow i would like to acknowledge all my teachers who have helped me reach this stage and a special thanks to dr sandeep padya for his precious time and the cases that he has given me for this presentation i have no relevant disclaimers or disclosures this is a normal pediatric elbow and it is very different from an adult elbow with a lot of unossified centers and a lot of unossified bone that we can't see yet it is easy to identify and treat a supracondylar humerus fracture and a radial head fracture but what about when you have an fracture that you were even doubtful whether is a fracture or an x ray that is often misdiagnosed as an elbow dislocation these are the elbow trash or the radiographic appearance seemed harmless lesions they are predominantly osteochondral injuries with in children less than 10 years of age with the radiographs often misdiagnosed as a normal elbow and dire consequences if left untreated what's included in these injuries are unossified medial condylar humerus fractures unossified transpartial distal humerus fractures entrapped medial epicondylar fractures complex osteochondral elbow fracture dislocations below the age of 10 years osteochondral fractures with joint incongruity radial head anterior compression fractures with progressive radiocapillar subluxation montegia fracture dislocations and lateral condylar avulsion shear fractures let's talk about an injury example in a 12 year old male with plain swelling restricted range of motion on the elbow with tenderness over the lateral aspect the patient was immobilized in a slab he was lost to follow up then presented directly after one month with stiffness four month later had persistent pain and stiffness of the elbow a ct scan and an mri was done which showed a capitulum shear fracture with denudation of the capitulum looking retrospectively at the injury films we see a lateral bony fleck which was mostly the lesion which was the lesion arthrolysis and radial head excision was done with intraarticular fibrosis with a friable cartilaginous loose body that was found approximately 1 cm chondral ulcer on the capitulum was found and the radial head was degenerated so capitular fractures in children and adolescents are a rare injury which have been classified by murthy et al into type 1a which is an anterior undisplaced shear fracture which can be conserved a type 1b which is a displaced anterior shear which requires orif type 2a which is an undisplaced posterior lateral shear that can be conserved a 2b which is a displaced posterior lateral shear which is requires an orif and a type 3 that is an acute osteochondral shear fracture that requires orif another injury example of an 11 year old boy with trauma to the right elbow now this child has a right fracture of the radial head which is intraarticular in nature and an mri showed a mild posterior radiocapitular subluxation with an intraarticular radial head fracture through a cocker's approach open reduction internal fixation with a single headless screw was done and annular the torn annular ligament was sutured it is operative treatment is recommended in patients with intraarticular radial head fractures and the reason for this is because such injuries have a high risk of radiocapitular joint instability progressive posterior subluxation and radiocapitular arthrosis an injury example of a 14 year old male with a right elbow dislocation which was put in a slab at 3 weeks he has presented with an ulnar nerve palsy and a stiff and painful elbow contralateral or comparative x rays of the opposite side have shown a missed medial epicondyle which was found to be incarcerated within the joint on an mri through the posterior medial approach an ulnar nerve transposition as well as fixation of the medial epicondyle was done and the patient had a full recovery of the ulnar nerve palsy so diagnosing a medial epicondyle fracture with more than 5 mm displacement a distal humeral axial view is definitely more accurate than just a plain ap and a lateral an injury example in a 6 year old boy with severe pain swelling right elbow which was immobilized for 6 weeks and presented at 6 weeks with a stiff elbow and a 4 month follow up presented as a persistent elbow stiffness a comparative x ray of the opposite side shows a missing medial epicondyle but 
this was not a medial epic condyle but a medial condylar fracture which had dislocated and now was ossified so classification of the medial condylar injuries are according to type 1 2 and 3 in which type 1 is that which does not violate the joint and can be conserved type 2 are intraarticular fractures with less than 2 mm displacement requires an orif and type 3 also require orif so how to avoid missing a trash lesion pay attention to the history and perform a good clinical evaluation these generally have a history of a high energy trauma in a young patient with more swelling than expected on the radiograph with range of motion restricted and may or may not have a bony crepitus good radiographs with the posterior lateral internal oblique and external oblique if needed do comparative x rays of the opposite side pay attention to the ossification centers and look at your radiological parameters so capitulum at 1 year radial head appears at 3 years the medial epicondyle at 5 years the trochlea at 7 years the olecranon at 9 years and the lateral epicondyle at 1 year 11 years the timing can be variable but the order is reliable so this x ray was misdiagnosed as a trochlea fracture but you see a capitulum a radial head no internal epicondyle and you cannot see a trochlea without seeing an internal epicondyle remember the order is reliable pay attention to the lines anterior humeral line the radio capitular line the bowman's angle do advanced investigations wherever necessary a sonography is a good investigation that avoids sedation or anesthesia but is operator dependent a ct scan gives a good look into the bony continuity an mri delineates the soft tissue and your articular and the osteochondral injuries better but requires anesthesia or sedation in very young patients and an arthrogram is a good adjunct to these investigations or can be the whole and soul additional investigation when a ct mri or a usg is not possible take serial follow ups do serial follow ups repeat your x rays without plaster in such children and remember a child without a fracture tends to improve after one week of plaster so take home message to avoid missing your trash lesions are have a high index of suspicion do a good clinical examination radiographs pay attention to your ossification your alignment and take contralateral x rays if needed for comparison do advanced imaging wherever necessary in the form of uhd ct mri or an arthrogram and serial follow ups thank you thank you dr bansal for the great presentation Um, now I would like to welcome my co-moderator, Dr. Um, Rashid Anjum, to present lengthening in congenital posterior medial bowing of the tibia. Thank you, Amna. Is my screen visible? I know. Rashid, yes, ma'am. I'm just uh, sharing it. Can we see us? Yeah, please. Okay. okay. Is it sharing now, ma'am? Yes, yes, yes. Go on. Thank, thank you, thank you. So I would be talking on the lengthening in congenital posterior medial bowing after tibia. So at the outset, I first like to thank uh, Professor Ashok Jhari, my mentor and guide in the fellowship. Also, More, uh, all the cases and study is uh, Dr. Ashok Jhari. so introduce introducing so congenital posterior medial bowing of tibia is a, a rare usually self resolving condition which was first described by hemen in 1949 it is uh, clinically characterized by a posterior and medial bow of the tibia and fibula along with the clinical calcaneo valgus deformity of the foot and there can be associated shortening there is no association with any other skeletal or visceral abnormalities however intrusion of tibia calf twisting and foot hypoplasia can be present and there are different theories of the uh, this causation of the posterior medial bowing but none is uh, superior to others and there is no consensus on its uh, 
origin. The frequently associated it is with four to seven centimeter of LLD close to the skeletal maturity. So why we did this study? Actually, there are no well-defined guidelines regarding the selection of patients, the timing of limb equalization surgery, early versus or late intervention, complication and long-term follow-up of such patients. So this was a single center, single surgeon series, so retrospective in nature, over, spread over a period of 27 years. We took a standard anterior, posterior, and lateral radiographs of the leg to quantify the deformity and uh, scanogram to assess the limb length discrepancy. Clinical and operative detail of all the patients underwent lengthening were present for analysis. And uh, we had a total of 70 patients until 2018, of which 39 were males and 31 females. All the patients were initially treated uh, non-operatively and were kept under observation of which uh, 20, almost 20 patients required surgical procedures. There were a total of 18 limb lengthening episodes in 17 patients, of which 10 were males and seven were females. We divided these patients into early intervention groups, those who got operated before 10 years of age, and late intervention who was operated after 10 years of the age. The mean age at lengthening was 10.61 years. So this is a comparative analysis between the early intervention group in the late intervention group. If you look at the surgery, the mean age in the early intervention was 4.89 years, and there were eight cases of lending. And in the late intervention, it was 13.58 years and with 10 lending procedures. The mean preoperative limb length discrepancy was 4.96 centimeters in the early intervention group and 5.14 in the later. However, what is important to look in this is the preoperative deformity. When we compared it with the late intervention group, we observed that over a period of time, though the regression is gradual, but still the deformity gradually regresses. And in the late intervention group, it was only the length that was the issue and not the other way around. So there was no statistically significant difference in the deformity in conservatively or operatively treated patients, but there was a significant difference in the limb length discrepancy. The mean bone healing index was uh, 54.6 days in our uh, study, which was 49 for the early lengthening and 58.95 for the late group. So coming to some case examples, this is a case of a three-year-old male with a left congenital posterior medial bowing of the tibia with a shortening of 4.8 centimeter to begin with. We operated this patient with a double osteotomy and Eliza Rose fixation. And the X-ray on the right shows the follow-up at 10 years of the age, and there is some ankle vulgus of almost nine degrees. It was asymptomatic and under observation only. This is his uh, scanogram at 12 years of age with a, again a limb length discrepancy of 2.1 centimeter on the left side, for which a contralateral hemiapophysic disease was planned. And on the last follow-up, he was having a shortening of 0.5 centimeter, and we are planning to take off now the feet. So these are the clinical page pictures showing good uh, alignment and range of motion. He had uh, postoperatively an ankle uh, dorsal, uh, equinus of uh, five degrees that was treated by uh, physiotherapy alone. And uh, the range of motion was uh, well received. The ankle dorsiflexion range improved to 10 to 15 degrees. This is another case of late intervention group, 16 years old male. He had been previously operated at uh, 45 months of the age. At that time, the shortening was 6.5 centimeters. So for this uh, new episode of lengthening, he had a three centimeter shortening and osteotomy and fixation with LRS was planned and done. And if you can see, there was slight bulges of the distracting segments, but uh, it united well in four months follow-up, limb is well aligned. And these were the latest X-rays after the removal of the fixators. The patient was clinically well oriented. However, the lengthening in congenital posterior medial bowing is not a straightforward lengthening, and we encounter complication in almost all of our patients. We divided the complication into problem, obstacles, and complications as uh, uh, to, uh, to present the data. So problems included superficial pin tract infections, equinus of zero to five degrees that was treated by physiotherapy alone, uh, atrophic regenerate, and one transient CPN palsy. The obstacles, uh, we had bulgous malalignment of the distracting fragments in eight patients, and five of which required a fixator realignment under GA. We had equinus of five to 15 degrees in four patients, and pin loosening in another eight. So coming to true complications, we had ankle algus, vulgus in eight patients, of which three required a medial malular hemiapophysis disease after the completion of the lengthening. 
we had fractured through re regenerate in three patients and fibular non-union in one that was asymptomatic and not dealt with. So coming to a brief literature review, the posterior medial bowing of the tibia, there is significantly higher rates of the recurrence in LLD com uh, compared to uh, undergoing lengthening under the age of 10 years group in the early. This was a study by Wright et al. And they uh, also pointed out that the greatest correction of the deformity occurred in the first year of life, but after the age of four, the remodeling was limited. Again, this is a study by Ashok Jori sir and Aleri Karuji sir at all from our center only. They had presented the result of early lengthening in six patients and advocated to delay and perform a one stage lengthening and correction of the residual deformity closer to skeletal maturity to avoid a repeat lengthening procedure. Again, a study by Kaufman et al. with 11 patients undergoing the lengthening, he observed complications in seven of the 11 patients and the mean follow-up LLD was 0.6 centimeter. So this was the latest review from uh, Journal of Children's Orthopedics by Gordon et al. And uh, in their study of 16 lengthenings, they finally concluded that in spite of the correction of distal tibial shaft vulgus in 11 of the 16 patients, that is almost 50% of them required a lateral correction for persistent symptomatic angle vulgus. The deformity, uh, the ankle vulgus was symptomatic and almost 50% of those required a treatment like hemiapodesis or an osteotomy in one patient. So to conclude, I, uh, this is the largest case series of congenital posterior medial bowing of uh, tibia patients and with lengthening in the 18 uh, patients and the final outcome was satisfactory with a mean LLT of 0.31 centimeters. The lengthening in congenital posterior medial bowing is challenging and frequently associated with complications. The commonest being ankle vulgus, which is underreported in literature, and malalignment of distracting fragments that can be reduced by using a circular frame, putting three or more screws in each fragment while using a monolateral frame. And we recommend and adhere to our earlier uh, recommendations to defer the surgery for lengthening and deformity correction to a later stage close to skeletal maturity as a one stage surgical procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very thorough but uh, excellent presentation. Uh, last but not least, I would like to welcome Dr. Aisha Saeed from Pakistan, where she's going to lead the case discussion about DDH. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Uh, not yet. Okay, can you see yes. now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation, especially to Dr. Jamal Ashraf, Dr. Raja Bhaskar, and Dr. Rashid Anjum. Uh, so as Dr. Rashid mentioned, uh, also for me, there are many, uh, all these leading pediatric orthopedic surgeons like Dr. Ashok Jori, Dr. Uh, uh, Taral Nagda, and uh, Dr. Mehta herself are also distant teachers to many of uh, the young aspiring pediatric orthopedic surgeons in Pakistan. Uh, I work in uh, Children's Hospital Faisalabad as assistant professor. Uh, this is um, uh, a new aspiring children's hospital. Uh, Faisalabad is a city which uh, actually most of uh, people uh, abroad know Lahore more in Pakistan uh, other than, uh, so this, is, this city is actually a neighboring city of Lahore, just 200 kilometers. And uh, it's, it's the th third largest city of uh, Pakistan, which means uh, working in a public care, tertiary care hospital, I get to see a lot of it. Um, so as um, earlier, Dr. Yavuz was uh, mentioning about uh, the importance of early presentation and early management. Unfortunately, in uh, this part of the world, we get to see a lot of neglected cases, which means that cases uh, like the one I'm projecting are actually a routine presentation in my outpatient. Uh, so routinely, uh, DDH is diagnosed uh, late, very late, uh, almost when uh, children they start uh, uh, walking. So when they present to us uh, already, uh, there is no chance of getting close reduction for them. And uh, 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 my usual approach for them uh, is um, an open reduction, uh, adding uh, a pelvic osteotomy, and then depending upon the age of presentation, a femoral shortening has to be added. Uh, the usual approach for these patients um, in my center um, is uh, the interior approach, the Somerville approach, and the bikini incision, uh, where we first identify the interval, identify the nerve, and then uh, uh, raise a flap of the sartorius and muscles. 
uh, then we split the epiphysis. And after that, uh, a great emphasis is put on a complete and utmost dissection of uh, the hip capsule uh, from all around, especially the anterolateral part, uh, where actually uh, the redundant capsule is fixed uh, to uh, the inverted uh, labrum. Uh, and also, uh, medially, we make sure that we dissect and free the capsule as far as we can validate uh, the lesser trough of the femur. Uh, so um, uh, my whole emphasis uh, in the surgery is actually a good dissection of the capsule because uh, it is a good capsular rasty in the end, which uh, uh, keeps the hip uh, located and, and gives a good uh, uh, long-term outcome. So Dr. Yahoo has already mentioned about uh, removing the intra and extra articular uh, obstacles, uh, which are there in the surgery. Uh, uh, so uh, once uh, we have um, uh, done uh, uh, the reduction, um, uh, usually we take an image uh, uh, where we see uh, and compare uh, to the opposite side, the medial gap. Uh, so uh, a good reduction of the hip is where the medial gap is uh, comparable to the opposite side. And if you, of course, you don't have an opposite indicator, then this test is uh, uh, irrelevant. And also, um, uh, after I've made my capsular raffi, I uh, do a medial pull of the proximal femur. And in that way, uh, I make sure that the image taken before the medial pull and uh, uh, after the medial pull uh, I measure the gap, again, taking images uh, apart, and uh, I make sure that the gaps uh, are, um, uh, are not much uh, uh, between the two images. In this way, I'm sure that I've done a good capsule uh, So uh, uh, usually uh, the hip lies in the spica uh, for uh, between six to eight weeks, depending upon uh, how big is the child uh, and uh, that's usually the case. So this is uh, this is another case. Uh, uh, this child was three and a half years of age at presentation. Uh, so here, apart from the Salter osteotomy, I had to add uh, shortening of uh, the femur uh, to get a concentric hip reduction. Uh, and uh, you can appreciate here uh, that uh, the triradiate uh, the the proximal femoral uh, physis faces uh, the triradiate cartilage, and the medial gap is adequate, which is a good criteria. Uh, to assess how nicely the hip is uh, uh, sitting in that in its uh, in its true acetabulum. Uh, this is uh, the last follow-up of this child, and uh, you can appreciate that the acetabular index is uh, uh, brought as uh, good as to the normal side. Again, an example where the Salter osteotomy, uh, apart from the Salter osteotomy, a femoral shortening was added. Uh, usually um, in our practice and what I've learned from my um, immediate uh, seniors that we don't uh, actually add derotation because what we've seen is that adding uh, 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 too much of derotation actually promotes uh, dislocation uh, because uh, at one point we are bringing in uh, the acetabulum interiorly by making the salter. We are making, uh, we, we are bringing in the acetabular roof interiorly, and then if we add the derotation, then uh, at the same point, we are pushing uh, the proximal femoral uh, head posteriorly. So uh, uh, somehow that promotes uh, dislocation uh, uh, in the environment of an open reduction of the head. Um, and always and always, uh, we emphasize the importance of putting in a good head um, uh, So uh, since I work in a public sector hospital and resources are a big uh, thing here, so I do a hybrid kind of uh, uh, hip spica uh, where the um, uh, underneath layers are of gypsona and then we uh, use the flash cast uh, or the synthetic cast as the top layer. Uh, and uh, we make sure uh, that we have an adequate abduction and flexion and just a, a bit of internal rotation on the affected. You know, it's always, it's always a double hit. Uh, these are some few examples where I received the patients who were operated um, elsewhere and um, uh, the salter was good. Uh, in the post-op, uh, this is one year post-op of this uh, girl. Uh, she was uh, two, uh, uh, three years of age. So her shortening was done previously. Uh, however, the hip uh, uh, sh shortening and salter was done previously. However, the hip had reduced immediately when the child was uh, brought out of his spica. Uh, so I went in again and only I added in a good capsular raffi and that resulted in a stable hip post-operatively. 
Um, I've seen um, like uh, most of uh, the general orthopedic surgeons who attempt uh, DDH, uh, unfortunately, they rely a lot on K wires to keep uh, uh, the femoral head reduced, uh, which unfortunately is not a good um, uh, good thing to do as uh, soon as they remove the K wire, the hip is uh, dislocated again. Uh, so again, um, it, it, that emphasizes the point that we have to have a good capsular raffi. Uh, only just adding a good salter or a shortening uh, won't reduce the hip. You need to have a good dissection of the hip capsule from all around, especially at its um, uh, entrosuperior border and the medial border in order to uh, concentrically reduce it. Uh, uh, Dr. Yavuz mentioned that uh, perhaps after eight years of age, it's not a good idea uh, to uh, reduce uh, DDH. However, unfortunately, we still see patients uh, with uh, this problem. This uh, boy was uh, had a bilateral DDH uh, and he was uh, eight years of uh, age. And uh, this is just the, um, the image. I just have the immediate post-op x-rays of this child so far. I added a salter osteotomy and I had to add almost uh, uh, three centimeters of shortening to reduce this hip. Uh, so, um, um, what we have seen in our local um, experience uh, that uh, uh, even a salter osteotomy uh, and reducing the hip uh, uh, in ch older children uh, gives them gives them better outcomes than, than leaving them as such. Uh, and an interesting finding in this kid was uh, the presence of intact ligamentum teres. Uh, uh, I was not expecting uh, from the amount of dislocation you see on the initial x-rays, you don't expect the ligamentum series to grow this long. Uh, so this was an interesting finding in this case. Uh, this is um, a, a very interesting case. This child um, actually had multiple attempts for closed reduction. Uh, uh, the first x-ray is when uh, uh, the child was uh, five months of age and in the second x-ray, uh, this child was eight months of age. Uh, so both time, uh, close reduction, um, uh, arthrography, and uh, uh, hip spica was attempted. However, the hip was not able to reduce. And as Dr. Mehta mentioned, uh, this uh, medial uh, Ludloff approach um, uh, helped in this particular child, and we were able to reduce uh, the hip. Uh, ho however, I do see the need for uh, th this x-ray is when uh, the child was uh, 12 months of age. And now we will ask him uh, uh, to keep him in a close uh, follow-up because uh, there might be a need uh, to do an osteotomy to prevent a future uh, dislocation. Uh, actually, um, uh, I, uh, most of the cases of DDH that come to us, sometimes they get uh, um, uh, confused with the cases of post-septic hip dislocations. Both these cases are cases of post-septic hip dislocation. Uh, and uh, 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 so uh, I uh, place these x-rays just to uh, give an idea that the, this uh, hip dislocation, it's very important to do thoroughly uh, investigate uh, the patients and of course thoroughly uh, know their history because uh, uh, it is likely that uh, uh, these uh, dislocations- Sorry to interrupt Dr. Aisha, your time is up. Can you just uh, brief it up? Okay, I'll, I'll just go to the last case because sure, I sure, wanted sure. an opinion. It's very interesting, but unfortunately, we are short on time. <laughs> so I can forget okay, that. Okay. So uh, this uh, um, girl, uh, uh, the first X-rays we see are the actually the virgin X-rays, uh, where she has a left hip dislocation. Her salt osteotomy capsulography shortening uh, was done. Unfortunately, uh, this is at two years of age. Uh, now, unfortunately, now when I saw her uh, at uh, uh, six years of age, uh, she uh, the hip has subluxed, and of course we see uh, AVN. And uh, um, if you do the Ogden classification, it is type three because the femoral head has a lack of longitudinal deficiency, uh, long, uh, has a deficiency of longitudinal growth as well as there is irregularity of the femoral head. So I just wanted to know from the steam panel, especially from Dr. Mehta, that at six years of age now, what we can offer her.
Okay, so thank you for your keen um, uh, listening. Uh, my key points and uh, from my experience from treating, teach, uh, from treating these children is that uh, uh, DDH has a long learning curve and uh, uh, the key point is that um, only uh, uh, experienced pediatric orthopedic surgeons uh, should be treating it, uh, especially uh, when the neglected uh, uh, cases, uh, they turn up. Uh, you need, uh, you expect radiation, and that's why uh, where the experience uh, gives you help, and you always examine the child as a whole. Uh, and uh, of course, um, you can't uh, expect good outcome without a long term follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think we'd Thank like you. to. Thank you. Over to Rajuta, ma'am, I think. Uh, Rajuta, ma'am, yes. to. Yes, that's been a very, very nice. Yeah, it's been a very, very nice uh, amalgamation of uh, good topics from different regions. I am so happy to see the kind of proficiency almost all speakers have displayed and shows your deep involvement. And I think it's very heartening to see that pediatric orthopedics is really going from strength to strength across the globe. I think the Asia-Pacific region can be really a good leader in terms of uh, bringing out good literature, especially because probably the West and some of the European countries hardly see late cases. So I think that's where all of us really need to come together and collaborate a little more. And um, uh, just very two, three quick questions for the panelists who've uh, you know, had their talks before. Nesty, uh, can you can I ask everyone to switch on their uh, videos and be on the panel so that one we can get a screenshot and then we can give everybody a chance to answer it. So, Dr. Nesty, yes, ma'am, can you come on, please? Yes. So, are you aware of uh, the kind of work that has been there uh, from Dr. Benjamin Joseph as regards Perthes? Yeah, yes, Pam, in terms of the recent approach with regards to the, to the containment surgery, yes, I am aware of that. So what, do, you, do you agree with him? Do you think that at least uh, in some parts of India, he seems to say that in our country, Perthes presents a little later than in Western literature. So have you all seen any that kind of uh, incidents or variations uh, as far as the Asia Pacific region is concerned? Yes, the trend right away because, because previously, as we as we study about the epidemiology, we see this per disease in the Scandinavian country, where it is uh, it is a pertinent to high altitude, and basically it's more commonly involved with the pressure in the load bearing. However, the 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 etiology has been more like uh, in the environmental factor, specifically the the smoking, which is uh, related to the, the tissue plasmidogen act activator, which perhaps that's the reason why a lot of kids who are exposed, especially in the rural poor, especially older ones, are more exposed to these kinds of thrombotic factor uh, event in their hips. So I really believe that the trend right away, right, right now is becoming more and more older children. We see more perties. And a lot of these, of course, uh, you see that the, the, the chronologic age does not conform to the bone age. You know, 80 to 90% of the chronologic age does not conform. A lot of them is two to three years delayed. And therefore, you will see really more older children. But if you will have a lot of studies in terms of comparing the bone age and the chronolo chronologic age, uh, we can have a more um, uh, objective findings in terms of really looking what kind of age gap we are looking forward for for this disease. Very good. A uh, question for Ankita. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, hi. So if you had to choose one single investigation when you're suspecting a child with a trash lesion uh, in your OPD, can you hear uh, me? Ma'am, could, ma could you please repeat the question? If you had to choose one investigation in the OPD when you're suspecting a child with a trash lesion, what would it be? 
So in the OPD, if I'm suspecting a child with a trash lesion, I would prefer to get the contralateral x-rays done of the part for comparison because that would be the easiest way, one, to identify if I'm missing out on ossification centers, to look at the alignment and to correlate whether the, what I'm seeing is normal or abnormal. So I think I would go for a contralateral x-ray in the OPD to an additional x-ray that I would be doing for the patient. That's right. Yes, Ankita, I have just one more point to you that you mentioned the uh, UST without a sedation in acute trauma settings. So actually in a kid that is very difficult and practically not possible to get a UST because you have to push the probe on that segment. I think it's still better to get an MRI with MRI. Under sedation than a UST in that setting. Anyways, thanks. So, and a question for Rashid, of course, absolutely beautiful long-term follow-up and papers. Uh, if you were to, uh, you know, kind of say as compared to CBT, so with uh, nowadays there are very good results of union. One, ma'am, your voice is breaking. I'm not able to think to of lengthening. Uh, as compared to CBT, congenital pseudarthrosis of tibia. Is it easier to lengthen yes, congenital posterior medial bowing? And what are the advantages? Ma'am, in congenital posterior medial, the best thing is that the biology is okay. So we don't have to worry about the union or lengthening compared to pseudarthrosis of tibia, where the issue is of the uh, union there. First we have to achieve it and then into lengthen. But the issue is that it's not a straightforward lengthening. As I mentioned, that the ankle vulgus and distracting of the uh, this fragment is not much discussed in the literature. And there are certain other uh, compensatory things also, like in ankle valgus, we see a compensatory hind foot virus. And sometimes people do correct with the distal tibia that valgus is corrected, that they unmask that deformity of the hind foot also, the virus that needs later connection, if it has been a rigid deformity. So it's not a straightforward lengthening, but if you compare with foot arthrosis, definitely CPMB is still good. I would choose a CPMB. <laughs> And a question about the Botox to treat the residual equinus. Yes. Uh, how would you justify the rationale of using it in a non-spastic muscle? Ma'am, in actually it's the cast that is working, not the Botox. Maybe it just makes the child pain-free and that thing. Actually, the cast that works because we apply it under GA. So we can stretch it out and the cast is the actual thing that is working. Botox like that on this in uh, zero to five degrees and later we don't do it. Thank you. And we go on to Aisha. Uh, again, large uh, variety of DDH cases. Can you give the audience a quick tip as in which cases will you prefer to shorten? And the second thing is, do you always use a salter or there are specific situations where you will use a DEGA? Um, actually, um, uh, uh, I couldn't hear the full question, the first part of the question. When will you shorten? I will shorten. Uh, so, um, uh, usually, what the literature suggests uh, is um, uh, um, there are uh, various ways to measure it. Like, you can uh, measure uh, amount of shortening that is needed from the x rays uh, or uh, preempt it uh, from the tonus grading. Uh, but usually per operatively uh, in the borderline age group between the two to three years of age where you're not really sure if you'll need a shortening, what I do is I do a per operative, operative telescoping on the table. So if after reduction, I feel that a hip is uh, concentrically reduced and, I, uh, and upon uh, telescoping the hip, there is some space uh, uh, still there and uh, I'm sure that it's not a very tight uh, situation. Uh, then I don't uh, need a shortening in that case. Uh, and for the second question, um, uh, since I'm mostly trained in Salter, uh, so I prefer to do it. Uh, but of course, uh, in cases where you need more enterolateral coverage, uh, 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 people do do Dega osteotomy. But uh, it's my comfort zone, so uh, that's why uh, perhaps I do more Salter. Okay. So very, very, very nice expose, all of you. And congratulations and thank you, Jamal, for uh, getting me involved with this group at the last moment. I'm trying to look like James, but that's a little difficult. But I hope I've been able to fill in his shoes. 
and he's a dear friend and it was absolute pleasure to see all you women and men all diversity and doing so well over to you rashid and uh, the you. wonderful um amna thank you thank you ma'am thank you thank you thank you ma'am so i would like to thank all the participants chairpersons and my co moderator for this wonderful session uh, although we gave the, the name to orthopedic skill we are on the last session the pediatrics was <laughs> but still it was wonderful one thank you everyone to make the log of now i would like to hand over again to uh, dr raja baskar to continue the proceeding raja are you there yeah i am there thank you rashid yeah thank you please take over the so, thank you rashid and uh, uh, it was a great pediatric session and special thanks to rujuta madam it was always nice to see madam madam is always so enthusiastic and she has a great passion for teaching and it was as madam said it was such a diverse session different parts of the globe and also a lot of uh, a perfect mix of men and wonderful surgeons from uh, involving women i think it's that is how the future is going to be and thank you so much madam thank you all speakers thank you madam and congratulations to you and tanay very very well done thank you so much madam thank you so much madam thank you so so uh now we move on to the last session of uh this two day virtual congress i would like to invite all our panelists for the collaborative session on research uh can i um, invite dr sunil dr octavio dr elisa dr yavuz Dr. Aiza and Dr. Samarth, could all of you put uh, on your screens, please? We can see all of you. Hello. Good evening, Dr. Raja Vashka. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aiza, for joining. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Yavuz. Thank you, Sunil. and uh, thank you octavian uh thank you margaret also margaret thank you so much it's i know it's getting quite late in hong kong but thank you so much for joining us first of all i'd like to apologize to all of you that we are running about 40 minutes late because of the previous sessions and it is so nice that all of you have still stayed up and you know i'm sure this session though we are starting late we will our entire uh, thing this will be the ideal platform for us to go on for research and at the outset i would really like to thank the apoa and especially dr jamal sir because when i proposed to him this idea of this round table session for research he had no thoughts and immediately he agreed for it and i am so happy that we are going ahead with this and for the next 35 minutes or so we will have a good discussion and i welcome all of you and as we know this is a collaborative session involving members of the apoa the secot and efort also and let us go into the session we have seven panelists here all of us will be include involved and all of us will be giving our ideas on collaborative projects so these are our panelists who are really experienced who are really keen on research and really have a passion for uh, involving together so dr elisa and dr yavuz are from efort and from the european federation dr margaret myself and dr samarth we will be representing apoa and my dear friend sunil and octave from switzerland we will they will be representing sicot so it's a wide conglomeration of varied aspects of surgeons and i'm sure we will have a very good session so let me start off with our session will be like for the next 5 minutes i will be talking about where we are in research and for the next 20 minutes we will have a group discussion on what are the ideal ways to go forward and what are the main factors which hinder research and the last 15 minutes we'll be thinking on future projects so by 35 minutes we should be done with this session so today where we are with research exactly so this is a screenshot from the clinical orthopedics and related research journal so if we have a close look we see that there are 82 high impact orthopedic journals or the really high impact come to only about 7 or 8 but across 
specialties, including the subspecialties, there are 82 orthopedic journals and there are 210 surgical journals. Now, this graph has really gone up in the past 15 years. So, on an average, there are 12,000 publications happening every year in orthopedics, and the number is just going to go up. So, to summarize that, you know, research, especially in a clinical practice of a young surgeon or a young medico, irrespective of their speciality, more than a necessity, it is a way of life, especially in a medical career. If you have to be counted, you have to be a good researcher. So how has it evolved? So this cartoon on the evolution of research, you know, initially we had to publish and then there was this phenomenon of publish or perish. And then now if we see, you know, you have to, pub there are so many journals which have come. So people started saying that only if you publish in a very high impact journal or you perish and now you have to frequently publish in high journals, especially if you are in a Western world where you have to be counted on various aspects. So the whole aspect of research has now moved that today it is very essential for us even to get our thought process right. So the magnitude of research, how much is it today? Like, you know, one hour back when I just went to PubMed and typed COVID-19, it's staggering. Over the past 11 and a half months, there have been 1,12,486 publications in recognized journals in the whole world. So this is in the past 11 and a half months in PubMed. This is actually much, much more than topics like ACL or TKR. Now, of course, it's a global phenomenon. So all of us know out of these 1,12,000 publications, you know, only about less than 1,000 will make exact amount of defining clinical practice. So this number exactly shows that, you know, the whole world, young researchers, young students across speciality, they value research and we have to do research. So apart from being a clinician or a surgeon, the most important thing is the concept of a surgeon scientist, where you have to do good clinical practice and also do appropriate amount of research to keep yourself counted and also thereby teach the world and also contribute something to science. So even though there are many projects, I think the future is going to be a proper, well-planned research project and involving collaborative work across multiple specialities and also across young surgeons across different parts of the globe. So if, even in the spine session today, I was just seeing, and you know, in one of the talks, which I, this is a screenshot taken from one of the talks and especially from the surgeon from Australia, you see, there, all his, all the slides he was showing, he only showed collaborative studies. You have to have multi-center and only then, even literatures, even in subspeciality, people value it very high. So collaborative, multi-center, multi-group involvement is the way forward. And I think young surgeons, we can really show the way and we can take this as a very good platform to show good evidence and also do proper structured research now we shall go to the group discussion if all of you can unmute yourselves and as we had discussed so we will have specific things of and i would like to all of you to contribute two minutes each we shall start with yawus so yawus i would like your thoughts on how valuable do you think is research in a young surgeon's practice and career in today's time? Raja, thank you again having me in this uh, group discussion. Actually, I took some brief notes what illustrates a scientific or a researcher uh, for myself. The establishment of a successful career requires a planning that begins in residency, I guess, and a careful decision making along the way with clear focus on goals. So although a decreasing number of surgeons choose to augment their practice with research, there is a clear agreement on the, the endeavor at value to current knowledge. So given the increasing pressure on a surgeon to, to produce vulnerable work, how can a busy orthopedic surgeon develop and maintain a research program? So for this purpose, and for the simplicity, I will try to give you the headlines to build a research by eye maintaining a busy surgical practice. 
the successful academic surgeon often spent several years doing some forms of research doing, during the, the, the residency. So the, also the mentorship comes along with an experience like this that is the most vital to an individual's development as a researcher, I guess. So the mentor teaches the critical skills that a surgeon will need. Secondly, it is very important to spread, to spend a significant time reading the literature, to learn about the new research trends, and more concentrated fellowships on a research topic would also be beneficial in my opinion. So this is very important for a researcher to mirror his or her practice to the others, especially abroad. The next obstacle is to find the right thing, the right subject, then find and spend enough time to, to, to evaluate it. Make collaborative research with your peers and get industry involved in the studies. In summary, in my perspective, having a productive research program and a, a becoming a productive researcher uh, at, at the, the same time as being a busy academician at the, at the same time, a busy surgeon is possible but requires successful planning and timing. Yes. And you know your points were very well taken, and you know as you said, it's very essential for us, for a young surgeon to do research. Now I'll move to the next question, and our next panelist, Samar Mittal, who is an assistant professor in the All India Institute, the Apex Medical Institute in India. So the question to you, Samar, is: In 2021, publish or perish? Do you think it's still true? What do you think is your opinion on it? Thank you, Raja. And thanks to APO and Dr. Jamal for giving me this opportunity. And I agree with whatever uh, Dr. Yavuz has said uh, till now. So I think the major thing that uh, different, uh, the, the major difference between us uh, humans and the all the other animal species is that we learn from our own mistakes as well as the mistakes of others. And unless uh, we know what the others are doing, what they are doing right and what they are right, doing wrong. Unless they publish that data, it is difficult for someone sitting in another corner of the world and maybe just next door to know what is the right practice and what is not the right practice. And in this era of evidence-based medicine, unless we have uh, some evidence which is published, it is very difficult to follow medicine because a lot of practices that were do we were doing in the past have now gone into disrepute just because there is evidence against them or something that we thought would not be helpful is now coming into the picture because just because of the reason we have evidence for it. So, and I think uh, it is a very important aspect for a young surgeons to have a academic uh, outset with them to publish a lot, but then not to an extent that uh, uh, these days I see, uh, uh, I, I think the trend all over the world is most of the jobs, most of the academic careers, most of the research grants and promotions of uh, people and academic posts are dependent upon the number of publications that they have, which uh, is not exactly the right thing in my view, because uh, what that does is it gi gives uh, rise to a lot of uh, wrong practices such as uh, uh, coercive authorship, uh, guest authorship, uh, uh, gift authorship, or something like ghost authorship. And uh, also it uh, uh, gives scope to uh, predatory journals to come into the picture. So I think, uh, uh, yes, publishing is very, very important. But then, uh, and it is in 2021, yes, publishing is very important, but not at the cost of uh, uh, breaking the uh, barriers that uh, uh, the International Committee of uh, General Medical Ed uh, Editors have put in. Um, all those things, uh, ethical, good publish, ethical, good evidence is very, very good and uh, much needed in 2021. Without that, there is no way we can go ahead. And uh, I'm, I agree with you that it all has to be collaborative and multi-centric uh, to get good evidence. Yeah, thank you so much, Samarth. I think those points which you said were really uh, effective and it has a lot of value that you need to do proper studies, but not at the expense of, and that is the reason why I agree that a lot of predatory journals have come in today because so many people want to submit and also submit their poor quality work, which can be detrimental. Thank you, Samarth. So the next, I would like to invite Elisa from Italy. Thank you so much for joining us. So I would like your opinion on how research has influenced your clinical practice 
in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. Can you hear us, Elisa? I'm afraid uh, she's not online. No, she is there, her Elisa. Okay, so I think till we get her connected, I'll move to the. So I would like to involve our next uh, panelist, Aiza from Malaysia. So Aiza, in your opinion, you're a young surgeon and you have come through the entire process. What do you think are the hindrances in, to research in a young surgeon's career? Hi, thank you, Dr. Raja. Yeah. Well, actually, I think that's um, quite, I mean, it's, it's very multifactorial. A lot of things that uh, come to hinder research in a surgeon's career. Um, I mean, mainly there are extrinsic and also intrinsic factors. Intrinsic, maybe the surgeon's desire to conduct research is not there. Maybe there are many other things that are more important for a surgeon, maybe a career development in uh, progression, fellowship training, um, subspecialty training. So all these things will take up all the time and uh, um, might find that they have uh, difficult to balance uh, research into the picture. And um, sometimes uh, it, it depends also what our research you're looking at, um, whether you're doing basic science or a clinical type of research. So in for basic science research, I mean, you need the facilities, you really need the support and actually it takes quite a lot of funding as well. And uh, funding can be a major hindrance for a young surgeon. I mean, if you are in a public, I mean, if you're in a university setting, maybe you're more, um, you can have more access to grants or maybe your seniors or your professors, they um, have uh, grants that can help you with uh, basic science research. But if you're working in a public university, then that's gonna be quite tough as well as you don't, you don't have the means, you don't have the facilities as well. Yeah. So I think, you know, Thank you, Isa. I think those two points which you mentioned of desire, that's the primary and fundamental thing. Yeah. And also the funding, you know, I think that is also a very important point. Your points are very well taken. Thank you. I think Thank Elisa you. has joined us. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Elisa, yes. can you... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Thank you, Elisa. Yes, I'm sorry I have some trouble with the connection. No problem. Elisa has joined us from Italy. I just wanted your thoughts for the next two minutes on how you think research has influenced your clinical practice, like your day-to-day -day practice? Yeah, Elisa, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, so you uh, can, yeah, you can talk. Yes, the research is one of the most important things in our practice. Since I was a medical student at uh, Rizzoli, I started joining uh, clinical practice and uh, research. And uh, one of our mentors, Professor Campanacci, always says that uh, who study is uh, uh, improving himself, and also improving himself is better also in clinical practice. So when we have uh, a patient, we are always to, to join the study and the research with the clinical practice because uh, the patient is uh, the final point uh, of uh, our work but uh, for him uh, the better thing is that we uh, that we study and that we improve uh, the research so the research has always to influence uh, the the practice um, publish a lot of paper is uh, a, a crucial point uh, for us and uh, I think that uh, during my career I publish a lot of paper and uh, uh, publish them I can uh, meet uh, pa patient and then I meet uh, a colleague from all over the world and uh, this also improve a lot my practice improve my clinical research so um, publish is uh, a crucial point also for the clinical practice and we have always to join uh, them. Yeah, thank you so much Elisa. I think your point is very important and especially as you mentioned Professor Campanacci, I think you know it really influences your practice and only if you have that 
mentality of doing research will you be able to imbibe research and other it practices? Is Your the, the final point that we uh... yes so we'll move on and isa has already so next i would like to invite uh, margaret margaret is our co-panelist who is from hong kong and just to know margaret has done a lot of research she's one on the editorial board of even the journal of orthopedic surgery she also won the sicot research academy award for her research on distal radius fractures i think it was in cape town so margaret yeah. can you tell you know how do you think young surgeons like especially since you've already proved it you got research and you have awards how young surgeons can make a difference in research thank you ajay and thank you um thank you for having me so i think young surgeons can make difference in research in two different ways first is by assisting in establish a project and second is by doing their own research so initially when you start off as a um a young surgeon you think that oh this is mainly for the senior surgeons who do research and I would just do my study but actually um it is nice way to assist in establish um project and work with the seniors and and see how research is being done so because you're doing because um i suppose in a academic setting we in in my in my academic institution we've got more chances to expose to it and then we are encouraged to read a lot of projects so once you start reading articles you want to you have a lot of questions in your mind and you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions and and talk to your seniors to see whether these questions needs to be that whether they are um there's good answer to it and whether you can do research for it so in assisting in established project can actually makes you understand how a research is being done and then um then you should start thinking about just don't take what some of your seniors says um as a face value and then actually ask and actually go about in looking at um it's not like rote learning where you just just listen to them and they say oh this is this is how it has been um obviously there's different opinions around the world and so actually sometimes the literature review can actually um makes you have more understanding of what other people around the world is doing and then you can establish your own research project young surgeons brings in a lot of um, energy they tend to be more open minded they have inspirations um as young surgeon you're rotating in different specialty and sometimes seniors tends to be bogged down in their subspecialty for so long that you don't really understand what the others um subspecialty doing and bringing in i other ideas from different subspecialty actually makes makes you want to do to develop a techniques do a, some kind of research and see whether that is being um is being is being is being done and so i would suggest youngsters not to not to give up to keep asking questions and don't don't be afraid to say no and yeah and then just don't just don't take people say this is not this could not be done as an answer and actually try to persist in doing what you want to do and then see how then and yeah and then try to your best to to find out the answer yeah thank you margaret i think thank your you. golden words will be you know ask questions and never give up i think that's yeah. very very important yeah. i would next like to involve my very good friend sunil mar from cambridge and sunil is the chair of the young surgeons committee in the sicot and sunil is also a very good researcher so sunil what is your opinion on this fact you know what can be the role of international societies like the efort apoa sicot to promote research among young surgeons what do you think will be the role of these organizations Raja thanks very much uh, for the invite and uh, thank you to you as well uh, and this is a great session i think this is a very important topic to discuss especially among young surgeons and first of all i think everyone has to be embedded with um, the concepts of critical appraisal of literature and research methodology and as the other panelists have said and that is the key in terms of uh, appraising whether the articles we read are good or bad with a, a, an o you know overload of articles you don't know you know you can be reading an article which actually doesn't make sense there's a flaw in the research methodology i think uh, the first most first foremost is to ensure everyone knows the concepts of research and how you know whether the methods are good or not 
And we are at a great position, right? With CCOT and APOA, so APOA, uh, I think the population of Asia Pacific is about 4.6 billion uh, in the world population of 7.6 billion. So 60% of the world population is called the APOA. And CCOT can cover the rest uh, of the population in South America, Africa, which is not covered by APOA, and, and Forte can cover Europe. So we capturing about 90% of the world population and the orthopedic surgeons there. I think the foremost is, uh, how, you know, can we conduct research methodology courses which are standardized across and uh, so that every orthopedic trainee, young surgeon understands research and then build collaborative networks. And we've seen collaborative projects are becoming more and more important now. And with these uh, three societies, we can build a really good network of collaboration, which is applicable to all regions, not just the designer center or you know center which invents the procedure or they're doing high volumes, but what is the transferability of the same result into uh, uh, another part of the world? I think so. I think in terms of that, we can play a, a, you know an important role with collaboration with CICOT. Uh, APO and um, uh, Forte as well. So, you know, in, to summarize, I think just imbibing um, and you know, the research methodology to all the junior surgeons and creating collaborative network in this field would be the best way forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. I think the key point which you mentioned was critical appraisal. You know, it's quite difficult for us to critically appraise because especially, you know, everyone think that if you do a very good surgery or a very good examination or any aspect that you think that you are the best, but I think good point you mentioned of imbibing research methodology. And I think that will be a very good point for all societies. Now, other good point you mentioned was, you know, CICOT, EFORT and APOA, we cover nearly 90% 90 of, 90 to 95% of the world population. So I think that is very, very good. So now to our last panelist and Octavian is joining us from Switzerland. Thank you so much for joining us, Octavian. And Thank you for inviting me. It is a privilege. Uh, I guess you are hearing me well, everyone? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. So the question for you is, multi-center projects on an international forum, is it possible? And what do you think will be hindrances or your opinion, the drivers for these? So as Margaret said, don't give up. And uh, if someone tells you that it's not possible, well, find a way to make it possible. <laughs> so I think, yes, it's possible. And I, uh, I'm privileged to be a PI of a multi-center study between Switzerland and the US. It is a retrospective study. And I also am involved in another multi-center study across Europe. And I know it's possible, but the question is, is it worth it? So when we're talking about a multi-center study, I think the two things that we are winning First is sample size, a study that you cannot do by your own because you don't have enough patients. And the second one, you can ensure that the results you are obtaining uh, on your side of the world in India are comparable to my results in Switzerland. So that uh, especially for interventional type of studies, you can assure that the, these are reproducible and comparable. And um, you have to think about, are you doing retrospective studies? Are you doing prospective studies? We are comparing two different interventions from the same population. And we want to take a look how uh, are the results and whether um, one intervention is better than the other in achieving outcomes. So this is one way to go, but there are a lot of issues with retrospective designs. I won't go into limitations, it is a big problem. But if you want to design a good randomized control trial, and if you can get funding on every single part, you can, if you can get ethical approval, if you have trained um, medical personnel that will be uh, doing everything with the same methodology that you will define first, then I think it's possible and I think it's worth it. And I think it would make a difference. And I think it would make an impact and the impact is always the patient. It's not our careers, it's not our uh, aspirations, the name on anything, it's just making the life of the, our patients better. And I think this is the, rich, the research that we need. And even if you're getting a disease or anything, you're going to PubMed, you want to look for the best. And uh, the example is COVID-19 and you don't want to look into 112,000 studies and you want some key papers that are going to answer some relevant questions. And I think that's possible and not only possible, that's necessary. Yeah, 
Thank you so much, Octavian. I think the most important thing that you added was you changed the question to, is it worthwhile? So what do you think? Retrospective studies, I understand mm -hmm. their own limitations, but do you think these multi-center projects among young surgeons, how worthwhile is it? How much can it define the practice? Because, you know, young surgeons, the only thing is they lack mm -hmm. experience, you know, in even in clinical yeah. practice. Do you think how worthwhile is it for young surgeons to do multi-center or collaborative work? Well, collaborative work, it may mean systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and that we agree on critical appraisal. Uh, it may mean that we make uh, synthesis uh, on that, and that it's relevant, that's possible, that's a good collaboration. Retrospective studies, it will have its limitations. Young surgeons may learn, young surgeons may make a contribution, but if you want to make a big difference, then randomized control trials on a multi-center level, that's what we need. Yeah, I completely agree with your point. RCTs are the way forward. So coming to our next point, we will have 10 more minutes of discussion. So future frontiers. So one of the very key aspects, you know, even when in the American Academy, a few years back, they had a thing on research and they said, especially for young people, it is better to keep your goals within limiting distance. You know, you have a very, very wide goal, a very, very broad perspective. It's very difficult for you to understand, for you to accept. So just see what is possible with you. And based on that, we can build upon your uh, research methodology and you know your research projects. So I was actually having been in consultation and also been discussing with all of you. I was thinking that since uh, Sunil made a very good point that we cover nearly 95% of the orthopedic world. If we could formulate, you know, maybe a questionnaire based research and all of us could formulate it with our on a very key topic involving young surgeons and then if we get you know for us it'll be a good learning you know like what is the satisfaction of uh, orthopedic young surgeons who have taken orthopedics as a career you know that's a very very important question you know we don't know we think all of them we think they were the best specialty what is the uh, most important subspeciality in different parts of the world it may be one in India, one in Europe, one in the Middle East. It'll, it's a totally different thing. So I think a questionnaire-based research will be the first initial step. And from that, we can build on to the uh, future projects. And as I said, you know, high volume, high RCTs are the ones which we will require funding. And for us to require funding, we have to show that, you know, usually all the societies, they require for us to show some groundwork. So any suggestions on that, Sunil? What do you think? If you can unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, yeah. So in terms of that, um, something which is applicable to everyone. So um, this is a good one. You know, we can start off um, as a subspeciality career choice. But how, you know, in terms of um, the training programs are different in different uh, regions. Uh, so the length of the training programs in India, there's three years. So if you come to uh, the UK, it's about 10 years. So it, it may be a bit difficult to say, we can just make it as a, you know, a junior training or senior training or pre and post fellowship exam. And then is there any bearing uh, in that as uh, a career choice? Um, other than that, oh, yeah, so I'm not sure. Yeah. I, so I, I, if I may, yeah, tell me, Octavian. So, sorry, if I may aid. I think what unites everyone on the globe is the fellowship. I think asking the question, what determines you seeking this or that fellowship? I think that's a relevant question. It may be have, having different answers across uh, countries. Some people seek research, some people seek surgical exposure, some people seek just the name, a group, city. So I think. Yes, I completely agree. I take both your points on both of you. So this was what actually I had positively made from the discussion. So these were the four overall ideas, you know, whether these aspects, benefits of training and, you know, preference of subspecialities among young surgeons or preference of subspecialities among young orthopods and, as I said, fellowship opportunities for young surgeons. So uh, can I start from all of you? So yeah, was if we are going to start a questionnaire-based research project. What do you think? So our project will be finding out from young surgeons, what do you think will be 
the best question or the best aspect which we can focus on? Actually, this is a very hot and very good topic. In my opinion, there are a few factors that may have influenced a young surgeon's practice and career in expectations. So early career organizations such as the APOAS Young Surgeons Forum may have a great role to, to build up their future. So in this platform, we can maybe uh, build up a proposal about in how to improve their training standards or maybe strategies for better communication between young surgeons or maybe balancing our daily life with our early career. I think these might be potential questions in my mind. Other than ed education, I think these kind of forums, we can also focus on the social side of our daily practice. In the response of the multitude of like scientific clinic and social change that orthopedic and traumatology training faces today due to the outbreak, we should stay more close and share more, more things to build up our bright future, hopefully. Yeah, thank you, Yavuz, thank you. Can I involve uh, Samarth now? So Samarth, what do you think, you know, even you had contributed to one of these, two of these questions, which question yeah. it will be good for us to research upon if we are going to circulate the question among young surgeons across the world? Yeah, so Raja, I think uh, 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 preference of subspecialties among uh, young orthopedic surgeons and uh, how would they select their fellowship uh, and goals? I think these are the two uh, questions that I, I think are easy to work on and would be uh, giving us uh, answers that can be compared across the globe because training is uh, like uh, Dr. Yavuz has already told that training is, and uh, Dr. Sunil, that training is different across the world for orthopedics and then we will get a very haphazard uh, set of answers which may be difficult to combine and uh, reach some conclusion. Although there are some um, studies already on how, uh, but they are country specific that which uh, subspecialties among orthopedics are selected by surgeons from a center or from a country. Those exist, but I think uh, it will be very interesting to know this from people across the world and whether some uh, countries have a special predilection for uh, a certain subspeciality and for whatever certain reasons that they have or why they would want to do a fellowship in that subject. Yeah, that's a very good point, Samar. Thank you. I would like to involve Margaret now. So Margaret, what do you think will be the best question for us? Your comments, which question do you think, especially from your being from the uh, Hong Kong and especially the Eastern part of the world, what do you think among young surgeons will be a burning question? Yeah, I agree. I think the preference of subspecialties among young orthopods or the fellowship opportunities for young surgeons will be interesting and may get things out of it. Actually, um, with the COVID, I think even depends on how fast we're going to go on to, to have this, to implement this. But with the COVID, I wonder if actually whether that will affect the fellowship opportunities for the young surgeons and what kind of things that they will be affected. It will be, people may want to, in a way, because of the COVID, they may not want to go overseas for, or they can't go overseas for fellowships. They may want to do within their own countries or, or that they would prefer to do more research projects. And that, that, there will be things that will be different with the COVID. And I think that may be, um, that may be interesting to know. Yes, I think that's a very good point. So Isa, can I involve you? And what is your opinion? What do you, especially as Margaret has raised a very good point on COVID nineteen. Yeah. So do you, you think, Dr. like, yeah, from I, Malaysia, I, I think I, I mean I know if if you you've done your search and there's over a hundred thousand papers on COVID already, but yes, I think that would be quite interesting to know how COVID has impacted our, I mean, the training of young surgeons because I myself um, have experienced that. I mean, you know, we. You have to postpone or you have to cancel, reschedule a lot of things um, around this COVID. And now with the vaccine out, that hopefully that things will um, start um, settling down and start going on again. But um, for your for these, these topics, I think possibly we will we should be able to cover them in one questionnaire because they are kind of interrelated, and I think um, they are all quite interesting to see the different um, results that we get across the globe. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Aiza. Thank you. I really agree. So can I involve Octavian? So you have had a lot of experience, as you said, with multi-center collaborative projects. In a simple based questionnaire, which we can understand, which project do you think will be really useful among us? The number four, fellowship opportunities for young surgeons. And maybe focus on the reasons why they would choose these specific topics. So yes. I think that's interesting to me. I think that would be relevant. Yeah, thank you, Octavian. Elisa, your comments? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, so which questionnaire do you think, which for a young surgeon, your preference of subspecialties or your training or your fellowship opportunities, which one do you think will be a good question for us to work on? Well, uh, I really, really, I don't know. Um, I think that uh, every kind of uh, fellowship is a great opportunity for a young surgeon to improve in cells and to improve uh, their learning. Um, I, I really don't know a, a specific topic uh, on which we can train. Yeah. There is a little bit of a break in your audio. So, yeah, but I think, you know, that not knowing that we, which is a good topic is also a good thing for us because, you know, that shows that there is lacunae in that part, which we will need to work on. So I think Sunil, Sunil yeah, please Sunil. Uh, thanks, I just wanted to add, and it's uh, just now it occurred to me about fellowship. And I think that can uh, have a bearing on where you are from in terms of, you know, people want to do fellowships in their region. What fellowship opportunities are available? Yes. And in their training, whether the trainees are exposed to all relevant subspecialties, that can influence uh, what they want to do later on. If people exactly. are not uh, exposed to you know, hand surgery uh, during the training, then they will not look at benefits of hand surgery. And maybe plastics are doing hand surgery in the region. So I think that's uh, it's a, it's very interesting to see what's their training, you know, like, yes. and has that had a, has a bearing on fellowship opportunities, and yes. what fellowship opportunities are available in their region. Exactly, I think that's be very very interesting. Yeah, I think uh, after discussing with all of you and getting all your opportunity, uh, all your thoughts, I think how we incorporate training. Also, the preference of subspecialities and fellowship opportunities, and also a subsection of that would be how COVID has affected it. I think if we could inculcate every aspect of these with specific questionnaire, which is quite uh, doesn't have a very long term, like so many questions which people can get diverted. I think that would be a very good uh, opportunity for us to study. And I think you know if we can uh, so. I think the most important, the proof of the pudding will be for us to bring about anything as a result, you know, that is going to be. So I think based on all your comments, we will have frequent discussions and we will formulate a questionnaire and after circulation among all of you, and once it has been approved, we can circulate it. And, you know, we should at least get 50, 60 people from our regions. And of course, if we can aim at a questionnaire of about 500 people, no, that will be a good for us to analyze the results and then work on an article. So this is what I was just having in mind. And, you know, all the discussion among all of you really helped. Any comments from any one of you? You want to start, Octavian? Um, I'm just thinking it's, um, it's kind of service study. And if you're doing a service study, it usually starts with a review uh, that you're saying there is a problem. And that is the problem that we are addressing. So yeah, we, we can do a background. We can make uh, we can cite a couple of papers and say the fellowship uh, uh, and training is a, a very a matter of debate, and it's really not clear what kind of factors influence it. So we may, we want to enlighten that, and that's why we're making the survey. But the clean way to go is doing a review first. So yes, that's what I was thinking about. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, you know, we, we should first work on a background search, get a review and then work upon it. That will give us better clarity on focusing on exactly what we want. So any 
uh, thoughts, closing comments and thoughts, Sunil, from your side? No, uh, these are what I, I thought, you know, it, it's a great thing to know because we don't know how, how the training is uh, across the, re, you know, the region and, um, you know, what, what happens uh, to the, in the heart. You know, if there's three-year training program, eight-year training program, you know, how many specialities, and then, you know, whether the fellowship opportunities um, come only after they are a practicing orthopedic surgeon. So that may have a bearing. If they are employed in a hospital, and they want a subspeciality in, in whatever pediatric orthopedic. So that may influence the decision. That's also important if you can uh, capture that in the questionnaire. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's a very good point. Uh, Aiza, any closing comments from you? Yeah, I think um, Dr. Octavia has a Dr. Octavian has a point. Yeah, we need the proper objective and. Uh, why we would like to do this and uh, if there's a problem because um yeah it's 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 definitely varied across all regions uh, all our structure of the training program and opportunities as well um but yeah i think we yeah we can do a good background search and um maybe aim for this to be something that can perhaps to form a guideline or uh, on how uh, future training be. Uh... Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, as Octavian said, and also Sunil said, getting a good background and also on training and influence on fellowship should be a good point. Uh, Yavuz, your closing comments? Yeah, thank you very much, Raya. And I'm very glad to be a part of this, this project or this family, I guess. And I would like to invite all of you to this second hybrid virtual VEC effort Congress, which will be held between the 3rd of 13th of June to the 2nd of July. And there will be a session that we are going to talk about the young surgeons, social and educational expectations. Thank you, see you all there. Thank you. Margaret, your closing comments? Um, yeah, I agree with Octavian about the, the, the objective. And actually, I think there's two ways. One is that we want to know what the youngsters are thinking at the moment and how they would choose. And as some of the training centers, you also want them, you want to want to attract the, the, the trainees to come to your centers. So I think this is so, I think we should think of it this way and then try to, to get the questionnaire to able to answer both, both of these questions. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think after a background search, getting a questionnaire out, we will be able to. Thank you, Margaret. So yeah, thank you. Eliza, your closing comments. Are you, are you with us? I think she's having connection issues. Samarth, are you with us for your closing comments? So I think, you know, uh, all in all, it's been a very good session. It's been enlightening for us and you know it is great we could get but of course the proof of the pudding is you know we have to get something and as always you know since i i'm in oxford now and i've also seen a few projects it's only research begets research as they said good begets good if you do research then you go on to the next forum you know we can apply for a thing for funding for a bigger project and that leads on you know you get in connection with other researchers once they know that you know you do good stuff and that i think will be the essence and you know that should be the exact aim for our forum and hopefully you know and i would like to thank all of you and i said as i said action will speak louder than words and hopefully we can get something and most important as to conclude a proper well structured research if it can come from all of us i think that will be our biggest contribution and will be one of the highlights of today's meeting so thank you all of you thank you yavuz thank you sunil thank you Aiza, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Octavian. Thank you, Samat, and thank you, Elisa. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good evening, good. guys. Bye. Cheers, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yes. So, um, thank you, everyone. I think uh, you, uh, we've come to the end of the uh, Congress. I think... Uh, Tane is with us. Thank you, Tane. And uh, I think Nitish is also with us. Uh, Jamal, sir, are you with us? Mm, 
Jamal sir is not there. Yeah, thank you. So I think it's been a wonderful two days and it's been really a lot of hard work and especially I have to thank the uh, backend team. Thank you so much, Vama. Thank you, Sejal. And thank you, Swapnil. Are you there with us? Yeah, I think they are there with us. Now. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, you, Sejal. Thank you, Swapnil. Really, you know, I think timing, time management could have been slightly more organized, but you know, all youngsters, we are really enthusiastic and that took up a little bit of time, but you know, all in all, it was such a great event. I thank you so much. Thank you for all your help. And uh, thank you, Vama. Thank you, Sejal. Thank you, Swapna. Thank you, Anything you want to tell us? Hello. Are they there? Uh, I think Swapnil and yes, uh, Sejal are there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank Anything you, so you want to add, uh, Sanay? No, we had a fantastic two days. I think it uh, covered all the uh, subspecialities and we had all the, as I said in my opening, uh, 15 countries we could have from Asia Pacific and all uh, over and almost close to 80 faculty. I came to know yesterday there were almost 1200 people logged in. We have almost five platforms from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Ortho TV and with the help of Vama. So it has been a really uh, exciting uh, two days with all the international and even our Indian faculty, the moderators, as well as the chairpersons. Very good uh, discussions. And uh, I think we had a fantastic two day session and we are looking forward for many more in the future, international as well as the local, hopefully physical will be great in the next year. So, thank you so much, so Tanay. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all of you who have joined us. And uh, thank you enough the whole team, uh, Raja, as well as uh, who made the whole uh, academy, yeah. as well as Samarth, Nishit, Nitesh, and Bushu, as well as uh, Vinit. So, all of yeah. them a great uh, job. Of course, cannot thank the Jamal sir enough to coordinate with everyone internationally. Uh, he's been the backbone and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. As Tanay said, thanks especially for APOA and especially to Dr. Jamal sir for guiding us and helping us throughout. And thank you all our co-committee members, Samarth, Bushu, Nishit, Nitish and uh, uh, everyone who have really helped us. Thanks all chairpersons and moderators. Thank you so much, Vama. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>